Section 16 of The Lady's Paradise by Emile Zola. Translated by Ernest Alfred Vizadelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Christine G. Chapter 7, Part 2. Denise was quietly listening. She was secretly for the big shops, with her instinctive love of logic and life. They had relapsed into silence, and were eating some potted French beans. At last she ventured to say in a cheerful tone, "'The public does not complain.' Madame Robinot could not suppress a little laugh, which annoyed her husband and Gaujon. No doubt the customer was satisfied, for, in the end, it was the customer who profited by the fall in prices. But everybody must live. Where would they be if, under the pretext of the general welfare, the consumer was fattened at the expense of the producer? And then commenced a long discussion— Denise affected to be joking, all the while producing solid arguments. All the middlemen disappeared, the manufacturing agents, representatives, commission agents, and this greatly contributed to cheapen the articles. Besides, the manufacturers could no longer live without the big shops, for as soon as one of them lost their custom, failure became a certainty. In short, it was a natural commercial evolution." It would be impossible to prevent things going on as they ought to, when everybody was working for that, whether they liked it or not. "'So you are for those who turned you out into the street?' asked Gaujon. Denise became very red. She herself was surprised at the vivacity of her defence. What had she at heart, that such a flame should have invaded her bosom? "'Dear me, no,' replied she. "'Perhaps I am wrong, for you are more competent to judge than I.' I simply express my opinion. The prices, instead of being settled as formerly by fifty houses, are now fixed by four or five, which have lowered them, thanks to the power of their capital and the strength of their immense business. So much the better for the public, that's all. Robinot was not angry, but had become grave, keeping his eyes fixed on the tablecloth. He had often felt this breath of the new style of business, this evolution of which the young girl spoke, and he would ask himself in his clear, quiet moments why he should wish to resist such a powerful current, which must carry everything before it. Madame Robinot herself, on seeing her husband deep in thought, glanced with approval at Denise, who had modestly resumed her silent attitude. "'Come,' resumed Gauchon, to cut short the argument, "'all that is simply theory. Let's talk of our matter.' After the cheese, the servant brought in some jam and some pears. He took some jam, eating it with a spoon, with the unconscious greediness of a big man very fond of sugar. "'To begin with, you must attack their Paris paradise, which has been their success of the year. I have come to an understanding with several of my brother manufacturers at Lyon, and have brought you an exceptional offer. A black silk, that you can sell at five and a half. They sell theirs at five francs twelve sous, don't they? Well, this will be two sous less, and that will suffice to upset them. At this, Robinot's eyes lighted up again. In his continual nervous torment, he often skipped like this from despair to hope. Have you got a sample? asked he. And when Gauchon drew from his pocket book a little square of silk, he went into raptures, exclaiming, Why, this is a handsomer silk than the Paris Paradise. In any case, it produces a better effect. The grain is coarser. You are right. We must make the attempt. If I don't bring them to my feet, I'll give up this time. Madame Robinot, sharing their enthusiasm, declared the silk superb, and Denise herself thought they would succeed. The latter part of the dinner was thus very gay. They talked in a loud tone. It seemed that the lady's paradise was at its last gasp. Gauchon, who was finishing the pot of jam, explained what enormous sacrifices he and his colleagues would be obliged to make to deliver such an article at this low price, but they would ruin themselves rather than yield. They had sworn to kill the big shops. As the coffee came in, the gaiety was greatly increased by the arrival of Vincar, who had just called, in passing, to see how his successor was getting on. "'Famous!' cried he, feeling the silk. "'You'll floor them, I'll stake my life!' "'Ah, you owe me a rare good thing. "'I told you this was a golden affair.' "'He had just taken a restaurant at Vincennes. "'It was an old, cherished idea, slyly nourished, "'while he was struggling in the silk business, 
trembling for fear he should not sell it before the crash came, and swearing to himself that he would put his money into an undertaking where he could rob at his ease. The idea of a restaurant had struck him at the wedding of a cousin, who had been made to pay ten francs for a bowl of dishwater, in which floated some Italian paste. And, in presence of the Robinots, the joy he felt in having saddled them with a badly paying business, of which he despaired of ever getting rid, enlarged still further his face with its round eyes and large, loyal-looking mouth, a face beaming with health. "'And your pains?' asked Madame Robinot good-naturedly. "'My pains?' murmured he, astonished. "'Yes, those rheumatic pains which tormented you so when you were here.' He then recollected and blushed slightly. "'Oh, I suffer from them still. However, the country air, you know, has done wonders for me. Never mind, you've done a good stroke of business. Had it not been for my rheumatics, I could soon have retired with ten thousand francs a year. My word of honour. A fortnight later, the struggle commenced between Robineau and the Ladies' Paradise. It became celebrated, and occupied for a time the whole Parisian market. Robineau, using his adversary's weapons, had advertised extensively in the newspapers. Besides that, he made a fine display, piling up enormous bales of the famous silk in his windows, with immense white tickets, displaying in giant figures the price, five francs and a half. It was this figure that caused a revolution among the women. Two sous cheaper than at a lady's paradise, and the silk appeared stronger. From the first day a crowd of customers flocked in. Madame Marty bought a dress she did not want, pretending it to be a bargain. Madame Bordelais thought the silk very fine, but preferred waiting, guessing no doubt what would happen. And indeed, the following week, Moret boldly reduced the Paris paradise by four sous, after a lively discussion with Bordoncle and the other managers, in which he had succeeded in inducing them to accept the challenge, even at a sacrifice. For these four sous represented a dead loss, the silk being sold already at a strict cost price. It was a heavy blow to Robineau, who did not think his rival would reduce. For this suicidal competition, these losing sales were then unknown, and the tide of customers, attracted by the cheapness, had immediately flown back towards the Rue Nouveau saint augustine whilst the shop in the Rue Nouveau des Petits Champs gradually emptied. Cochon came in from Lyon. There were hasty confabulations, and they finished by coming to a most heroic resolution. The silk should be lowered in price. They would sell it at five francs six sous, beneath which no one could go without folly. The next day Moret marked his at five francs four sous. After that it became a mania. Robineau replied by five francs three sous, when Moret at once ticketed his at five francs and two sous. Neither lowered more than a sou at the time now, losing considerable sums as often as they made this present to the public. The customers laughed, delighted with this duel, moved by the terrible blows dealt each other by the two houses to please them. At last Moret ventured as low as five francs. His staff paled before such a challenge thrown down to fortune. Robineau, utterly beaten, out of breath, stopped also at five francs, not having the courage to go any lower. And they rested at their positions, face to face, with the massacre of their goods around them. But if honour was saved on both sides, the situation was becoming fatal for Robineau. The ladies' paradise had money at its disposal, and a patronage which enabled it to balance its profits, whilst he, sustained by Gaujon alone, unable to recoup his losses on other articles, was exhausted and slipped daily a little further on the verge of bankruptcy. He was dying from his hardihood, notwithstanding the numerous customers that the hazards of the struggle had brought him. One of his secret torments was to see these customers slowly quitting him, returning to the ladies' paradise, after the money he had lost, and the efforts he had made to conquer them. One day he quite lost his patience. A customer, Madame de Bove, had come to his shop for some mantles, for he had added a ready-made department to his business. She could not make up her mind, complaining of the quality of the goods. At last she said, "'Their Paris paradise is a great deal stronger.' Robineau restrained himself, assuring her that she was mistaken, with the tradesman's politeness, all the more respectful, because he was afraid to allow his anger to burst forth. "'But just look at the silk of this mantle,' resumed she. "'One would really take it for so much cobweb. You may say what you like, sir. Their silk at five francs is like leather compared with this.' 
He did not reply, the blood rushing to his face, and his lips tightly closed. In point of fact, he had ingenuously thought of buying some of his rival's silk for these mantles. So that it was Moret, not he, who lost on the material. He simply cut off the salvage. Really, you think the Paris paradise thicker, murmured he. Oh, a hundred times, said Madame de Beauve. There is no comparison. This injustice on her part, her running down the goods in this way, filled him with indignation. And, as she was turning the mantle over with a disgusted air, a little piece of blue and silver selvage, not cut off, appeared under the lining. He could not contain himself any longer. He confessed he would even have given his head. "'Well, madam, this is Paris Paradise. I bought it myself. Look at the border.' Madame de Beauve went away greatly annoyed, and a number of ladies quitted him when the affair became known. And he, amid this ruin, when the fear of the future seized him, only trembled for his wife, who had been brought up in a happy, peaceful home, and would never be able to endure a life of poverty. What would become of her, if a catastrophe threw them out into the street, with a load of debts? It was his fault. He ought never to have touched her money. She was obliged to comfort him. Wasn't the money as much his as hers? He loved her dearly, and she wanted nothing more. She gave him everything, her heart and her life. They could be heard in the back shop embracing one another. Little by little, the affairs and ways of the house became more regular. Every month their losses increased, in a slow proportion, which postponed the fatal issue. A tenacious hope sustained them. They still announced the near discomfiture of the ladies' paradise. Pooh, he would say. We are young yet, the future is ours. And besides, what matters if you have done what you wanted to do? resumed she. As long as you are satisfied, I am as well, darling. Denise's affection increased for them on seeing their tenderness. She trembled, feeling their inevitable fall, but she dared not interfere. It was then she fully understood the power of the new system of business, and became impassioned for this force which was transforming Paris. Her ideas were ripening, a woman's grace was developing out of the savage child newly arrived from Valence. In fact, her life was a pretty pleasant one, notwithstanding the fatigue and the little money she earned. When she had spent all the day on her feet, she had to go straight home and look after Pepe, whom old Bourras insisted on feeding, fortunately. But there was still a lot to do, a shirt to wash, stockings to mend, without mentioning the noise made by the youngster, which made her head ache fit to split. She never went to bed before midnight. Sunday was her hardest day. She cleaned her room and mended her own things, so busy that it was often five o'clock before she could dress. However, she sometimes went out for health's sake, taking the little one for a long walk, out towards Nuelli, and their treat was to drink a cup of milk there at a dairyman's who allowed them to sit down in his yard. Jean disdained these excursions. He put in an appearance now and again on weekday evenings, then disappeared, pretending to have other visits to pay. He asked for no more money, but he arrived with such a melancholy face that his sister, anxious, always managed to keep a five-franc piece for him. That was her sole luxury. Five francs! he would exclaim each time. My stars! You're too good! It just happens. There's the stationer's wife. Not another word, Denise would say. I don't want to know but he thought she was accusing him of boasting. "'I tell you, she's the wife of a stationer. Oh, something magnificent!' Three months passed away, spring was returning. Denise refused to return to Joinville with Pauline and Borge. She sometimes met them in the Rue Saint-Roche when she left the shop in the evening. Pauline, one evening when she was alone, confided to her that she was very likely going to marry her lover. It was she who was hesitating, for they did not care for married saleswomen at the ladies' paradise. This idea of marriage surprised Denise. She did not dare to advise her friend. One day, just as Columban had stopped her near the fountain to talk about Clara, the latter was crossing the road, and Denise was obliged to run away, for he implored her to ask her old comrade if she would marry him. What was the matter with them all? Why were they tormenting themselves like this? She thought herself very fortunate not to be in love with any one. "'You've heard the news!' cried out the umbrella dealer to her one evening on her return home from business. "'No, Monsieur Boras. "'Well, the scoundrels have bought the Hôtel du Villard. "'I'm hemmed in on all sides.' He was waving his long arms about, in a burst of fury which made his white mane stand up on end. 
"'A regular mixed-up affair,' resumed the old man. "'It appears that the hotel belonged to the Credit Immobilier, "'the president of which, Baron Hartmann, has just sold it to our famous Moray. "'Now they got me on the right, on the left, and at the back, "'just in a way I'm holding the knob of this stick in my hand.' "'It was true. "'The sale was to have been concluded the previous day. "'Bourras's small house, hemmed in between the ladies' paradise "'and the Hotel du Villard, hanging on like a swallow's nest in a crack of a wall, seemed sure to be crushed as soon as the shop invaded the hotel, and the time had now arrived. The colossus had turned the feeble obstacle, and was surrounding it with a pile of goods, threatening to swallow it up, to absorb it by the sole force of its giant aspiration. Bourras could feel the embrace which was making his shop creak. He thought he could see the place getting smaller. He was afraid of being absorbed himself, of being carried to the other side with the umbrellas and sticks. So loudly was the terrible machine roaring just then. "'Do you hear them?' asked he. "'One would think they were eating up the walls even. And in my cellar, in the attic, everywhere, there's the same noise as of a saw going through the plaster. Never mind. I don't fancy they'll flatten me out like a sheet of paper. I'll stick here, even if they blow up my roof, and the rain should fall in bucketfuls on my bed.' It was just at this moment that Moray caused fresh proposals to be made to Bouas. They would increase the figure, they would give him fifty thousand francs for his good will and the remainder of the lease. This offer redoubled the old man's anger. He refused in an insulting manner. How these scoundrels must rob people to be able to pay fifty thousand francs for a thing not worth ten thousand! And he defended his shop as a young girl defends her virtue, for honour's sake. Denise noticed Bourras was preoccupied during the next fortnight. He wandered about in a feverish manner, measuring the walls of his house, surveying it from the middle of the street with the air of an architect. Then one morning some workmen arrived. This was the decisive blow. He had conceived the bold idea of beating the ladies' paradise on its own ground by making certain concessions to modern luxury. The customers, who often reproached him about his dark shop, would certainly come back again when they saw it bright and new. In the first place, the workmen stopped up the crevices and whitewashed the frontage, then they painted the woodwork a light green, and even carried the splendour so far as to gild the signboard. A sum of three thousand francs, held in reserve by Bourras as a last resource, was swallowed up in this way. The whole neighbourhood was in a state of revolution. People came to look at him amid all these riches, losing his head, no longer able to find the things he was accustomed to. He did not seem to be at home in this shining frame, in this tender setting. He seemed frightened, with his long beard and white hair. The people passing on the opposite side of the street were astonished on seeing him waving his arms about and carving his handles. And he was in a state of fever, afraid of dirtying his shop, plunging further into his luxurious business, which he did not at all understand. The same as with Robineau, the campaign against the ladies' paradise was opened by Bourras. The latter had just brought out his invention, the automatic umbrella, which later on was to become popular. But the paradise people immediately improved on the invention, and a struggle of prices commenced. Bourras had an article at one franc and nineteen sous, in Zanella, with steel mounting, everlasting, said the ticket, but he was especially anxious to vanquish his competitors with his handles. Bamboo, dogwood, olive, myrtle, rattan, every imaginable sort of handle. The Paradise people, less artistic, paid more attention to the material, extolling their alpacas and mohairs, their twills and sarconets, and they came out victorious. Bourras, in despair, repeated that art was done for, that he was reduced to carving his handles for pleasure, without any hope of selling them. "'It's my fault!' cried he to Denise. "'I never ought to have kept a lot of rotten articles at one franc nineteen sous. That's where these new notions lead one to.' I wanted to follow the example of these brigands, so much the better if I'm ruined by it. The month of July was very warm, and Denise suffered greatly in her narrow room, under the roof. So after leaving the shop, she sometimes went and fetched Pepe, and instead of going upstairs at once, went for a stroll in the Tuileries Gardens, until the gates were closed. One evening, as she was walking under the chestnut trees, she suddenly stopped in surprise. A few yards off, Walking straight towards her, she thought she recognised Toutain. But her heart commenced to beat violently. It was Moret, who had dined over the water, and was hurrying along on foot to call on Madame Desforges. 
At the abrupt movement she made to escape him, he caught sight of her. The night was coming on, but still he recognised her. "'Ah, it is you, mademoiselle.' She did not reply, astonished that he should deign to stop. He, smiling, concealed his constraint beneath an air of amiable protection. "'You are still in Paris?' "'Yes, sir,' said she at last. She was slowly drawing back, desirous of making a bow and continuing her walk. But he turned and followed her under the black shadows of the chestnut tree. The air was getting cooler, some children were laughing in the distance, trundling their hoops. "'This is your brother, is it not?' resumed he, looking at Pepe. The little boy, frightened by the unusual presence of a gentleman, was gravely walking by his sister's side, holding her tightly by the hand. "'Yes, sir,' replied she once more. She blushed, thinking of the abominable invention circulated by Marguerite and Clara. No doubt Moray understood why she was blushing, for he quickly added, "'Listen, mademoiselle, I have to apologise to you.' yes i should have been happy to have told you sooner how much i regret the error that has been made you were accused too lightly of a fault but the evil is done i simply wanted to assure you that every one in our establishment now knows of your affection for your brothers he continued with a respectful politeness to which the saleswomen in the ladies paradise were little accustomed denise's confusion had increased but her heart was filled with joy he knew then that she had given herself to no one both remaining silent he continued beside her, regulating his walk to the child's short steps, and the distant murmurs of the city were dying away under the black shadows of the spreading chestnut trees. "'I have only one reparation to offer you,' resumed he. "'Naturally, if you would like to come back to us—' She interrupted him, and refused with a feverish haste. "'No, sir, I cannot. Thank you all the same, but I have found another situation.' He knew it. They had informed him she was with the Robineau, and leisurely, on a footing of amiable equality, he spoke of the latter, rendering him full justice. A very intelligent fellow, but too nervous. He would certainly come to grief. Gauchon had burdened him with a very heavy business, in which they would both suffer. Denise, conquered by this familiarity, opened her mind further, and allowed it to be seen, that she was for the big shops in the war between them and the small traders. She became animated, citing examples showing herself well up in the question, even expressing new and enlightened ideas. He, charmed, listened to her in surprise, and turned round, trying to distinguish her features in the growing darkness. She seemed still the same with her simple dress and sweet face, but from this modest bashfulness there seemed to exhale a penetrating perfume, of which she felt the powerful influence. Decidedly, this little girl had got used to the air of Paris. She was becoming quite a woman, and was really perturbing, so sensible, with her beautiful hair, overflowing with tenderness. "'As you are on our side,' said he, laughing, "'why do you stay with your adversaries? I fancy, too, they told me you lodged with Boras. "'A very worthy man,' murmured she. "'No, not a bit of it. He's an old idiot, a madman who will force me to ruin him, though I should be glad to get rid of him with a fortune. Besides, your place is not in his house, which has a bad reputation. He lets to certain women.' But feeling that the young girl was confused, he hastened to add, "'One can be respectable anywhere, and there's even more merit in remaining so when one is so poor.' They went on a few steps in silence. Pepe seemed to be listening with the attentive air of a sharp child. Now and again he raised his eyes to his sister, whose burning hand, quivering with sudden starts, astonished him. "'Look here,' resumed Moret gaily. "'Will you be my ambassador?' I intended increasing my offer to-morrow, of proposing eighty thousand francs to Bourras. Do you speak to him first about it? Tell him he's cutting his own throat. Perhaps he'll listen to you, as he has a liking for you, and you'll be doing him a real service. Very well, said Denise, smiling also. I will deliver your message, but I am afraid I shall not succeed. And a fresh silence ensued, neither of them having anything more to say. He attempted to talk of her uncle Bardou, but had to give it up on seeing the young girl's uneasiness. However, they continued to walk side by side, and at last found themselves near the Rue de Rivoli, in a path where it was still light. On coming out of the darkness of the trees, it was like a sudden awakening. He understood that he could not detain her any longer. "'Good night, mademoiselle.' "'Good night, sir.' But he did not go away. On raising his eyes, he perceived in front of him, at the corner of the Rue d'Alger, 
the lighted windows at Madame de Forges, whither he was bound. And looking at Denise, whom he could now see in the pale twilight, she appeared to him very puny beside Henriette. Why was it she touched his heart in this way? It was a stupid caprice. This little man is getting tired, resumed he, just for something to say. Remember, mind, that our house is always open to you. You have only to knock, and I'll give you every compensation possible. Good night, mademoiselle. Good night, sir. When Moret quitted her, Denise went back under the chestnut trees, in the black shadow. For a long time she walked on without any object, between the enormous trunks, her face burning, her head in a whirl of confused ideas. Pepe still had a hold of her hand, stretching out his short legs to keep pace with her. She had forgotten him. At last he said, "'Go too quick, little mother.' At this she sat down on a bench, and as he was tired, the child went to sleep on her lap. She held him there, nestling to her virgin bosom, her eyes lost far away in the darkness. When, an hour later, they returned slowly to the Rue de la Mijodière, she had regained her usual quiet, sensible expression. "'Hell and thunder!' shouted Bourras when he saw her coming. "'The blow is struck. That rascal of a Moray has just bought my house!' He was half mad, and was striking himself in the middle of the shop with such outrageous gestures that he almost threatened to break the windows. "'Ah, I, the scoundrel! It's a fruitier who's written to tell me this. And how much do you think he has got for the house? One hundred and fifty thousand francs, four times its value. There's another thief, if you like. Just fancy, he has taken advantage of my embellishments, making capital out of the fact that the house has been done up.' How much longer are they going to make a fool of me? The thought that his money spent on paint and whitewash had brought the fruitier a profit exasperated him. And now Moret would be his landlord. He would have to pay him. It was beneath this detested competitor's roof that he must live in future. Such a thought raised his fury to the highest possible pitch. Ah, oh, I could hear them digging a hole through the wall. At this moment they are here eating out of my very plate, so to say and the shop shook under his heavy fist, which he banged on the counter. He made the umbrellas and the parasols dance again. Denise, bewildered, could not get in a word. She stood there, motionless, waiting for the end of his tirade, whilst Pepe, very tired, had fallen asleep on the chair. At last, when Bourras became a little calmer, she resolved to deliver Moray's message. No doubt the old man was irritated, but the excess even of his anger— the blind alley in which he found himself, might determine an abrupt acceptance. "'I've just met someone,' she commenced. "'Yes, a person from the Paradise, very well informed. It appears that they are going to offer you eighty thousand francs to-morrow.' Eighty thousand francs!' interrupted he in a terrible voice. Eighty thousand francs! Not for a million now!' She tried to reason with him, but at that moment the shop-door opened, and she suddenly drew back, pale and silent. It was her uncle Baudu, with his yellow face and aged look. Bourras seized his neighbour by the buttonhole, and roared out in his face without allowing him to say a word, as if goaded on by his presence. "'What do you think they have the cheek to offer me? Eighty thousand francs! They've got so far, the brigands! They think I'm going to sell myself like a prostitute! Ah! They've bought a house, and think they've now got me! Well, it's all over, they shan't have it! I might have given way, perhaps, but now it belongs to them. Let them try and take it. So the news is true, said Baudu in his slow voice. I had heard of it, and came over to know if it was so. Eighty thousand francs, repeated Bourras. Why not a hundred thousand at once? It's this immense sum of money that makes me indignant. Do they think they can make me commit a navish trick with their money? They shan't have it, by heavens. Never, never, you hear me? Denise gently observed, in her calm, quiet way. "'They'll have it in nine years' time, when your lease expires.' And, notwithstanding her uncle's presence, she begged of the old man to accept. The struggle was becoming impossible. He was fighting against a superior force. He would be mad to refuse the fortune offered him. But he still replied no. In nine years' time he hoped to be dead, so as not to see it. "'You hear, Monsieur Bardou?' resumed he. Your niece is on their side. It's her they have employed to corrupt me. She's with the brigands, my word of honour. 
Baudu, who up to then had appeared not to notice Denise, now raised his head, with a morose movement that he affected when standing at his shop door every time she passed. But, slowly, he turned round and looked at her, and his thick lips trembled. "'I know it,' replied he in a half-whisper, and he continued to look at her. Denise, affected almost to tears, thought him greatly changed by trouble. Perhaps he was stricken with remorse for not having assisted her during the time of misery she had just passed through. Then the sight of Pepe sleeping on the chair, amidst the noise of the discussion, seemed to suddenly inspire him with compassion. "'Denise,' said he simply, "'come to-morrow and have dinner with us, and bring the little one. My wife and Genevieve asked me to invite you if I met you.' She turned very red, and went up and kissed him. And as he was going away, Bourras, delighted at this reconciliation, cried out to him again, "'Just talk to her. She isn't a bad sort. As for me, the house may fall. I shall be found in the ruins.' "'Our houses are already falling, neighbour," said Baudu with a sombre air. "'We shall all be crushed under them.'" End of chapter 7, part 2《Section 17 of the Ladies' Paradise by Emile Zola, translated by Ernest Alfred Visitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8, Part 1. At this time, the whole neighborhood was talking of the great thoroughfare to be opened from the Bourse to the new opera house under the name of the Rue de 10 Decembre. The expropriation judgments had just been received. Two gangs of demolishers were already attacking the opening at the two ends, the first pulling down the old mansions in the Rue Louis-le-Grand, the other destroying the thin walls of the old vaudeville, and one could hear the picks getting closer. The Rue de Joselle and the Rue de la Michaudière got quite excited over their condemned houses. Before a fortnight passed, the opening would make a great hole in these streets, letting in the sun and air but what stirred up the district still more was the work going on at the ladies' paradise. Considerable enlargements were talked of, gigantic shops having frontages in the Rue de la Michaudière, the Rue Neveau-Saint-Augustine, and the Rue Montsigny. Mouret, it was said, had made arrangements with Baron Hartmann, chairman of the Crédit Immobilier, and he would occupy the whole block, except the future frontage in the Rue de 10 Décembre, on which the baron wished to construct a rival to the Grand Hôtel. The Paradise people were buying up leases on all sides, the shops were closing, the tenants moving, and in the empty buildings an army of workmen were commencing the various alterations under a cloud of plaster. In the midst of this disorder, old Bourras's narrow hovel was the only one that remained standing and intact, obstinately sticking between the high walls covered with masons. When, the next day, Denise went with Pepe to her uncle Baudu's, the street was just at that moment blocked up by a line of tumbrils discharging bricks before the Hôtel du Villard. Baudu was standing at his shop door looking on with a gloomy air. As the ladies' paradise became larger, the old Elbeuf seemed to get smaller. The young girl thought the windows looked blacker than ever, and more and more crushed beneath the low first story with its prison-like bars. The damp had still further discoloured the old green signboard, a sort of distress oozed from the whole frontage, livid in hue, and, as it were, grown thinner. "'Here you are, then,' said Baudu. "'Take care. They would run right over you.' Inside the shop, Denise experienced the same heart-broken sensation. She found it darker, invaded more than ever by the somnolence of approaching ruin. Empty corners formed dark and gloomy holes, the dust was invading the counters and drawers, whilst an odour of salpetre rose from the bales of cloth that were no longer moved about. At the desk, Madame Baudu and Genevieve were standing mute and motionless, as in some solitary spot, where no one would come to disturb them. The mother was hemming some dusters. The daughter, her hands spread on her knees, was gazing at the emptiness before her. "'Good evening, aunt.' said Denise. I am delighted to see you again, and if I have hurt your feelings, I hope you will forgive me. Madame Baudu kissed her, greatly affected. 
"'My poor child,' said she, "'if I had no other troubles, you would see me gayer than this.' "'Good evening, cousin,' resumed Denise, kissing Genevieve on the cheeks. The latter woke up with a sort of start, and returned her kisses, without finding a word to say. The two women then took up Pepe, who was holding out his little arms, and the reconciliation was complete. "'Well, it's six o'clock. Let's go to dinner,' said Baudu. "'Why haven't you brought Sean?' "'But he was to come,' murmured Denise, embarrassed. "'I saw him this morning, and he faithfully promised me. "'Oh, we must not wait for him. His master has kept him, I dare say.' She suspected some extraordinary adventure, and wished to apologise for him in advance. "'In that case, we will commence,' said her uncle. Then, turning towards the obscure depths of the shop, he added, "'Come on, Columban, you can dine with us. No one will come.' The niece had not noticed the shopman. Her aunt explained to her that they had been obliged to get rid of the other salesman and the young lady. Business was getting so bad that Columban sufficed, and even he spent many idle hours, drowsy, falling out to sleep with his eyes open. The gas was burning in the dining-room, although they were enjoying long summer days. The niece slightly shivered on entering, seized by the dampness falling from the walls. She once more beheld the round table, the places laid on the American cloth, the window drawing its air and light from the dark and fetid backyard. And these things appeared to her to be gloomier than ever, and tearful like the shop. "'Father,' said Genevieve, uncomfortable for Denise's sake, "'shall I close the window? There's rather a bad smell.' He smelt nothing, and seemed surprised. "'Shut the window, if you like,' replied he at last. "'But we shan't get any air, then.' And, indeed, they were almost stifled. It was a family dinner, very simple. After the soup, as soon as the servant had served the boiled beef, the old man, as usual, commenced about the people opposite. At first he showed himself very tolerant, allowing his niece to have a different opinion. "'Dear me!' You are quite free to support these great hair-brained houses. Each one has his ideas, my girl. If you were not disgusted at being so disgracefully chucked out, you must have strong reasons for liking them. And even if you went back again, I should think none the worse of you. No one here would be offended, would they? Oh, no, murmured Madame Baudu. Denise quietly gave her reasons, as she had at Robinot's, the logical evolution in business, the necessities of modern times, the greatness of these new creations, in short, the growing well-being of the public. Baudu, his eyes opened, and his mouth clamming, listened with a visible tension of intelligence. Then, when she had finished, he shook his head. "'That's all phantasmagoria, you know. Business is business. There is no getting over that. I own that they succeed, but that's all. For a long time I thought they would smash up. Yes, I expected that. Waiting patiently. You remember?' Well, no, it appears that nowadays thieves make fortunes, whilst honest people die of hunger. That's what we've come to. I'm obliged to bow to facts. And I do bow, on my word, I do bow. A deep anger was gradually rising within him. All at once he flourished his fork. But the old Elbeuf will never give way. I said as much to Bourras, you know. Neighbour, you're going over to the cheap jacks. Your paint and your varnish are a disgrace. "'Eat your dinner,' interrupted Madame Baudu, feeling anxious on seeing him so excited. "'Wait a bit. I want my niece thoroughly to understand my motto. Just listen, my girl. I'm like this decanter. I don't budge. They succeed. So much the worse for them. As for me, I protest. That's all.' The servant brought in a piece of roast veal. He cut it up with his trembling hands, but he no longer had his correct glance, his skill in weighing the portions. The consciousness of his defeat deprived him of the confidence he used to have as a respected employer. Pepe thought his uncle was getting angry, and they had to pacify him by giving him some dessert, some biscuits which were near his plate. Then Baudu, lowering his voice, tried to talk of something else. For a moment he spoke of the demolitions going on, approving of the Rue de Dix Décembre, the cutting of which would certainly improve the business of the neighbourhood. But then again he returned to the ladies' paradise. Everything brought him back to it. It was a kind of complaint. They were covered with plaster, and business was stopped since the builders' carts had commenced to block up the street. It would soon be really ridiculous in its immensity. 
the customers would lose themselves. Why not have the central markets at once? And, in spite of his wife's supplicating looks, notwithstanding his own effort, he went on from the works to the amount of business done in the big shop. Was it not inconceivable? In less than four years they had increased their figures fivefold. The annual receipts, formerly eight million francs, now attained the sum of forty millions, according to the last balance sheet. In fact, it was a piece of folly, a thing that had never been seen before, and against which it was perfectly useless to struggle. They were always increasing. They had now a thousand employees and twenty-eight departments. These twenty-eight departments enraged him more than anything else. No doubt they had duplicated a few, but others were quite new. For instance, a furniture department, and a department for fancy goods. The idea! Fancy goods! Really, these people were not at all proud. They would end by selling fish. Baudu, though affecting to respect Denise's opinions, attempted to convert her. "'Frankly, you can't defend them. What would you say were I to add a hardware department to my cloth business? You would say I was mad. Confess at least that you don't esteem them.' And as the young girl simply smiled, feeling uncomfortable, understanding the uselessness of good reasons, he resumed, "'In short, you are on their side. We won't talk about it any more, for it's useless to let that part us again. It would be too much to see them come between me and my family.' Go back with them, if you like, but pray don't worry me with any more of their stories. A silence ensued. His former violence was reduced to this feverish resignation. As they were suffocating in the narrow room, heated by the gas burner, the servant had to open the window again, and the damp, pestilential air from the yard blew into the apartment. A dish of stewed potatoes appeared, and they helped themselves slowly, without a word. Look at those two recommenced Baudu, pointing with his knife to Genevieve and Colomban. Ask them if they like your lady's paradise. Side by side, in the usual place where they had found themselves twice a day for the last twelve years, the engaged couple were eating in moderation, and without uttering a word. He, exaggerating the coarse good nature of his face, seemed to be concealing, behind his drooping eyelashes, the inner flame which was devouring him, whilst she, her head bowed lower beneath her too heavy hair, seemed to be giving way entirely, as if ravaged by a secret grief. "'Last year was very disastrous,' explained Baudu, "'and we have been obliged to postpone the marriage, not for our own pleasure. Ask them what they think of your friends.' The niece, in order to pacify him, interrogated the young people. "'Naturally, I can't be very fond of them,' replied Genevieve. "'But never fear. Everyone doesn't detest them.' and she looked at Columban, who was rolling up some bread-crumbs with an absorbed air. When he felt the young girl's gaze directed towards him, he broke out into a series of violent exclamations. "'A rotten shop! A lot of rogues! Every man-jack of them! A regular pest in the neighbourhood! "'You hear him! You hear him!' exclaimed Bardou, delighted. "'There's one they'll never get hold of. Ah, my boy, you're the last of the old stock. We shan't see any more!' But Genevieve, with her severe and suffering look, still kept her eyes on Columban, diving into the depth of his heart. And he felt troubled. He redoubled his invectives. Madame Baudu was watching them with an anxious air, as if she foresaw another misfortune in this direction. For some time her daughter's sadness had frightened her. She felt her to be dying. "'The shop is left to take care of itself,' said she at last, quitting the table, desirous of putting an end to the scene." "'Go and see, Columban. I fancy I heard some one.' They had finished and got up. Baudu and Columban went to speak to a traveller who had come for orders. Madame Baudu carried Pepe off to show him some pictures. The servant had quickly cleared the table, and the niece was lounging by the window, looking into the little backyard, when turning round she saw Genevieve still in her place, her eyes fixed on the American cloth, which was still damp from the sponge having been passed over it. "'Are you suffering, cousin?' she asked. The young girl did not reply, obstinately studying a rent in the cloth, too preoccupied by the reflections passing through her mind. Then she raised her head with pain, and looked at the sympathising face bent over hers. The others had gone then. What was she doing in this chair? And suddenly a flood of sobs stifled her, her head fell forward on the edge of the table. She wept on, wetting her sleeve with her tears. "'Good heavens!' "'What's the matter with you?' cried Denise in dismay. 
"'Shall I call someone?' Genevieve nervously seized her by the arm and held her back, stammering, "'No, no, stay. Don't let Mamma know. With you I don't mind. But not the others. Not the others. It's not my fault, I assure you. It was on finding myself all alone. Wait a bit, I'm better, and I'm not crying now.' But sudden attacks kept seizing her, causing her frail body to tremble. It seemed as though the weight of her hair was weighing down her head. As she was rolling her poor head on her folded arms, the hairpin came out, and her hair fell over her neck, burying it in its folds. Denise, quietly, for a fear of attracting attention, tried to console her. She undid her dress, and was heartbroken on seeing how fearfully thin she was. The poor girl's bosom was as hollow as that of a child. Denise took the hair by handfuls, that superb head of hair which seemed to be absorbing all her life, and twisted it up to clear it away and give her a little air. "'Thanks, you are very kind,' said Genevieve. "'Ah, I am not very stout, am I? I used to be stouter, but it's all gone away. Do up my dress, or Mamma might see my shoulders. I hide them as much as I can. Good heavens! I am not at all well.' I'm not at all well. However, the attack passed away, and she sat there completely worn out, looking fixedly at her cousin. After a pause she abruptly asked, "'Tell me the truth. Does he love her?' Denise felt a blush rising to her cheek. She was perfectly well aware that Genevieve referred to Columban and Clara, but she pretended to be surprised. "'Who, dare?' Genevieve shook her head with an incredulous air. "'Don't tell falsehoods. I beg of you. Do me the favour of setting my doubts at rest. You must know, I feel it. Yes, you have been this girl's comrade, and I've seen Columban run after you, and talk to you in a low voice. He was giving you messages for her, wasn't he? Oh, for pity's sake, tell me the truth. I assure you it will do me good.' Never had Denise been in such an awkward position. She lowered her eyes before this almost dumb girl, who yet guessed all. However, she had the strength to deceive her still. But it's you he loves. Genevieve turned away in despair. Very well, you won't tell me anything. However, I don't care. I've seen them. He's continually going outside to look at her. She, upstairs, laughs like a bad woman. Of course, they meet out of doors. As for that, no, I assure you, exclaimed Denise, forgetting herself carried away by the desire to give her, at least, that consolation. The young girl drew a long breath and smiled feebly. Then, with the weak voice of a convalescent, "'I should like a glass of water. Excuse me if I trouble you. Look, over there in the sideboard.' When she got hold of the bottle, she drank a large glassful right off, keeping Denise away with one hand, the latter being afraid Genevieve might do herself harm. "'No, no, let me be. I'm always thirsty. In the night I get up to drink.' There was a fresh silence. Then she went on again quietly. "'If you only knew, I've been accustomed to the idea of this marriage for the last ten years. I was still wearing short dresses when Columban was courting me. I hardly remember how things have come about. By always living together, being shut up here together, without any other distractions between us, I must have ended by believing him to be my husband before he really was. I didn't know whether I loved him. I was his wife, and that's all. And now he wants to go off with another girl. Oh, heavens! My heart is breaking. You see, it's a grief that I've never felt before. It hurts me in the bosom and in the head, then it spreads everywhere and is killing me. Her eyes filled with tears. Denise, whose eyelids were also wet with pity, asked her, does my aunt suspect anything? Yes, Mamma has her suspicions, I think. As to Papa, he is too worried, and does not know the pain he is causing me by postponing this marriage. Mamma has questioned me several times, greatly alarmed to see me pining away. She has never been very strong herself, and has often said, My poor child, I have not made you very strong. Besides, one doesn't grow much in these shops. But you must find me getting really too thin now. Look at my arms. Would you believe it? And with a trembling hand she again took up the water bottle. Her cousin tried to prevent her drinking. No, I'm so thirsty. Let me drink. They could hear Baudu talking in a loud voice. Then yielding to an inspiration of her tender heart, Denise knelt down before Genevieve, 
throwing her arms round her neck, kissing her, and assuring her that everything would turn out all right, that she would marry Columban, that she would get well and live happily. But she got up quickly. Her uncle was calling her. "'Sean is here. Come along.' It was indeed Sean, looking rather scared, who had come to dinner. When they told him it was striking eight, he looked amazed. Impossible! He had only just left his master's. They chafed him. No doubt he had come by way of the Bois de Vincennes. But as soon as he could get near his sister, he whispered to her, "'It's a little laundry girl who was taking back some linen. I've got a cab outside by the hour. Give me five francs.' He went out a minute, and then returned to dinner, for Madame Bardou would not hear of his going away without taking, at least, a plate of soup. Genevieve had reappeared in her usual silent and retiring manner. Columban was half asleep behind the counter. The evening passed away, slow and melancholy, only animated by Baudu's step as he walked from one end of the empty shop to the other. A single gas burner was alight. The shadow of the low ceiling fell in large masses like black earth from a ditch. Several months passed away. Denise came in nearly every evening to cheer up Genevieve a bit, but the house became more melancholy than ever. The works opposite were a continual torment, which intensified their bad luck. Even when they had an hour of hope, some unexpected joy, the falling of a tumbrel load of bricks, the sound of the saw of a stone-cutter, or the simple call of a mason, sufficed at once to mar their pleasure. In fact, the whole neighbourhood felt the shock. From the bordered enclosure, running along and blocking up the three streets, there issued a movement of feverish activity. Although the architect used the existing buildings, he altered them in various ways to adapt them to their new uses and right in the centre at the opening caused by the courtyards, he was building a central gallery as big as a church, which was to terminate with a grand entrance in the Rue Nouveau saint augustine right in the middle of the frontage. They had, at first, experienced great difficulty in laying the foundations, for they had come on to some sewer deposits and loose earth, full of human bones. Besides that, the boring of the well had made the neighbours very anxious. A well three hundred feet deep, destined to give two hundred gallons a minute. They had now got the walls up to the first story. The entire block was surrounded by scaffolding, regular towers of timber-work. There was an incessant noise from the grinding of the windlasses hoisting up the stone, the abrupt discharge of iron bars, the clamour of this army of workmen, accompanied by the noise of picks and hammers. But above all, what deafened the people was the sound of the machinery. Everything went by steam, screeching whistles rent the air, whilst, at the slightest gust of wind, clouds of plaster flew about and covered the neighbouring roofs like a fall of snow. The Baudus, in despair, looked on at this implacable dust penetrating everywhere, getting through the closest woodwork, soiling the goods in their shop, even gliding into their beds, and the idea that they must continue to breathe it, that it would finish by killing them, and poison their existence. The situation, however, was destined to become worse still, for in September the architect, afraid of not being ready, decided to carry on the work at night also. Powerful electric lamps were established, and the uproar became continuous. Gangs of men relieved each other, the hammers never stopped, the engines whistled night and day, the everlasting clamour seemed to race and scatter the white dust. The Baudus now had to give up the idea of sleeping even, they were shaken in their beds. The noises changed into nightmare as soon as they fell off to sleep. Then, if they got up to calm their fever, and went with bare feet to look out of the window, they were frightened by the vision of the ladies' paradise flaring in the darkness, like a colossal forge where their ruin was being forged. Along the half-built walls, dotted with open base, the electric lamps threw a large blue flood of light, of a blinding intensity. Two o'clock struck, then three, then four, and during the painful sleep of the neighbourhood, the works, increased by this lunar brightness, became colossal and fantastic, swarming with black shadows, noisy workmen, whose profiles gesticulated on the crude whiteness of the new plastering. Baudu was quite right. The small traders in the neighbouring streets were receiving another mortal blow. Every time the ladies' paradise created new departments, there were fresh failures among the shopkeepers of the district. The disaster spread, one could hear the cracking of the oldest houses. 
Mademoiselle Tatin, at the underlinen shop in the Passage Choseul, had just been declared bankrupt. Quinette, the glover, could hardly hold out another six months. The ferriers, Fanpoli, were obliged to sublet a part of their premises. And if the Bédorés, brother and sister, the Hossiers, still kept on in the Rue Gaillon, they were evidently living on money saved formerly. And now more smashes were going to be added to those long since foreseen. The department for fancy goods threatened a toy shopkeeper in the Rue Saint Roche. The Sligneriere, a big full blooded man, whilst the furniture department attacked Messieurs Pion and Révory, whose shops were sleeping in the shadow of the Passage Saint Anne. It was even feared that an attack of apoplexy would carry off the toy man, who had gone into a terrible rage on seeing the ladies' paradise mark up purses at thirty per cent reduction. The furniture dealers, who were much calmer, affected to joke at these counter-jumpers who wanted to meddle with such articles as chairs and tables, but customers were already leaving them. The success of the department had every appearance of being a formidable one. It was all over. They were obliged to bow their heads. After these, others would be swept off, and there was no reason why every business should not be driven away. One day the ladies' paradise alone would cover the neighbourhood with its roof. At present, morning and evening, when the thousand employees went in and came out, they formed such a long procession in the Place Gaillon that people stopped to look at them as they would at a passing regiment. For ten minutes they blocked up all the streets, and the shopkeepers at their doors thought bitterly of their single assistant, whom they hardly knew how to find food for. The last balance sheet of the big shop, the forty millions turned over, had also caused a revolution in the neighbourhood. The figure passed from house to house amid cries of surprise and anger. Forty millions! Think of that! No doubt the net profit did not exceed more than four per cent, with their heavy general expenses and system of low prices. But sixteen hundred thousand francs was a jolly sum. One could be satisfied with four per cent when one operated on such a scale as that. It was said that Moret's starting capital of five hundred thousand francs, augmented each year by their total profits, a capital which must at that moment have amounted to four millions, had thus passed ten times over the counters in the form of goods. Robinot, when he made this calculation before Denise, after dinner, was overcome for a moment, his eyes fixed on his empty plate. She was right. It was this incessant renewal of the capital that constituted the invincible force of the new system of business. Bourras alone denied the facts, refusing to understand, superb and stupid as a milestone. A pack of thieves and nothing more. A lying set. Cheap jacks who would be picked up out of the gutter one fine morning. The Baudus, however, notwithstanding their wish not to change anything in the way of the old Elbeuf, tried to sustain their competition. The customers no longer coming to them, they forced themselves to go to the customers, through the agency of travellers. There was at that time, in the Paris market, a traveller connected with all the great tailors, who saved the little cloth and flannel houses when he condescended to represent them. Naturally, they all tried to get hold of him. He assumed the importance of a personage. And Baudu, having haggled with them, had the misfortune of seeing him come to terms with the Matignons, in the Rue Croy des Petits Champs. One after the other, two other travellers robbed him. A third, an honest man, did no business. It was a slow death, without any shock, a continual decrease of business, customers lost one by one. A day came when the bills fell very heavily. Up to that time they had lived on their former savings, but now they began to contract debt. In December, Baudu, terrified by the amount of bills he had accepted, resigned himself to a most cruel sacrifice. He sold his country house at Rambouillet, a house which cost him a lot of money in continual repairs, and for which the tenants had not even paid the rent when he decided to get rid of it. This sale killed the only dream of his life. His heart bled as for the loss of some dear one. And he had to sell for seventy thousand francs that which had cost him more than two hundred thousand, considering himself fortunate to have met the Lomps, his neighbours, who were desirous of adding to their property. The seventy thousand francs would keep the business going a little longer, for notwithstanding the repulses already encountered, the idea of struggling sprang up again. Perhaps with great care they might conquer even now. End of chapter 8, part 1
Section 18 of The Ladies' Paradise by Emile Zola. Translated by Ernest Alfred Visitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Christine G. Chapter 8, Part 2. The Sunday on which the Lhommes paid the money, they were good enough to dine at the old El Boeuf. Madame Oralie was the first to arrive. They had to wait for the cashier, who came late, scared by a whole afternoon's music. As for young Albert, he had accepted the invitation, but did not put in an appearance. It was, moreover, a somewhat painful evening. The Baudus, living without air in their narrow dining-room, suffered from the gust of a wind brought in by the Lhommes, with their scattered family and taste for a free existence. Genevieve, wounded by Madame Oralie's imperial airs, did not open her mouth, whilst Columban was admiring her with a shiver, on reflecting that she reigned over Clara. Before retiring to rest, in the evening, Madame Baudu being already in bed, Baudu walked about the room for a long time. It was a mild night, thawing and damp. Outside, notwithstanding the closed windows and drawn curtains, one could hear the machinery roaring on the opposite side of the way. "'Do you know what I am thinking of, Elizabeth?' said he at last. "'Well, these lums may earn as much money as they like. I'd rather be in my shoes than theirs. They get on well, it's true. The wife said, didn't she, that she had made nearly twenty thousand francs this year, and that has enabled her to take my poor house. Never mind. I've no longer the house, but I don't go playing music in one direction, whilst you are gadding about in the other. No, look you, they can't be happy.' He was still labouring under the grief of his sacrifice, nourishing a certain rancour against those people who had brought up his darling dream. When he came near the bed, he gesticulated, leaning over his wife. Then, returning to the window, he stood silent for a minute, listening to the noise of the works, and he resumed his old accusations, his despairing complaints about the new times. Nobody had ever seen such things, a shop assistant earning more than a tradesman, cashiers buying up the employer's property. Everything was going to the dogs. Family ties no longer existed. People lived at hotels instead of eating their meals at home in a respectable manner. He ended by prophesying that young Albert would later on swallow up the Rambouillet property with a lot of actresses. Madame Baudou listened to him, her head flat on the pillow, so pale that her face was the colour of the sheets. "'They've paid you,' at length said she, softly. At this Baudu became dumb. He walked about for an instant with his eyes on the ground. Then he resumed. "'They've paid me, tis true, and, after all, their money is as good as another's. It would be funny if we revived the business with this money. Ah, if I were not so old and worn out!' A long silence ensued. The draper was full of vague projects. Suddenly his wife spoke again, her eyes fixed on the ceiling, without moving her head. "'Have you noticed your daughter lately?' "'No,' replied he. "'Well, she makes me rather anxious. "'She's getting pale. "'She seems to be pining away.' "'He stood before the bed, full of surprise. "'Really? Whatever for? "'If she's ill, she should say so. "'Tomorrow we must send for the doctor.' "'Madame Baudu still remained motionless. "'After a short time, she declared with her meditative air, this marriage with Columban, I think it would be better to get it over. He looked at her, then began walking about again. Certain things came back to his mind. Was it possible that his daughter was falling ill over the shopman? Did she love him so much that she could not wait? Here was another misfortune. It worried him all the more from the fact that he himself had fixed ideas about this marriage. He could never consent to it in the present state of affairs. However, his anxiety softened him. "'Very good,' said he at last. "'I'll speak to Columban.' And without saying another word, he continued his walk. Soon afterwards his wife fell off to sleep, quite white, as if dead, but he still kept on walking about. Before getting into bed he drew aside the curtains and glanced outside. On the other side of the street, the gaping windows of the old Hotel de Villars showed the workmen moving about in the dazzling glare of the electric light. The next morning Baudu took Columban to the further end of the storeroom on the upper floor, 
having made up his mind overnight what he should say to him. "'My boy,' said he, "'you know I have sold my property at Rambouillet. "'That will enable us to show good fight. "'But I should like beforehand to have a talk with you.' The young man, who seemed to dread the interview, waited with an awkward air. His small eyes twinkled in his large face, and he stood there with his mouth open, a sign with him of profound agitation. "'Just listen to me,' resumed the draper. "'When old Hochecorn left me the old Elbeuf, the house was prosperous. "'He himself had received it from old Pinet in a satisfactory state. "'You know my ideas. "'I should consider it wrong if I passed this family trust to my children in a diminished state. "'And that's why I've always postponed your marriage with Genevieve. "'Yes, I was obstinate. "'I hoped to bring back our former prosperity. "'I wanted to hand you the books, saying, "'Look here.' The year I commenced we sold so much cloth, and this year, the year I retire, we have sold ten thousand or twenty thousand francs worth more. In short, you understand, it was a vow I had made to myself, the very natural desire I had to prove, that the house had not lost anything in my hands. Otherwise it would seem to me I was robbing you. His voice was stifled with emotion. He blew his nose to recover a bit and asked, "'You don't say anything?' But Columban had nothing to say. He shook his head, and waited, more and more troubled, thinking he could guess what the governor was aiming at. It was the marriage without further delay. How could he refuse? He would never have the strength, and the other girl, of whom he dreamed at night, devoured by such a flame that he frequently threw himself quite naked on the floor, in the fear of dying of it. "'Now,' continued Baudu, "'there's a sum of money that may save us.' The situation becomes worse every day, and perhaps by making a supreme effort. In short, I thought it right to warn you. We are going to venture our last stake. If we are beaten, why, that will entirely ruin us. But, my poor boy, your marriage must be again postponed, for I don't wish to throw you two all alone into the struggle. That would be too cowardly, wouldn't it? Columban, greatly relieved, had seated himself on a pile of swanskin flannel. His legs were still trembling. He was afraid of showing his joy. He held down his head, rolling his fingers on his knees. "'You don't say anything,' repeated Baudu. No, he said nothing. He could find nothing to say. The draper then slowly continued. "'I was sure this would grieve you. You must muster up courage. Pull yourself together a bit. Don't let yourself be crushed in this way. Above all, understand my position.' Can I hang such a weight on your neck? Instead of leaving you a good business, I should leave you a bankruptcy, perhaps. No, it's only a scoundrel who would play such a trick. No doubt, I desire nothing but your happiness. But no one shall ever make me go against my conscience. And he went on for a long time in this way, swaying about in a maze of contradictions, like a man who would have liked to be understood at half a word, and finds himself obliged to explain everything. As he had promised his daughter and the shop, strict probity forced him to deliver both in good condition, without defects or depth. But he was tired, the burden seemed to be too much for him, his stammering voice was one of supplication. He got more entangled than ever in his words, he was still expecting a sudden rally from Columban, some heartfelt cry, which came not. "'I know,' murmured he, "'that old men are wanting in ardour.' With young ones, things light up. They are full of fire, it's natural. But no, no, I can't. My word of honour. If I gave it up to you, you would blame me later on. He stopped, trembling, and as the young man still kept his head down, he asked him for the third time, after a painful silence. You don't say anything. At last, but without looking at him, Columban replied. There is nothing to say. You are the master, you know better than all of us. As you wish it, we'll wait, we'll try and be reasonable. It was all over. Baudu still hoped he was going to throw himself into his arms, exclaiming, Father, do you take a rest, we'll fight in our turn. Give us the shop as it is, so that we may work a miracle and save it. Then he looked at him, and was seized with shame, accusing himself of having wished to dupe his children. The deep-rooted manacle honesty of the shopkeeper was awakened in him, it was this prudent fellow who was right, for in business there is no such thing as sentiment, it is only a question of figures. "'Give me your hand, my boy,' said he in conclusion. 
"'It's settled we won't speak about the marriage for another year. "'One must think of the business before everything.' "'That evening, in their room, "'when Madame Baudu questioned her husband "'as to the result of the conversation, "'the latter had resumed his obstinate wish "'to fight in person to the bitter end. "'He gave Columban high praise, "'calling him a solid fellow, "'firm in his ideas, "'brought up with the best principles, "'incapable, for instance, "'of joking with the customers "'like those puppies at the Paradise.' No, he was honest, he belonged to the family, he didn't speculate on the business as though he were a stock-jobber. "'Well, then, when's the marriage to take place?' asked Madame Baudu. "'Later on,' replied he, "'when I am able to keep my promises.' She made no gestures, she simply observed, "'It will be our daughter's death.' Baudu restrained himself, stirred up with anger. He was the one whom it would kill, if they continually upset him like this. Was it his fault? He loved his daughter, would lay down his life for her, but he could not make the business prosper when it obstinately refused to do so. Genevieve ought to have a little more sense, and wait patiently for a better balance-sheet. The deuce! Columban was there, no one would run away with him. "'It's incredible,' repeated he. "'Such a well-trained girl!' Madame Baudu said no more. No doubt she had guessed Genevieve's jealous agony, but she did not dare to inform her husband— a singular womanly modesty always prevented her approaching certain tender, delicate subjects with him. When he saw her so silent, he turned his anger against the people opposite, stretching his fists out in the air, towards the works where they were setting up large iron girders, with a great noise of hammers. Denise had decided to return to the ladies' paradise, having understood that the Robinots, though forced to cut down their staff, did not like to dismiss her. To maintain their position now, they were obliged to do everything themselves. Gorgon, obstinate in his rancour, renewed their bills, even promised to find them funds. But they were frightened. They wanted to go in for economy and order. During a whole fortnight Denise had felt uneasy with them, and she had to speak first, saying she had found a situation elsewhere. This was a great relief. Madame Robineau embraced her, deeply affected, saying she should always miss her. Then when, in return to a question, the young girl said she was going back to Moret's, Robineau turned pale. "'You are right!' he exclaimed violently. It was not so easy to tell the news to old Bourras. However, Denise had to give him notice, and she trembled, for she was full of gratitude towards him. Bourras, just at this time, was in a continual fever of rage, full of invectives against the works going on next door. The builder's carts blocked up his doorway— the picks tapped on his walls. Everything in his place, the umbrellas and the sticks, danced about to the noise of the hammers. It seemed that the hovel, obstinately remaining amid all these demolitions, was going to give way. But the worst of all was that the architect, in order to connect the existing shops with those about to be opened in the Hotel de Villars, had conceived the idea of boring a passage under the little house that separated them. This house belonged to the firm of Moret and Company, and the lease stipulating that the tenant should submit to all necessary repairs, the workmen appearing on the scene one morning. At this, Bourras nearly went into a fit. Wasn't it enough to strangle him on all sides, on the right, the left, and behind, without attacking him underfoot as well, taking the ground from under him? And he drove the masons away, and went to law. Repairs, yes, but this was rather a work of embellishment. The neighbourhood thought he would carry the day, without, however, being sure of anything. The case, however, threatened to be a long one, and people became very excited over this interminable duel. The day Denise resolved to give him notice, Bourras had just returned from his lawyer. "'Would you believe it?' exclaimed he. "'They now say the house is not solid. They pretend that the foundations must be strengthened. Confound it! They have shaken it up so with their infernal machines.' that it isn't astonishing if it gave its way. Then, when the young girl announced she was going away, and that she was going back to the ladies' paradise at a salary of a thousand francs, he was so amazed that he simply raised his trembling hands in the air. The emotion made him drop into a chair. "'You! You!' he stammered. "'Ah! Oh, I'm the only one! I'm the only one left!' After a pause he asked. "'And the youngster?' "'He'll go back to Madame Grasse,' replied Denise. "'She is very fond of him.' 
they again remained silent. She would have rather seen him furious, swearing and banging with his fist. This old man, speechless, crushed, made her heart bleed. But he gradually recovered and cried out, "'A thousand francs! That can't be refused. You'll all go. Go, then, leave me here alone. Yes, alone. You understand. There shall be one who will never bow his head, and tell them I'll win my lawsuit if I have to sell my last shirt for it.' Denise was not to leave Robinot's till the end of the month. She had seen Moret again. Everything was settled. One evening, as she was going up to her room, Deloche, who was watching for her in a doorway, stopped her. He was delighted, having just heard the good news. They were all talking about it in the shop, he said, and he told her the gossip of the countess. "'You know, the young ladies in the dress department are pulling long faces.' Then, interrupting himself, he added, by the way, you remember Clara Prunet? Well, it appears the governor has. You understand? He had turned quite red. She, very pale, exclaimed, Monsieur Moret! Funny taste, eh? he resumed. A woman who looks like a horse. The little girl from the underlinen department, whom he had twice last year, was, at least, good looking. However, that's his business. The niece, once upstairs, almost fainted away. It was surely through coming up too quick. Leaning out of the window, she had a sudden vision of Valence, the deserted street and grassy pavement, which she used to see from her room as a child, and she was seized with the desire to go and live there, to seek refuge in the peace and forgetfulness of the country. Paris irritated her. She hated the ladies' paradise. She hardly knew why she had consented to go back. She would certainly suffer as much as ever there, she was already suffering from an unknown uneasiness since the luscious stories. Suddenly, without any notice, a flood of tears forced her to leave the window. She wept on for some time, and found a little courage to live on still. The next day at breakfast time, as Robineau had sent her on an errand, and she was passing the old Elbeuf, she pushed open the door and seeing Columban alone in the shop. The Baudus were breakfasting, she could hear the clatter of the knives and forks in the little room. "'You can come in,' said the shopman. "'They are at breakfast.' But she motioned him to be silent, and drew him into a corner. Then, lowering her voice, she said, "'It's you I want to speak to. Have you no heart? Don't you see that Genevieve loves you, and that it's killing her?' She was trembling. The previous night's fever had taken possession of her again. He, frightened, surprised at the sudden attack, stood looking at her without a word. "'Do you hear?' She continued, Genevieve knows you love another. She told me so. She wept like a child. Ah, oh, poor girl. She isn't very strong now, I can tell you. If you had seen her thin arms, it's heartbreaking. You can't leave her to die like this. At last he spoke, quite overcome. But she isn't ill. You exaggerate. I don't see anything myself. Besides, it's her father who is postponing the marriage. Denise sharply corrected this falsehood, certain that the least persistence on the part of the young man would decide her uncle. As to Columban's surprise, it was not feigned. He had really never noticed Genevieve's slow agony. For him it was a very disagreeable revelation, for while he remained ignorant of it, he had no great blame to tax himself with. "'And who for?' resumed Denise. "'For a worthless girl. You can't know who you are loving.' Up to the present I have not wanted to hurt your feelings. I have often avoided answering your continual questions. Well, she goes with everybody. She laughs at you. You will never have her, or you may have her like others, just once in a way. He listened to her, very pale, and at each of the sentences she threw into his face, his lips trembled. She, in a cruel fit, yielded to a transport of anger of which she had no consciousness. In short, said she in a final cry, "'She's with Monsieur Moray, if you want to know.' Her voice was stifled. She turned paler than Columban himself. Both stood looking at each other. Then he stammered out, "'I, I love her!' Denise felt ashamed of herself. Why was she talking in this way to this young fellow? Why was she getting so excited? She stood there mute. The simple reply he had just given resounded in her heart, like the clang of a bell, which deafened her. I love her, I love her, and it seemed to spread. He was right, he could not marry another woman. And as she turned round, she observed Genevieve on the threshold of the dining-room. Be quiet, she said rapidly. 
but it was too late. Genevieve must have heard, for her face was white and bloodless. Just at that moment a customer opened the door. Madame Bordelais, one of the last faithful customers of the old Elbeuf, where she found solid goods for her money. For a long time past, Madame de Bove had followed the fashion, and gone over to the ladies' paradise. Madame Marty herself no longer came, entirely captivated by the seductions of the display opposite. And Genevieve was forced to go forward, and say in her weak voice, "'What do you desire, madame?' Madame Bordelais wished to see some flannel. Columban took down a roll from a shelf. Genevieve showed the article, and both of them, their hands cold, found themselves brought together behind the counter. Meanwhile, Baudu came out of the dining-room last, behind his wife, who had gone and seated herself at the pay-desk. At first he did not meddle with the sale, but stood up, looking at Madame Bordelais. "'It is not good enough,' said the latter. "'Show me the strongest you have.' Columban took down another bundle. There was a silence. Madame Bordelais examined the stuff. "'How much?' Six francs, madame, replied Genevieve. The lady made an abrupt movement. Six francs, said she, but they have the same opposite at five francs. A slight contraction passed over Baudu's face. He could not help interfering politely. No doubt madame made a mistake. The stuff ought to have been sold at six francs and a half. It was impossible to give it at five francs. It must be another quality she was referring to. "'No, no,' she repeated, with the obstinacy of a lady who could not be deceived. "'The quality is the same. It may even be a little thicker.' And the discussion got very warm. Baudu, his face getting bilious, made an effort to continue smiling. His bitterness against the lady's paradise was bursting in his throat. "'Really,' said Madame Bordelais at last, "'you must treat me better, otherwise I shall go opposite, like the others.' He then lost his head and cried out, shaking with a passion he could not repress. "'Well, go opposite.' At this she got up, greatly annoyed, and went away without turning round, saying, "'That's what I'm going to do, sir.' A general stupor ensued. The governor's violence had frightened all of them. He was himself scared, and trembled at what he had just said. The phrase had escaped against his will in the explosion of a long pent-up rancour and the Baudus now stood there motionless, following Madame Bordelais with their looks, watching her cross the street. She seemed to be carrying off their fortune. When she slowly passed under the high door of the Ladies' Paradise, when they saw her disappear in the crowd, they felt a sort of sudden wrench. "'There's another they've taken from us,' murmured the draper. Then, turning towards Denise, of whose re-engagement he was aware, he said, "'You as well. They've taken you back. Oh, I don't blame you for it.' As they have the money, they are naturally the strongest. Just then, Denise, still hoping that Genevieve had not overheard Columban, was saying to her, He loves you. Try and cheer up. But the young girl replied to her in a very low and heartbroken voice, Why do you tell me a falsehood? Look, you can't help it. He's always glancing up there. I know very well they've stolen him from me, as they've robbed us of everything else. Genevieve went and sat down on the seat at the desk near her mother. The latter had doubtless guessed the fresh blow received by her daughter, for her anxious eyes wandered from her to Columban, and then to the lady's paradise. It was true, they had stolen everything from them, from the father a fortune, from the mother her dying child, from the daughter a husband, waited for for ten years. Before this condemned family, Denise, whose heart was overflowing with pity, felt for an instant afraid of being wicked. Was she not going to assist this machine which was crushing the poor people? But she felt herself carried away, as it were, by an invisible force, and knew that she was doing no wrong. Bah! resumed Baudu, to give himself courage. We shan't die over it, after all. For one customer lost, we shall find two others. You hear, Denise? I've got over seventy thousand francs here, which will certainly trouble your Moray's rest. Come, come, you others, don't look so glum. But he could not enliven them. He himself relapsed into a pale consternation, and they all stood with their eyes on the monster, attracted, possessed, full of their misfortune. The work was nearly finished. The scaffolding had been removed from the front. A whole side of the colossal edifice appeared, with its white halls and large light windows. Along the pavement, at last open to circulation, stood eight vans that the messengers were loading one after the other before the parcels office. In the sunshine, 
a ray of which ran along the street, the green panels, picked out with red and yellow, sparkled like so many mirrors, sending blinding reflections right into the old Elbeuf. The drivers, dressed in black, of a correct appearance, were holding the horses well in, superb pairs shaking their silvered bits. And each time a van was loaded, there was a sonorous rolling noise which made the neighbouring small shops tremble. And before this triumphal procession, which they were destined to submit to twice a day, the Baudu's hearts broke. The father half fainted away, asking himself where this continual flood of goods could go to, whilst the mother, tormented to death about her daughter, continued to gaze into the street, her eyes drowned in a flood of tears. End of chapter 8 Section 19 of The Ladies' Paradise by Emile Sola. Translated by Ernest Alfred Visitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Christine G. Chapter 9, Part 1. It was on a Monday, the 14th of March, that The Ladies' Paradise inaugurated its new buildings by a great exhibition of summer novelties, which was to last three days. Outside, a sharp wind was blowing. The passers-by, surprised by this return of a winter, spun along, buttoned up in their overcoats. However, behind the closed doors of the neighbouring shops, quite an agitation was fermenting, and one could see, against the windows, the pale faces of the small tradesmen, occupied in counting the first carriages which stopped before the new grand entrance in the Rue Neuveau-Saint-Augustine. This door, lofty and deep like a church porch, surmounted by a group, industry and commerce hand in hand, amidst a complication of symbols, was sheltered by a vast awning, the fresh gilding of which seemed to light up the pavement with a ray of sunshine. To the right and left stretched the shop fronts, barely dry and of a blinding whiteness, running along the Rue Monsigny and the Rue de la Mijodière occupying the whole island, except on the Rue de Dix de Zambre side, where the Crédit Immobilier intended to build. Along this barrack-like development, the small tradesmen, when they raised their heads, perceived the piles of goods through the large plate-glass windows which, from the ground floor up to the second story, opened the house to the light of day, and this enormous cube, this colossal bazaar, shut out the sky from them, seeming to cause the cold which was making them shiver behind their frozen counters. As early as six o'clock, Moret was on the spot, giving his final orders. In the centre, starting from the grand entrance, a large gallery ran from end to end, flanked right and left by two narrower galleries, the Monsigny Gallery and the Michaudière Gallery. The courtyards had been glazed and turned into halls, iron staircases rose from the ground floor, iron bridges were thrown from one end to the other on the two storeys. The architect, who happened to be a young man of talent, with modern ideas, had only used stone for the underground floor and the corner pillars, constructing the whole carcass of iron, the assembly of beams and rafters being supported by columns. The arches of the flooring and the partitions were of brickwork. Space had been gained everywhere, light and air entered freely, and the public circulated with the greatest ease under the bold flights of the far-stretching girders. It was the cathedral of modern commerce, light but solid, made for a nation of customers. Below, in the central gallery, after the door bargains, came the cravat, the glove, and the silk departments. The Montigny gallery was occupied by the linen and the rouen goods, the Michaudière gallery by the mercery, the hoisery, the drapery, and the woollen departments. Then, on the first floor were installed the ready-made, the underlinen, the shawl, the lace, and other new departments whilst the bedding, the carpets, the furnishing materials, all the cumbersome articles difficult to handle, had been relegated to the second floor. The number of departments was now thirty-nine, with eighteen hundred employees, of whom two hundred were women. Quite a little world operation there, in the sonorous life of the high metallic knaves. Moret's unique passion was to conquer woman. He wished her to be queen in his house, and he had built this temple to get her completely at his mercy. His sole aim was to intoxicate her with gallant attentions, and traffic on her desires, work on her fever. Night and day he racked his brain to invent fresh attractions. He had already introduced two lifts, lined with velvet, for the upper stories, in order to spare delicate ladies the trouble of mounting the stairs. 
Then he had just opened a bar where the customers could find, gratis, some light refreshment, syrups and biscuits, and a reading-room, a monumental gallery, decorated with excessive luxury, in which he had even ventured on an exhibition of pictures. But his most profound idea was to conquer the mother through the child, when unable to do so through her coquetry. He neglected no means, speculated on every sentiment, created departments for little boys and girls, arresting the passing mothers by distributing pictures and air-balls to the children. A stroke of genius, this idea, of distributing to each buyer a red air-ball, made of fine gutta-percha, bearing in large letters the name of the shop, and which, held by a string, floated in the air, parading in the street a living advertisement. But the greatest power of all was the advertising. Moret spent three hundred thousand francs a year in catalogues, advertisements, and bills. For his summer sale he had launched forth two hundred thousand catalogues, of which fifty thousand went abroad, translated into every language. He now had them illustrated with engravings, even accompanying them with samples, gummed between the leaves. It was an overflowing display. The ladies' paradise became a household word all over the world, invading the walls, the newspapers, and even the curtains at the theatres. He declared that woman was powerless against advertising, that she was bound to follow the crowd. Not only that, he laid still more seductive traps for her, analysing her like a great moralist. Thus he had discovered that she could not resist a bargain, that she bought without necessity when she thought she saw a cheap line, and on this observation he based his system of reductions in price, progressively lowering the price of unsold articles, preferring to sell them at a loss, faithful to his principle of the continual renewal of the goods. He had penetrated still further into the heart of woman, and he had just thought of the returns, a masterpiece of Jesuitical seduction. "'Take whatever you like, madam. You can return the article if you don't like it.' And the woman who hesitated was provided with the last excuse, the possibility of repairing an extravagant folly. She took the article with an easy conscience. The returns and the reduction of prices now formed part of the classical working of the new style of business. But where Moret revealed himself as an unrivalled master was in the interior arrangement of the shops. He laid down as a law that no corner of the ladies' paradise ought to remain deserted, requiring everywhere a noise, a crowd, evidence of life. For life, said he, attracts life, increases and multiplies. From this law he drew all sorts of applications. In the first place, there ought always to be a crush at the entrance, so that the people in the street should mistake it for a riot. And he obtained this crush by placing a lot of bargains at the doors, shelves and baskets overflowing with very low-priced articles, so that the common people crowded there, stopping up the doorway, making the shop look as if it were crammed with customers, when it was often only half full. Then, in the galleries, he had the art of concealing the departments in which business was slack. For instance, the shawl department in summer, and the printed calico department in winter, he surrounded them with busy departments, drowning them with a continual uproar. It was he alone who had been inspired with the idea of placing on the second floor the carpet and furniture counters where the customers were less frequent, and which, if placed on the ground floor, would have canned empty cold spaces. If he could have managed it, he would have had the street running through his shop. Just at that moment, Moret was a prey to an attack of inspiration. On the Saturday evening, as he was giving a last look at the preparations for the Monday's great sale, he was suddenly struck with the idea that the arrangement of the departments adopted by him was wrong and stupid, and yet it seemed a perfectly logical arrangement. The stuffs on one side, the made-up articles on the other, an intelligent order to things which would enable the customers to find their way themselves. He had thought of this orderly arrangement formerly, in Madame Hedouin's narrow shop, and now he felt his faith shaken just as he carried out his idea. Suddenly he cried out that they would have to alter all that. They had forty-eight hours, and half what had been done had to be changed. The staff, frightened, bewildered, had been obliged to work two nights and the entire Sunday, amidst the frightful disorder. On the Monday morning, even, an hour before the opening, there were still some goods to be placed. Decidedly the governor was going mad. No one understood. A general consternation prevailed. "'Come, look sharp!' cried Moret, with a quiet assurance of his genius. There are some more costumes to be taken upstairs. And the Japan goods, are they placed on the central landing? 
A last effort, my boys. You'll see the sail by and by. Bourdoncle had also been there since daybreak. He did not understand any more than the others, and he followed the governor's movements with an anxious eye. He hardly dared to ask him any questions, knowing how Moret received people in these critical moments. However, he at last made up his mind, and gently asked, "'Was it really necessary to upset everything like that, on the eve of our sale? At first Moret shrugged his shoulders without replying. Then, as the other persisted, he burst out, so that all the customers should heap themselves into one corner, eh? A nice idea of mine. I should never have got over it. Don't you see that it would have localized the crowd? A woman would have come in, gone straight to the department she wished, passed from the petticoat counter to the dress one, from the dress to the mantle, then retired, without ever having even lost herself for a moment. Not one would have thoroughly seen the establishment. But, remarked Bourdoncle, now that you have disarranged everything and thrown the goods all over the place, the employees will wear out their legs in guiding the customers from department to department. Moret gave a look of superb contempt. I don't care a hang for that. They're young. It'll make them grow. So much the better if they do walk about. They'll appear more numerous and increase the crowd. The greater the crush, the better. All will go well. He laughed and deigned to explain his idea, lowering his voice. Look here, Bourdoncle, listen to the result. Firstly, this continual circulation of customers disperses them all over the shop, multiplies them and makes them lose their heads. Secondly, as they must be conducted from one end of the establishment to the other, if they want, for instance, a lining after having bought a dress, these journeys in every direction triple the size of the house in their eyes. Thirdly, they are forced to traverse departments where they would never have set foot otherwise, temptations present themselves on their passage, and they succumb. Fourthly, Bourdoncle was now laughing with him. At this, Moret, delighted, stopped to call out to the messengers. Very good, my boys. Now for a sweep, and it will be splendid. But on turning round, he perceived Denise. He and Bourdoncle were opposite the ready-made department, which he had just dismembered by sending the dresses and costumes up on the second floor, at the other end of the building. Denise, the first down, was opening her eyes with astonishment, quite bewildered by the new arrangements. "'What is it?' murmured she. "'Are we going to move?' This surprise appeared to amuse Moret, who adored these sensational effects. Early in February, Denise had returned to the ladies' paradise, where she had been agreeably surprised to find the staff polite, almost respectful. Madame Aurélie especially was very kind. Marguerite and Clara seemed resigned, even down to old Jove, who also bowed his head, with an awkward, embarrassed air, as if desirous of effacing the disagreeable memory of the past. It sufficed that Moret had said a few words, everybody was whispering, following her with their eyes, and in this general amiability the only things that wounded her were Deloche's singularly melancholy looks, and Pauline's inexplicable smiles. However, Moret was still looking at her in his delighted way. "'What is it you want, mademoiselle?' asked he at last. Denise had not noticed him. She blushed slightly. Since her return she had received marks of kindness from him which greatly touched her. Pauline, without her knowing why, had given her a full account of the governess and Clara's love affairs, where he saw her, and what he paid her, and she often returned to the subject, even adding that he had another mistress, that Madame de Fauche, well known by all the shop. Such stories stirred up Denise. She felt in his presence all her former affairs, an uneasiness in which her gratitude was struggling against her anger. "'It's all this confusion going on in the place,' she murmured. Moret then approached her, and said in a lower voice, "'Have the goodness to come to my office this evening after business. I wish to speak to you.' Greatly agitated, she bowed her head without saying a word, and she went into the department where the other saleswomen were now arriving. But Bordoncle had overheard Moret, and he looked at him with a smile. He even ventured to say when they were alone, "'That girl again. Be careful. It will end by being serious.' Moret hastily defended himself, concealing his emotion beneath an air of superior indifference. "'Never fear. It's only a joke. The woman who'll catch me isn't born, my dear fellow.' And as the shop was opening at last, he rushed off to give a final look at the various counters. Bordoncle shook his head. This Denise, so simple and quiet, began to make him uneasy. 
The first time he had conquered by a brutal dismissal, but she had reappeared, and he felt she had become so strong that he now treated her as a redoubtable adversary, remaining mute before her, patiently waiting. Moret, who he caught up, was shouting out downstairs in the St. Augustine Hall, opposite the entrance door. "'Are you playing with me? I ordered the blue parasols to be put out of border. Just pull all that down and be quick about it.' He would listen to nothing. A gang of messengers had to come and rearrange the exhibition of parasols. Seeing the customers arriving, he even had their doors closed for a moment, declaring that he would not open them, rather than have the blue parasols in the centre. It ruined his composition. The renowned dresses, Hutard, Mignon, and the others, came to look and opened their eyes, but they affected not to understand, being of a different school. At last the doors were opened again, and the crowd flowed in. From the first, before the shop was full, there was such a crush at the doorway that they were obliged to call the police to re-establish the circulation on the pavement. Moret had calculated correctly. All the housekeepers, a compact troop of middle-class women and workmen's wives, swarmed around the bargains and remnants displayed in the open street. They felt the hung goods at the entrance, a calico at seven sous, a wool and cotton grey stuff at nine sous, and, above all, an Orleans cloth at seven sous and a half, which was emptying the poorer purses. There was an elbowing, a feverish crushing around the shelves and baskets containing the articles at reduced prices, lace at two sous, ribbon at five, garters at three the pair, gloves, petticoats, cravats, cotton socks and stockings, were all tumbled about and disappearing as if swallowed up by the voracious crowd. Notwithstanding the cold, the shopman who was selling in the open street could not serve fast enough. A woman in the family way cried out with pain. Two little girls were nearly stifled. All the morning this crush went on increasing. Towards one o'clock there was a crowd waiting to enter. The street was blocked as in a time of riot. Just at that moment, as Madame de Bove and her daughter Blanche were standing on the pavement opposite, hesitating, they were accosted by Madame Marty, also accompanied by her daughter Valentine. "'What a crowd, eh?' said the former. "'They're killing themselves inside. "'I ought not to have come. "'I was in bed, but I got up to get a little fresh air.' "'Just like me,' said the other. "'I promised my husband to go and see his sister at Montmartre. "'Then just as I was passing, I thought of a piece of braid I wanted. "'I may as well buy it here as anywhere else, mayn't I? "'Oh, I shan't spend a sou. "'In fact, I don't want anything.' "'However, they did not take their eyes off the door.' seized and carried away as they were by the force of the crowd. "'No, no, I'm not going in, I'm afraid,' murmured Madame de Bove. Oh, "'Blanche, let's go away. We should be crushed.' But her voice failed. She was gradually yielding to the desire to follow the others, and her fear dissolved in the irresistible attraction of the crush. Madame Marty was also giving way, repeating, "'Keep hold of my dress, Valentine. Ah, well, I've never seen such a thing before. You are lifted off your feet.' What will it be inside? The ladies, seized by the current, could not now go back. As streams attract to themselves the fugitive waters of a valley, so it seemed that the wave of customers, flowing into the vestibule, was absorbing the passers-by, drinking in the population from the four corners of Paris. They advanced but slowly, squeezed almost to death, kept upright by the shoulders and bellies around them, of which they felt the close heat and their satisfied desire enjoyed the painful entrance which incited still further their curiosity. There was a pell-mell of ladies arrayed in silk, of poorly dressed middle-class women, and of bare-headed girls, all excited and carried away by the same passion. A few men buried beneath the overflow of bosoms were casting anxious glances around them. A nurse, in the thickest of the crowd, held her baby above her head, the youngster crowing with delight. The only one to get angry was a skinny woman, who broke out into bad words, accusing her neighbour of digging right into her. "'I really think I should lose my skirt in this crowd,' remarked Madame de Bove. Mute, her face still fresh from the open air, Madame Marty was standing on tiptoe to see above the others' heads, into the depths of the shop. The pupils of her grey eyes were as contracted as those of a cat coming out of the broad daylight." She had the reposed flesh and the clear expression of a person just waking up. "'Ah, oh, at last!' said she, heaving a sigh. The ladies had just extricated themselves. They were in the St. Augustine Hall, which they were greatly surprised to find almost empty, 
but a feeling of comfort invaded them. They seemed to be entering into springtime after emerging from the winter of the street. Whilst outside, the frozen wind, laden with rain and hail, was still blowing, the fine season in the paradise galleries was already budding forth with the light stuffs, the flowery brilliancy of the tender shades, the rural gaiety of the summer dresses and the parasols. "'Do look here!' exclaimed Madame de Bove, standing motionless, her eyes in the air. It was the exhibition of parasols. Wide open, rounded off like shields, they covered the whole hall, from the glazed roof to the varnished oak mouldings below. They described festons round the semicircular arches of the upper stories. They descended in garlands along the slender columns. They ran along in close lines on the balustrades of the gallery and the staircases. And everywhere, ranged symmetrically, speckling the walls with red, green, and yellow, they looked like great Venetian lanterns, lighted up for some colossal entertainment. In the corners were more complicated patterns, stars composed of parasols at thirty-nine sous, the light shades of which, pale blue, cream white, and blush rose, seemed to burn with the sweetness of a night light, whilst up above, immense Japanese parasols, on which golden-coloured cranes soared in a purple sky, blazed forth with the reflection of a great conflagration. Madame Marty endeavoured to find a phrase to express her rapture, but could only exclaim, "'It's like fairyland!' Then, trying to find out where she was, she continued, "'Let's see, the braid is in the mercery department. I shall buy my braid and be off.'" End of chapter 9, part 1「Section 20 of The Ladies' Paradise by Emile Sola, translated by Ernest Alfred Visitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Christine G. Chapter 9, Part 2 Unfortunately, there was such a crush in the mercery department that she could not get served. They had both been waiting for over ten minutes, and were getting annoyed, when the sudden meeting with Madame Bordelais occupied their attention. The latter explained, with her quiet practical air, that she had just brought the little ones to see the show. Madeleine was ten, Edmond eight, and Lucien four years old, and they were laughing with joy. It was a cheap treat long promised. "'They are really too comical. I shall buy a red parasol,' said Madame Marty all at once, stamping with impatience at being there doing nothing. She chose one at fourteen francs and a half. Madame Bordelais, after having watched the purchase with a look of blame, said to her amicably, "'You are very wrong to be in such a hurry. In a month's time you could have had it for ten francs. They won't catch me like that.' And she developed quite a theory of careful housekeeping. As the shops lowered their prices, it was simply a question of waiting. She did not wish to be taken in by them. She preferred to take advantage of their real bargains." She even showed a feeling of malice in the struggle, boasting that she had never left him a sou profit. "'Come,' said she at last, "'I've promised my little ones to show them the pictures upstairs in the reading-room. Come up with us, you have plenty of time.' And the braid was forgotten. Madame Marty yielded at once, whilst Madame de Bove refused, preferring to take turn on the ground floor first. Besides, they were sure to meet again upstairs.' Madame Bordelais was looking for a staircase when she perceived one of the lifts, and she pushed her children in to complete their pleasure. Madame Marty and Valentine also entered the narrow cage, where they were closely packed, but the mirrors, the velvet seats, and the polished brasswork took up their attention so much that they arrived at the first story without having felt the gentle ascent of the machine. Another pleasure was in store for them in the first gallery. As they passed before the refreshment bar, Madame Bordelais did not fail to gorge her little family with syrup. It was a square room with a large marble counter. At the two ends there were silver fountains from which flowed a small stream of water, whilst rows of bottles stood on small shelves behind. Three waiters were continually engaged wiping and filling the glasses. To restrain the thirsty crowd, they had been obliged to establish a system of turns, as the theatres and railway stations, by erecting a barrier covered with velvet. The crush was terrific. Some people, losing all shame before these gratuitous treats, made themselves ill. "'Well, where are they?' exclaimed Madame Bordelais when she extricated herself from the crowd, after having wiped the children's faces with her handkerchief. 
but she caught sight of Madame Marty and Valentine at the further end of another gallery, a long way off. Both, buried beneath a heap of petticoats, were still buying. They were conquered. The mother and the daughter were rapidly disappearing in the fever of spending which was carrying them away. When she at last arrived in the reading-room, Madame Bourdelais installed Madeleine, Edmond and Lucien before the large table. Then taking from one of the shelves some photographic albums, she brought them to them. The ceiling of the long apartment was covered with gold. At the two extremities, monumental chimney-pieces faced each other. Some rather poor pictures, very richly framed, covered the walls. And between the columns before each of the arched bays, opening into the various shops, were tall green plants in majolica vases. Quite a silent crowd surrounded the table, which was littered with reviews and newspapers, with here and there some inkstands and boxes of stationery. Ladies took off their gloves, and wrote their letter on the paper stamped with the name of the house, which they crossed out with a dash of the pen. A few men, lolling back in the armchairs, were reading the newspapers, but a great many people sat there doing nothing, husbands waiting for their wives, let loose in the various departments, discreet young women looking out for their lovers, old relations left there as in a cloakroom, to be taken away when time to leave. And this little society, comfortably installed, quietly reposed itself there, glancing through the open base into the depth of the galleries and the halls, from which a distant murmur ascended above the grating of the pens and the rustling of the newspapers. "'What? You here?' said Madame Bourdelais. "'I didn't know you.' Near the children was a lady concealed behind the pages of a review. It was Madame Guibal. She seemed annoyed at the meeting, but quickly recovered herself, related that she had come to sit down for a moment to escape the crush. And as Madame Bourdelais asked her if she was going to make any purchases, she replied with her languorous air, hiding behind her eyelashes the egotistical greediness of her looks. "'Oh, no, on the contrary, I have come to return some goods.' "'Yes, some door curtains which I don't like. "'But there is such a crowd that I am waiting to get near the department.' "'She went on talking, saying how convenient this system of returns was. "'Formerly she never bought anything, but now she sometimes allowed herself to be tempted. "'In fact, she returned four articles out of five, "'and was getting known at all the counters for her strange system of buying "'and her eternal discontent which made her bring back the articles one by one, after having kept them several days. But, whilst speaking, she did not take her eyes off the doors of the reading-room, and she appeared greatly relieved when Madame Bortalet rejoined her children to explain the photographs to them. Almost at the same moment, Monsieur de Bove and Paul de Valangeusque came in. The Count, who affected to be showing the young man through the new buildings, exchanged a rapid glance with Madame Gibal, and then she plunged into her review again, as if she had not seen him. "'Hello, Paul!' suddenly exclaimed the voice behind these gentlemen. It was Moret, on his way round to give a look at the various departments. They shook hands, and he at once said, "'Has Madame de Bove done us the honour of coming?' "'Well, no,' replied the husband. "'And she very much regrets it. She's not very well. Oh, nothing dangerous.' But suddenly he pretended to catch sight of Madame Gibal, and ran off, going up to her bareheaded, whilst the others merely bowed to her from a distance. She also pretended to be surprised. Paul smiled. He now understood the affair, and he related to Moret in a low voice how de Bove, whom he had met in the Rue Richelieu, had tried to get away from him, and had finished by dragging him into the ladies' paradise, under the pretext that he must show him the new buildings. For the last year the lady had drawn from de Bove all the money and pleasure she could, never writing to him, making appointments with him in public places, churches, museums, and shops, to arrange their affairs. "'I fancy that at each meeting they changed their hotel,' murmured the young man. Not long ago he was on a tour of inspection. He wrote to his wife every day from Blois, Libor, and Tarbes, and yet I feel convinced I saw them going into a family boarding-house at Batignon. But look at him. Isn't he splendid before her with his military correctness?' "'The old French gallantry, my dear fellow, the old French gallantry.' "'And your marriage?' asked Moret. Paul, without taking his eyes off the Count, replied that they were still waiting for the death of the aunt. Then, with a triumphant air, "'There, did you see him?' He stooped down and slipped an address into her hand. She is now accepting with the most virtuous air. 
She's a terrible woman, that delicate red-haired creature with her careless ways. Well, there are some fine things going on in your place. Oh, said Moray, smiling, these ladies are not in my house, they are at home here. He then began to joke. Love, like the swallows, always brought good luck to a house. No doubt he knew the girls who wandered about from counter to counter, the ladies who accidentally met a friend in the shop, but if they bought nothing, they filled up a place, and helped to crowd and warm the shop. Still continuing his gossip, he carried his old comrade off, and planted him on the threshold of the reading-room, opposite the grand central gallery, the successive halls of which ran along at their feet. Behind them, the reading-room still retained its quiet air, only disturbed by the scratching of the pens and the rustling of the newspapers. One old gentleman had gone to sleep over the moniteur. Monsieur de Bove was looking at the pictures, with the evident intention of losing his future son-in-law in the crowd as soon as possible. And, alone, amid this calmness, Madame Bortelet was amusing her children, talking very loud, as in a conquered place. "'You see, they are quite at home,' said Moret, who pointed with a broad gesture to the multitude of women with which the departments were overflowing. Just at that moment, Madame de Forge, after having nearly had her mantle carried away in the crowd, at last came in and crossed the first hall. Then, on reaching the principal gallery, she raised her eyes. It was like a railway span, surrounded by the balustrades of the two stories, intersected by hanging staircases, crossed by flying bridges. The iron staircases developed bold curves, multiplying the landings. The iron bridges suspended in space ran straight along, very high up, and all this iron formed, beneath the white light of the windows, an excessively light architecture, a complicated lacework through which the daylight penetrated, the modern realization of a dreamed-of palace, the babel-like heaping up of the stories, enlarging the rooms, opening up glimpses onto other floors and into other rooms without end. In fact, iron reigned everywhere. The young architect had had the honesty and courage not to disguise it under a coating of paint, imitating stone or wood. Down below, in order not to outshine the goods, the decoration was sombre, with large regular spaces in neutral tints. Then, as the metallic work ascended, the capitals of the columns became richer, the rivets formed ornaments, the shoulder-pieces and corbels were loaded with sculptured work. Up above there was a mass of painting, green and red, amidst a prodigality of gold floods of gold, heaps of gold, even to the glazed work, the glass of which was enamelled and inlaid with gold. Under the covered galleries, the bare brick work of the arches was also decorated in bright colours. Mosaics and earthenware also formed part of the decoration, enlivening the friezes, lighting up with their fresh notes the severity of the whole, whilst the stairs, with their red velvet-covered handrails, were edged with a band of carved polished iron, which shone like the steel of a piece of armour. Although she had already seen the new establishment, Madame de Forge stood still, struck by the ardent life which was this day animating the immense nave. Below, around her, continued the eddying of the crowd, of which the double current of those entering and those going out made itself felt as far as the silk department. A crowd still very mixed in its elements, though the afternoon was bringing a greater number of ladies amongst the shopkeepers and housewives. A great many women in mourning, with their flowing veils, and the inevitable wet-nurses straying about, protecting their babies with their outstretched arms. And this sea of faces, these many-coloured hats, these bare heads, both dark and light, rolled from one end of the gallery to the other, confused and discoloured amidst the loud glare of the stuffs. Madame de Forge could see nothing but large price-tickets bearing enormous figures everywhere, their white patches standing out on the bright printed cottons, the shining silks and sombre woollens. Piles of ribbons curtailed the heads, a wall of flannel threw out the promontory. On all sides the mirrors carried the departments back into infinite space, reflecting the displays with portions of the public, faces reversed, and halves of shoulders and arms, whilst to the right and to the left the lateral galleries opened up other vistas, the snowy background of the linen department, the speckled depth of the hoisery one, distant views illuminated by the rays of light from some glazed bay, and in which the crowd appeared nothing but a mass of human dust. Then, when Madame de Forge raised her eyes, she saw, along the staircases, on the flying bridges, around the balustrade of each story, a continual humming ascent, 
the entire population in the air, travelling in the cuttings of the enormous ironwork construction, casting black shadows on the diffused light of the enamelled windows. Large gilded lustres hung from the ceiling, a decoration of rugs, embroidered silks, stuffs worked with gold, hung down, draping the balustrade with gorgeous banners, and, from one end to the other, there were clouds of lace, palpitations of muslin, trophies of silk, apotheosis of half-dressed dummies, and right at the top, above all this confusion, the bedding department, suspended as it were, displayed little iron bedsteads with their mattresses, hung with their white curtains, a sort of school dormitory sleeping amidst the stamping of the customers, rarer and rarer as the departments descended. "'Does madame require a cheap pair of garters?' asked the salesman of madame de Fauche, seeing her standing still. "'All silk, twenty-nine sous.' She did not deign to answer. Things were being offered around her more feverishly than ever. She wanted, however, to find out where she was. Albert Lhomme's pay-desk was on her left— he knew her by sight, and ventured to give her an amiable smile, not in the least hurry in the midst of the heaps of bills by which he was besieged, whilst behind him, Joseph, struggling with the string-box, could not pack up the articles fast enough. She then saw where she was. The silk department must be in front of her. But it took her ten minutes to get there. The crowd was becoming so immense. Up in the air, at the end of their invisible strings, the red air-balls had become more numerous than ever. They now formed clouds of purple, gently blowing towards the doors, continuing to scatter themselves over Paris, and she had to bow her head beneath the flight of air-balls, and when the young children held them, the string rolled round their little fingers. "'What, you have ventured here, madame?' exclaimed Boutemore gaily, as soon as he caught sight of Madame de Fauche. The manager of the silk department, introduced to her by Moray himself, was now in the habit of sometimes calling on her at five o'clock tea. She thought him common, but very amiable, of a fine sanguine temper, which surprised and amused her. Besides, about two days before, he had openly related to her the affair between Moret and Clara, without any calculation, out of stupidity, like a fellow who loves a joke, and, stung with jealousy, concealing her wounded feelings beneath an appearance of disdain, she had come to try and discover her rival. A young lady in the dress department, he had merely said, refusing to name her, "'Do you require anything today? he asked her. "'Of course, or else I should not have come. "'Have you any silk for morning gowns?' "'She hoped to obtain the name of the young lady from him, "'for she was full of desire to see her. "'He immediately called Favier, and resumed talking to her, "'whilst waiting for the salesman, "'who was just finishing serving a customer who happened to be the pretty lady, "'that beautiful blonde of whom the whole department occasionally spoke,' without knowing anything of her life, or even her name. This time the pretty lady was in deep mourning. Ah, who had she lost? Her husband or her father? Not her father, or she would have appeared more melancholy. What had they been saying? She was not a gay woman, then. She had a real husband. Unless, however, she should be in mourning for her mother. For a few minutes, notwithstanding the press of business, the department exchanged these various speculations. "'Make haste! It's intolerable!' cried Vittar to Favier, who had just returned from showing his customer to the pay-desk. "'When that lady is here, you never seem to finish. She doesn't care a fig for you.' "'She cares a deuced sight more for me than I do for her,' replied the vexed salesman. But Vittar threatened to report him to the directors if he did not show more respect for the customers. He was getting terrible, of a morose severity, since the department had conspired together to get him in Robinot's place. He even showed himself so intolerable, after the promises of good fellowship with which he had formerly warmed his colleagues, that the latter were now secretly supporting Favier against him. "'Now then, no back answers,' replied Hutin sharply. "'Monsieur Bottemont wishes you to show some light designs in silks.' In the middle of the department, an exhibition of summer silks lighted up the hall with an aura-like brilliancy, like the rising of a star, in the most delicate tints possible." pale rose, tender yellow, limpid blue, the entire gamut of iris. There were silks of a cloudy fineness, suras lighter than the down falling from the trees, satin pekins soft and supple as a Chinese virgin's skin. There were, moreover, Japanese pongees, Indian tesaurus, and koras, without counting the light French silks, the thousand stripes, the small checks, 
the flowered patterns, all the most fanciful designs, which made one think of ladies in furbelows, walking about in the sweet May mornings, under the immense trees of some park. "'I'll take this, the Louis Fourteenth, with figured roses,' said Madame de Fauche at last. And whilst Favier was measuring it, she made a last attempt with Boutemont, who had remained near her. "'I am going to the ready-made department to see if there are any travelling cloaks.' "'Is she fair, the young lady you were talking about?' The manager, who felt rather anxious on finding her so persistent, merely smiled. But, just at that moment, Denise went by. She had just passed on to Leonard, who had charge of the merinos, Madame Boutarel, the provincial lady who came up to Paris twice a year, to scatter all over the lady's paradise the money she scraped together out of her housekeeping. And as Favier was about to take up Madame de Fauche's silk, Boutard, thinking to annoy him, interfered. "'It is quite unnecessary. Mademoiselle Denise will have the kindness to conduct this lady.' Denise, quite confused, at once took charge of the parcel and the debit note. She could never meet this young man face to face without experiencing a feeling of shame, as if he reminded her of a former fault. And yet she had only sinned in her dreams. "'But tell me,' said Madame de Fauche in a low tone to Boutemont, "'isn't it this awkward girl?' He has taken her back, then. But it is she, the heroine of the adventure. Perhaps, replied the head of the department, still smiling and fully decided not to tell the truth. Madame de Fauche then slowly ascended the staircase, preceded by Denise, but she had to stop every two or three steps to avoid being carried away by the descending crowd. In the living vibration of the whole building, the iron supports seemed to stagger beneath the weight, as if continually trembling from the breath of the crowd. On each stair was a dummy, strongly fixed, displaying its own garment, a costume, cloak, or dressing-gown, and it was like a double row of soldiers for some triumphant march past, with the little wooden arm like the handle of a poniard, stuck into the red swan skin, which gave a bloody appearance to the stump of a neck crowning the whole. Madame de Fauche was at last reaching the first story, when a still greater surging of the crowd forced her to stop once more. She had now, beneath her, the departments on the ground floor, with the press of customers she had just passed through. It was a new spectacle, a sea of heads foreshortened, concealing the bodices, swarming with a busy agitation. The white price tickets now appeared, but so many thin lines. The promontory of flannels cut through the gallery like a narrow wall, whilst the carpets and the embroidered silks which decked the balustrades hung at her feet, like processional banners suspended from the gallery of a church. In the distance she could perceive the angles of the lateral galleries, as from the top of a steeple one perceives the corners of the neighbouring streets, with the black spots of the passers-by moving about. But what surprised her above all, in the fatigue of her eyes blinded by the brilliant pell-mell of colours, was, when she lowered her lids, to feel the crowd more than ever, by its dull noise like the rising tide, and by the human warmth that it exhaled. A fine dust rose from the floor, laden with the odour of woman, the odour of her linen and her bust, of her skirts and her hair, an invading, penetrating odour, which seemed to be the incense of this temple raised for the worship of her body. Meanwhile, Moret, still standing up before the reading-room with de Valangeosk, was inhaling this odour, intoxicating himself with it, and repeating, "'They are quite at home. I know some who spend the whole day here, eating cakes and writing their letters.' There's only one thing more to do, and that is, to find them beds. This joke made Paul smile. He who, in the ennui of his pessimism, continued to think the crowd stupid, and thus running after a lot of gewgaws. Whenever he came to give his old comrade a look-up, he went away almost vexed to see him so full of life amidst his people of coquettes. Would not one of them, with shallow brain and empty heart, teach him one day the stupidity and uselessness of existence? That very day, Octave seemed to lose some of his admirable equilibrium. He who generally inspired his customers with a fever, with the tranquil grace of an operator, was as though seized by the passion with which the establishment was gradually burning. Since he had caught sight of Denise and Madame de Fauche coming up the grand staircase, he had been talking louder, gesticulating against his will, and, whilst affecting not to turn his face towards them, he became more and more animated as he felt them drawing nearer. His face got redder, his eyes had a little of that rapture with which the eyes of his customers ultimately vacillated. "'You must be robbed fearfully,' 
murmured de Valanchosque, who thought the crowd looked very criminal. Moret threw his arms out. My dear fellow, it's beyond all imagination. And, nervously, delighted at having something to talk about, he gave a number of details, related cases, and classified the subjects. In the first place, there were the professional thieves. These women did the least harm of all, for the police knew every one of them. Then came the kleptomaniacs, who stole from a perverse desire, a new sort of nervous affection which a mad doctor had classed, proving the results of the temptation provided by the big shops. In the last place must be counted the women in an interesting condition, whose robberies were of a special order. For instance, at the house of one of them, the superintendent of police had found two hundred and forty-eight pairs of pink gloves, stolen from every shop in Paris. And that's what makes the women have such funny eyes here, then, murmured the Valanchosque. I've been watching them with their greedy, shameful looks, like mad creatures. A fine school for honesty. Hang it, replied Moret. Though you make them quite at home, we can't let them take away the goods under their mantles. And sometimes they are very respectable people. Last week we had the sister of a chemist, and the wife of a counsellor. We try and settle these matters. He stopped to point out Jove, the inspector, who was just then looking sharp after a woman in the family way, down below at the ribbon counter. This woman, whose enormous belly suffered a great deal from the pushing of the crowd, was accompanied by a friend, whose mission appeared to be to defend her against the heavy shocks, and each time she stopped in a department, Jove did not take his eyes off her, whilst a friend near her ransacked the cardboard boxes at her ease. "'Oh, he'll catch her,' resumed Moret. "'He knows all their tricks.' But his voice trembled. He laughed in an awkward manner. Denise and Andriette, whom he had ceased to watch, were at last passing behind him, after having a great deal of trouble to get out of the crowd. He turned round suddenly, and bowed to his customer with the discreet air of a friend who does not wish to compromise a woman by stopping her in the middle of a crowd of people. But the latter, on alert, had at once perceived the look with which he had first enveloped Denise. It must be this girl. This was the rival she had had the curiosity to come and see. In the ready-made department, the young ladies were losing their heads. Two of them had fallen ill, and Madame Frédéric, the second-hand, had quietly given notice the previous day, and gone to the cashier's office to take her money, leaving the ladies' paradise all in a minute, as the ladies' paradise itself discharged its employees. Ever since the morning, in spite of the feverish rush of business, everyone had been talking of this adventure. Clara, maintained in the department by Moray's caprice, thought it grand. Marguerite related how exasperated Bourdoncle was, whilst Madame Moralie, greatly vexed, declared that Madame Frédéric ought at least to have informed her, for such hypocrisy had never before been heard of. Although the latter had never confided in any one, she was suspected of giving up the drapery business to marry the proprietor of some baths in the neighbourhood of the Hallais. "'It's a travelling cloak that Madame decides, I believe?' asked the niece of Madame de Fauche, after having offered her a chair. "'Yes,' replied the latter, curtly, decided on being rude. The new decorations of the department were of a rich severity. High carved oak, cupboards, mirrors filling the whole space of the panels, and a red Wilton carpet, which stifled the continued movement of the customers. Whilst Denise was gone for the cloaks, Madame de Fauche, who was looking round, perceived herself in a glass, and she continued contemplating herself. She must be getting old to be cast aside for the first comer, the glass reflected the entire department with its commotion, but she only beheld her own pale face. She did not hear Clara behind her relating to Marguerite instances of Madame Frédéric's mysterious ways, the manner in which she went out of her way night and morning to go through the passage chaussel in order to make believe that she perhaps lived over the water. "'Here are our latest designs,' said the niece. "'We have them in several colours. She laid out four or five cloaks. Madame de Fauche looked at them with a scornful air, and became harsher at each fresh one she examined. Why those frillings which made the garment look so scanty? And the other one, square across the shoulders, one would have thought it had been cut out with a hatchet. Though it was for travelling, she could not dress like a sentry-box. Show me something else, mademoiselle. The niece unfolded and folded the garments without the slightest sign of ill-temper and it was just this calm, serene patience which exasperated Madame de Fauche still further. Her looks continually returned to the glass in front of her. Now that she saw herself there, close to Denise, she made a comparison, 
was it possible that he should prefer this insignificant creature to herself? She now remembered that this was the girl she had formerly seen making her debut with such a silly figure, awkward as a peasant girl just arrived from her village. No doubt she looked better now, stiff and correct in her silk dress. But how puny, how commonplace! "'I will show you some other models, madam,' said her niece, quietly. End of chapter 9, part 2《セクション21オブ・ザ・レディス・パラダイス by エミル・ゾーラ》Translated by Ernest Alfred Vizzitelli This LibriVox recording is in the public domain Read by Christine G Chapter 9, Part 3 When she returned, the scene began again. Then it was the cloth that was heavy and no good whatever. Madame de Forge turned around, raised her voice, endeavouring to attract Madame Aurélie's attention in the hope of getting the young girl a scolding. But Denise, since her return, had gradually conquered the department, and now felt quite at home in it. The first hand had even recognised in her some rare and valuable qualities as a saleswoman, an obstinate sweetness, a smiling conviction. Therefore Madame Aurélie simply shrugged her shoulders, taking care not to interfere. "'Would you kindly tell me the kind of garment you require, madame?' asked Denise once more, with a polite persistence, which nothing could discourage. "'But you've got nothing!' exclaimed Madame de Fauche. She stopped, surprised to feel a hand on her shoulder. It was Madame Marty, carried right through the establishment by her fever for spending. Her purchases had increased to such an extent, since the cravats, the embroidered gloves, and the red parasol, that the last salesman had just decided to place the whole on a chair, for it would have broken his arm, and he walked in front of her, drawing the chair along, on which was heaped up a pile of petticoats, napkins, curtains, a lamp, and three straw hats. "'Ah!' said she, "'you're buying a travelling cloak.' "'Oh, dear, no,' replied Madame de Fauche. "'They are frightful.' But Madame Marty had just noticed a striped cloak which she rather liked. Her daughter Valentine was already examining it. So Denise called Marguerite to clear the article out of the department, it being a model of the previous year, and the latter, at a glance from her comrade, presenting it as an exceptional bargain. When she had sworn that they had lowered the price twice, that from a hundred and fifty francs they had reduced it to a hundred and thirty, and that it was now at a hundred and ten, Madame Marty could not withstand the temptation of its cheapness. She bought it, and the salesman who accompanied her left the chair and the parcel, with the debit notes attached to the goods. Meanwhile, behind the ladies' backs, and amidst the jostling of the sale, the gossip of the department about Madame Frédéric still went on. Really? She had someone? asked the little saleswoman fresh in the department. The bath man, of course, replied Clara. Mustn't trust those sly, quiet widows. Then, whilst Marguerite was debiting the cloak, Madame Marty turned her head, and designating Clara by a slight movement of the eyebrows, she whispered to Madame de Fauche, Monsieur Moray's caprice, you know. The other, surprised, looked at Clara, then, turning her eyes towards Denise, replied, But it isn't a tall one, the little one and as Madame Marty could not be sure which, Madame de Forge resumed aloud, with the scorn of a lady for chambermaids. Perhaps the tall one and the little one, or those who like. Denise had heard everything. She turned pale, and raised her big pure eyes on this lady who was thus wounding her, and whom she did not know. No doubt it was the lady of whom they had spoken to her, the lady whom the governor saw outside. In the look that was exchanged between them, Denise displayed such a melancholy dignity, such a frank innocence, that Henriette felt quite awkward. "'As you have nothing presentable to show me here, conduct me to the dress and costume department,' said she abruptly. "'I'll go with you as well,' exclaimed Madame Marty. "'I wanted to see a costume for Valentine.' Marguerite took the chair by its back, and dragged it along on its hind feet, that were getting worn by this species of cartridge. Denise only carried a few yards of silk, bought by Madame de Forge. It was quite a journey, now that the robes and costumes were on the second floor, at the other end of the establishment. And the long journey commenced along the crowded galleries. Marguerite walked in front, drawing the chair along, like a little carriage, slowly opening herself a passage. 
As soon as she reached the underlinen department, Madame Desforges began to complain. Wasn't it ridiculous, a shop where one was obliged to walk a couple of leagues to find the least thing? Madame Marty also said she was tired to death, yet she did not the less enjoy this fatigue, this slow exhaustion of her strength, amidst the inexhaustible treasures displayed on every side. Moret's idea, full of genius, seized upon her, stopped her at each department. She made a first halt before the trousseaux, tempted by some chemises that Pauline sold her, and Marguerite found herself relieved from the burden of the chair, which Pauline had to take, with the debit notes. Madame de Fourche could have gone on her road, and thus have liberated Denise quicker, but she seemed happy to feel her behind her, motionless and patient, whilst she was lingering there, advising her friend. In the baby linen department the ladies went into ecstasies, without buying anything. Then Madame Marty's weakness commenced anew. She succumbed successively before a black silk corset, a pair of fur cuffs, sold at a reduction on account of the lateness of the season, and some Russian lace much in vogue at that time for trimming table linen. All these things were heaped up on the chair, the parcels still increased, making the chair creak, and the salesmen who succeeded each other found it more and more difficult to drag along as the load became heavier. "'This way, madame,' said the niece without a murmur, after each halt. "'But it's absurd!' exclaimed Madame de Fourche. "'We shall never get there. Why not have put addresses and costumes near the ready-made department? It is a jumble!' Madame Marty, whose eyes were sparkling, intoxicated by this succession of riches dancing before her, repeated in a half-whisper, "'Oh, dear, what will my husband say? You are right. There is no order in this place. You lose yourself and commit all sorts of follies.' On the great central landing, the chair could barely pass. Moret had just blocked the space with a lot of fancy goods, drinking cups mounted on gilded zinc, trashy dressing cases, and liquor stands, being of an opinion that the crowd was not sufficiently great, and that the circulation was too easy. He had authorized one of his shopmen to exhibit there on the small table Chinese and Japanese curiosities, knick-knacks at a low price, which the customers eagerly snatched up. It was an unexpected success, and he already thought of extending this business. Whilst two messengers carried the chair up to the second story, Madame Marty bought six ivory studs, some silk mice, and an enamelled matchbox. On the second floor the journey was continued. Denise, who had been showing customers about in this way since the morning, was dropping with fatigue, but she still continued correct, amiable, and polite. She had to wait for the ladies again in the furnishing materials department, where the ravishing Creton had tempted Madame Marty. Then, in the furniture department, it was a work-table that took her fancy. Her hands trembled. She jokingly entreated Madame de Fourche to prevent her spending any more, when a meeting with Madame Guibal furnished her with an excuse. It was in the carpet department, where the latter had gone to return a lot of oriental door curtains, bought by her five days before and she was standing, talking to the salesman, a brawny fellow, who, with his sinewy arms handled from morning to night, loads heavy enough to kill a bullock. Naturally, he was quite astounded at this return, which deprived him of his commission. He did his best to embarrass his customer, suspecting some queer adventure, no doubt a ball given with these curtains, bought at the ladies' paradise, and then returned, to avoid hiring at an upholster's. He knew this was frequently done by the needy portion of society. In short, she must have some reason for returning them. If she did not like the designs or the colours, he would show her others. He had a most complete assortment. To all these insinuations, Madame Guibal replied, in the quietest, most unconcerned manner possible, with the queenly assurance that the curtains did not suit her, without deigning to add any explanation. She refused to look at any others, and he was obliged to give away for the salesmen had orders to take back the goods, even if they saw they had been used. As the three ladies went off together, and Madame Marty referred with remorse to the work-table for which she had no earthly need, Madame Guibal said in her calm voice, "'Well, you can return it. You saw it was quite easy. Let him send it home. You can put it in your drawing-room, keep it for a time, and then if you don't like it, return it.' "'Ah, that's a good idea.' exclaimed madame marty if my husband makes too much fuss i'll send everything back this was for her the supreme excuse she calculated no longer but went on buying with the secret wish to keep everything for she was not a woman to give anything back at last they arrived in the dress and costume department 
but as Denise was about to deliver to another young lady the silk bought by Madame de Fourche, the latter seemed to change her mind, and declared she would decidedly take one of the travelling cloaks, the light grey one with the hood, and Denise had to wait complacently to bring her back to the ready-made apartment. The young girl felt herself being treated like a servant by this imperious, whimsical customer, but she had sworn to herself to do her duty, and retained her calm attitude, notwithstanding the rising of her heart and the shock to her pride. Madame de Fourche bought nothing in the dress and costume department. "'Oh, mamma," said Valentine, "'if that little costume should fit me!' In a low tone, Madame Guibal was explaining her tactics to Madame Marty. When she saw a dress she liked in a shop, she had it sent home, took the pattern of it, and then sent it back. And Madame Marty bought a costume for her daughter, remarking, "'A good idea! You are very practical, my dear madam!' They had been obliged to abandon the chair. It had been left in distress, in the furniture department, with a work-table. The weight was too much, the hind legs threatened to break off, and it was arranged that all the purchases should be centralised at the one pay-desk, and from there sent down to the delivery department. The ladies, still accompanied by Denise, then began wandering all about the establishment, making a second appearance in nearly every department. They seemed to take up all the space on the stairs and in the galleries. Every moment some fresh meeting brought them to a standstill. Thus, near the reading-room, they once more came across Madame Bourdelais and her three children. The youngsters were loaded with parcels. Madeleine had a dress for herself, Edmond was carrying a collection of little shoes, whilst the youngest, Lucien, was wearing a new cap. "'You as well,' said Madame de Fourche, laughingly, to her old schoolfellow. "'Pray, don't speak of it.' cried out Madame Bordelais. I'm furious. They get hold of us by the little ones now. You know what a little I spend on myself. But how can you expect me to resist the voices of these young children who want everything? I'd come just to show them round, and here I am plundering the whole establishment. Moret, who happened to be there still, with the Valenchosque and Monsieur de Bove, was listening to her with a smile. She observed it, and gaily complained with a certain amount of real irritation, of these traps laid for a mother's tenderness. The idea that she just yielded to the fevers of advertising raised her indignation, and he, still smiling, bowed, fully enjoying this triumph. Monsieur de Boves had manoeuvred so as to get near Madame Guibal, whom he ultimately followed, trying for the second time to lose the Valenchosque, but the latter, tired of the crash, hastened to rejoin him. Denise was again brought to a standstill, obliged to wait for the ladies. She turned her back, and Moret himself affected not to see her. Madame de Fourche, with the delicate scent of a jealous woman, had no further doubt. Whilst he was complimenting her and walking beside her like a gallant host, she was deep in thought, asking herself how she could convince him of this treason. Meanwhile, Monsieur de Bove and de Valenchosque, who went on in front with Madame Guibal, had reached the lace department, a luxurious room, near the ready-made department, surrounded with stocks of carved oak drawers, which were constantly being opened and shut. Around the columns, covered with red velvet, were spirals of white lace, and from one end of the department to the other hung lengths of Maltese, whilst on the counters there were quantities of large cards, wound round with Valenciennes, Malines, and handmade point. At the further end two ladies were seated before a mauve silk skirt, on which Deloche was placing pieces of Chantilly, the ladies looking on silently, without making up their minds. Hello, said the Valenchosque, quite surprised. "'You said Madame de Boeuf was unwell. "'But there she is, standing over there near that counter, with Mademoiselle Blanche.' The Count could not help staring back, and casting a side-glance at Madame Guibal. "'Dear me, so she is,' said he. It was very warm in this room. The customers, half-stifled, had pale faces with flaming eyes. It seemed as if all the seductions of the shop had converged into this supreme temptation, that it was the secluded alcove where the customers were doomed to fall, the corner of perdition where the strongest must succumb. Hands were plunged into the overflowing heaps, retaining an intoxicating trembling from the contact. "'I fancy those ladies are ruining you,' resumed the Valenchosque, amused at the meeting. Monsieur de Bove assumed the look of a husband perfectly sure of his wife's discretion, from the simple fact that he did not give her a sou to spend. The latter, after having wandered through all the departments with her daughter, without buying anything, had just stranded in the lace department, in a rage of unsated desire. 
half dead with fatigue, she was leaning up against the counter. She dived about in a heap of lace, her hands became soft, a warmth penetrated as far as her shoulders. Then, suddenly, just as her daughter turned her head and the salesman went away, she was thinking of slipping a piece of Pointe d'Alezon under her mantle. But she shuddered and dropped it, on hearing de Valanchosque's voice, saying gaily, "'Ah, we've caught you, madam!' For several seconds she stood there speechless and pale. Then she explained that, feeling much better, she thought she would take a stroll, and on noticing that her husband was with Madame Gibal, she quite recovered herself, and looked at them with such a dignified air that the other lady felt obliged to say, "'I was with Madame de Fauche when these gentlemen met us.' The other ladies came up just at that moment, accompanied by Moret, who again detained them to point out Jove the inspector, who was still following the woman in the family way and her lady friend. It was very curious, they could not form any idea of the number of thieves that were arrested in the lace department. Madame de Bove, who was listening, fancied herself between two gendarmes, with her forty-six years, her luxury, and her husband's fine position. But yet she felt no remorse, thinking she ought to have slipped the lace up her sleeve. Jove, however, had just decided to lay hold of the woman in the family way, despairing of catching her in the act, but fully suspecting her of having filled her pockets with a sleight of hand which had escaped him. But when he had taken her aside and searched her, he was wild to find nothing on her. Not a cravat, not a button. Her friend had disappeared. All at once he understood. The woman in the family way was only there as a blind. It was the friend who did the trick. The affair amused the ladies. Moret, rather vexed, merely said, "'Old Jove has been flawed this time. He'll have his revenge.' "'Oh,' replied de Valanchosque, "'I don't think he's equal to it. Besides, won't you display such a quantity of goods? It serves you right, if you are robbed. You ought not to tempt these poor, defenceless women so.' This was the last word, which sounded like the sharp note of the day, in the growing fever of the establishment. The ladies then separated— crossing the crowded departments for the last time. It was four o'clock. The rays of the setting sun were darting through the large windows in the front, lighting up crossways the glazed roofs of the halls. And in this red, fiery light sprung up, like a golden vapour, the thick dust raised by the circulation of the crowd. A broad ray ran along the grand central gallery, showing up on flaming ground the staircases, the flying bridges, all the network of suspended iron. The mosaic and the terracotta of the friezes sparkled. The green and red paint were lighted up by the fire of the masses of gold scattered everywhere. It was like a red-hot furnace, in which the displays were now burning. The palaces of gloves and cravats, the clusters of ribbons and lace, the lofty piles of linen and calico, the diapered pateras in which flourished the light silks and foliards. The exhibition of parasols, with their shield-like roundness, threw out a sort of metallic reflection. In the distance were a lot of lost counters, sparkling, swarming with a moving crowd, ablaze with sunshine. And at this last moment, amidst this overwarmed air, the women reigned supreme. They had taken the whole place by storm, camping there as in a conquered country, like an invading horde installed amongst the overhauling of the goods. The salesmen, deafened, knocked up, were now nothing but their slaves, of whom they disposed with a sovereign's tyranny. Fat women elbowed their way through the crowd. The thinnest ones took up a lot of space, and became quite arrogant. They were all there, with heads high and abrupt gestures, quite at home, without the slightest politeness, one for the other, using the house as much as they could, even carrying away the dust from the walls. Madame Bordelais, desirous of making up for her expenditure, had again taken her children to the refreshment bar. The crowd was now pushing against there in a furious way. Even the mothers were gorging themselves with Malaga. They had drunk since the opening eighty quarts of syrup and seventy bottles of wine. After having bought her travelling cloak, Madame de Fauche had managed to secure some pictures at the pay desk, and she went away scheming to get Denise into her house, where she could humiliate her before Moret himself so as to see their faces and arrive at a conclusion. Whilst Monsieur de Boves succeeded in losing himself in the crowd and disappearing with Madame Gibal, Madame de Boves, followed by Blanche and de Valanchosque, had had the fancy to ask for a red air ball, although she had bought nothing. It was always something. She would not go away empty-handed. She would make a friend of her doorkeeper's little girl with it. At the distributing counter, they were just commencing the fortieth thousand, 
forty thousand red air-balls which had taken flight in the warm air of the shop quite a cloud of red air-balls which were now floating from one end of paris to the other bearing upwards to the sky the name of the ladies paradise five o'clock struck of all the ladies madame marty and her daughter were the only ones to remain in the final crisis of the sale she could not tear herself away although ready to drop with fatigue retained by an attraction so strong that she was continually retracting her steps though wanting nothing wandering about the departments out of a curiosity that knew no bounds it was the moment in which the crowd goaded on by the advertisements completely lost itself the sixty thousand francs paid to the newspapers the ten thousand bills posted on the walls the two hundred thousand catalogues distributed all over the world after having emptied their purses left in the women's minds the shock of their intoxication and the customers still remained shaken by moret's other inventions the reduction of prices the returns the endless gallantries madame marty lingered before the various stalls amidst the hoarse cries of the salesmen the chinking of the gold at the pay desks and the rolling of the parcels down into the basement she again traversed the ground floor the linen the silk the glove and the woollen departments then she went upstairs again abandoning herself to the metallic vibrations of the suspended staircases and the flying bridges returning to the ready-made the underlinen and the lace departments she even ascended to the second floor into the heights of the bedding and furniture department and everywhere the employees hutard and favier mignon and leonard deloche pauline and denise nearly dead with fatigue were making a last effort snatching victories from the expiring fever of the customers this fever had gradually increased since the morning like the intoxication arising from the tumbling of the stuffs the crowd shone forth under the fiery glare of the five o'clock sun madame marty's face was now animated and nervous like that of an infant after drinking pure wine arrived with clear eyes and fresh skin from the cold of the street she had slowly burned her sight and complexion at the spectacle of this luxury of these violent colours the continued gallop of which irritated her passion when she at last went away after saying she would pay at home terrified by the amount of her bill her features were drawn up her eyes were like those of a sick person she was obliged to fight her way through the crowd at the door where the people were almost killing each other amidst the struggle for the bargains then when she got into the street and found her daughter whom she had lost for a moment the fresh air made her shiver she stood there frightened in the disorder of this neurosis of the immense establishment in the evening as denise was returning from dinner a messenger called her you are wanted at the director's office mademoiselle she had forgotten the order moret had given her in the morning to go to his office after the sale he was standing waiting for her on going in she did not close the door which remained wide open we are very pleased with you mademoiselle said he and we have thought of proving our satisfaction you know in what a shameful manner madame frederic has left us from to-morrow you will take her place a second hand denise listened to him immovable with surprise she murmured in a trembling voice but sir there are saleswomen in the department who are much my seniors what does that matter resumed he you are the most capable the most trustworthy i choose you it's quite natural are you not satisfied she blushed feeling a delicious happiness and embarrassment in which her first fright vanished why had she at once thought of the suppositions with which this unhoped-for favour would be received and she stood filled with her confusion notwithstanding her sudden burst of gratitude he was looking at her with a smile in her simple silk dress without a single piece of jewellery nothing but the luxury of her royal blonde head of hair she had become more refined her skin was whiter her manner delicate and grave her former puny insignificance was developing into a charm of a penetrating discretion you are very kind sir she stammered i don't know how to tell you but she was cut short by the appearance of l'homme in the doorway in his hand he was holding a large leather bag and with his mutilated arm he was pressing an enormous note-case to his chest whilst behind him his son albert was carrying a load of bags which were weighing him down five hundred and eighty-seven thousand two hundred and ten francs thirty centimes cried out the cashier whose flabby used-up face seemed to be lighted up with a ray of sunshine in the reflection of such a sum it was the day's receipts the highest the ladies paradise had ever done 
in the distance, in the depth of the shop that Lom had just passed through slowly, with the heavy gait of an overloaded beast of burden, one could hear the uproar, the ripple of surprise and joy, left by this colossal sum which passed. "'But it's superb!' said Moray, enchanted. "'My good Lom, put it down there and take a rest, for you look quite done up. I'll have this money taken to the central cashier's office. Yes, yes, put it all on my table. I want to see the heap.' He was full of childish gaiety. The cashier and his son lay down their burdens. The leather bag gave out a clear golden ring, two of the other bags bursting let out a stream of silver and copper, whilst from the note-case peeped forth corners of banknotes. One end of the large table was entirely covered. It was like the tumbling of a fortune picked up in ten hours. When Lom and Albert had retired, mopping their faces, Moret remained for a moment motionless, lost, his eyes fixed on the money. Then, raising his head, he perceived Denise, who had drawn back. He began to smile again, forced her to come forward, and finished by saying he would give her all she could take in her hand, and there was a sort of love bargain beneath his playfulness. "'Look, out of the bag! I bet it would be less than a thousand francs. Your hand is so small.' But she drew back again. He loved her, then. Suddenly she understood. She felt a growing flame of desire with which he had enveloped her since her return to the shop. What overcame her more than anything else was to feel her heart beating violently. Why did he wound her with all his money, when she was overflowing with gratitude, and he could have done anything with her by a friendly word? He was coming closer to her, continuing to joke, when, to his great annoyance, Bordoncle appeared, under the pretense of informing him of the number of entries. The enormous number of seventy thousand customers had entered the ladies' paradise that day and she hastened away after having again thanked him. End of chapter 9 Part 3 Section 22 of The Ladies' Paradise by Emile Zola Translated by Ernest Alfred Visitelli This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Christian G. Chapter 10 Part 1 on the first Sunday in August, the stock-taking, which had to be finished by the evening, took place. Early in the morning all the employees were at their posts, as on a weekday, and the work began with closed doors. Not a customer was admitted. Denise, however, had not come down with the other young ladies at eight o'clock. Confined to her room since the previous Thursday through having sprained her ankle whilst on her way up to the workrooms, she was now much better. But, as Madame Aurélie treated her indulgently, she did not hurry down. Still, after a deal of trouble, she managed to put her boots on, having resolved that she would show herself in the department. The young ladies' bedrooms now occupied the entire fifth story of the new buildings in the Rue Monsigny. There were sixty of them, on either side of a corridor, and they were much more comfortable than formerly, although still furnished simply with an iron bedstead, large wardrobe, and little mahogany toilet table. The private life of the saleswomen was now becoming more refined and elegant. They displayed a taste for scented soap and fine linen, quite a natural ascent towards middle-class ways as their positions improved, although high words and banging doors were still sometimes heard amidst a hotel-like gust that carried them away morning and evening. Denise, being second-hand in her department, had one of the largest rooms with two attic windows looking into the street. Being now in much better circumstances, she indulged in sundry little luxuries, a red eider-down bed-quilt, covered in guipio, a small carpet in front of her wardrobe, a couple of blue glass vases containing a few fading roses on her toilet-table. When she had succeeded in getting her boots on, she tried to walk across the room, but was obliged to lean against the furniture, being still rather lame. However, that would soon come right again, she thought. At the same time, she had been quite right in refusing an invitation to dine at Uncle Baudou's that evening, and in asking her aunt to take Pepe out for a walk, for she had placed him with Madame Gras again. Sean, who had been to see her on the previous day, was also to dine at his uncle's. She was still slowly trying to walk, resolving, however, to go to bed early in order to rest her ankle, when Madame Cabine, the housekeeper, 
knocked and gave her a letter, with an air of mystery. The door closed. Denise, astonished by the woman's discreet smile, opened the letter, and at once she dropped on a chair. For it was a letter from Moray, in which he expressed himself delighted at her recovery, and begged her to come down and dine with him that evening, since she could not go out. The tone of this note, at once familiar and paternal, was in no way offensive, but it was impossible for her to mistake its meaning. And thus her white cheeks slowly coloured with a flush. With the letter lying on her lap and her heart beating violently, she remained with her eyes fixed on the blinding light which came in by one of the windows. There was a confession which she had been obliged to make to herself in this very room during her sleepless hours. If she still trembled when he passed, she now knew that it was not from fear, and her former uneasiness, her old terror, could have been only the frightened ignorance of love, the perturbation of passion springing up amidst her youthful wildness. She did not reason, she simply felt that she had always loved him, from the hour when she had shuddered and stammered before him. She had loved him when she had feared him as a pitiless master. She had loved him when her distracted heart was dreaming of Houtin, unconsciously yielding to a desire for affection. Yes, she had never loved any but this man, whose mere look terrified her, and all her past life came back to her, unfolding itself in the blinding light from the window. The hardships of her start that sweet walk under the dark foliage of the Tuileries gardens, and, lastly, the desires with which he had enveloped her ever since her return. The letter dropped on the floor, and Denise was still gazing at the window, dazzled by the glare of the sun. Suddenly there was a knock, and she hastened to pick up the missive and conceal it in her pocket. It was Pauline, who, having slipped away from her department under some pretext or other, had come up for a little chat. "'How are you, my dear? We never meet now.' As it was against the rules, however, to go up into the bedrooms, and, above all, for two of the saleswomen to be shut in together, Denise took her friend to the end of the passage, to a saloon which Moray had gallantly fitted up for the young ladies, who could spend their evenings there, chatting or sewing, till eleven o'clock. The apartment, decorated in white and gold, with the vulgar nudity of an hotel room, was furnished with a piano, a central table, and some armchairs and sofas protected by white covers. After spending a few evenings together there in the first novelty of the thing, the saleswomen now never entered the place without coming to higher words at once. They required educating to it. So far their little circle lacked harmony. Meanwhile, almost the only girl that went there in the evening was the second hand of the corset department, Miss Powell, who strummed away at Chopin on the piano, and whose envied talents were for much in driving the others away. "'You see my ankles better now,' said Denise. "'I was just going down.' "'Well!' exclaimed the other. "'How zealous you are! "'I'd take it easy if I had the chance.' They had both sat down on a sofa. Pauline's manner had changed since her friend had become second-hand in the mantle department. With her good-natured cordiality there mingled a touch of respect, a sort of surprise at realising that the puny little saleswoman of former days was on the road to fortune. Denise, however, liked her very much, and amidst the continual gallop of the two hundred women that the firm now employed, confided in her alone. "'What's the matter?' asked Pauline, quickly, when she remarked her companion's troubled looks. "'Oh, nothing,' replied Denise, with an awkward smile. "'Yes, yes, there's something the matter with you. Have you no faith in me, that you have given up telling me your worries?' Thereupon Denise, in the emotion that was swelling her bosom, an emotion she could not control, abandoned herself to her feelings. She gave her friend the letter, stammering. "'Look, he has just written to me.' Between themselves they had never openly spoken of Moray. But this very silence was like a confession of their secret thoughts. Pauline knew everything." After having read the letter, she clasped Denise in her arms, and softly murmured, "'My dear, to speak frankly, 
i thought it had all happened long ago don't be shocked i assure you the whole shop must think as i do you see he appointed you a second hand so quickly and that is always looking at you it's obvious she kissed her affectionately on the cheek and then asked her you will go this evening of course denise looked at her without replying and all at once burst into tears letting her head fall on pauline's shoulder the latter was quite astonished come try and calm yourself there's nothing to upset you like this she said no no let me be stammered denise if you only knew what trouble i am in since i received that letter i have felt beside myself let me have a good cry that will relieve me full of pity though not understanding pauline endeavoured to console her declaring that she must not worry for it was quite certain that monsieur moret had ceased to pay any attention to clara whilst as for that other lady friend of his madame de forges it was probably all but so much gossip denise listened and had she been ignorant of her love she could no longer have doubted it after the suffering she felt at the allusions to those two women she could again hear clara's disagreeable voice and see madame de forges dragging her about the different apartments with all the scorn of a rich lady for a poor shop-girl then the two friends went on conversing and at last denise in a sudden impulse exclaimed but when a man loves a girl he ought to marry her borge is going to marry you this was true borge who had left the bon marche for the ladies paradise was going to marry her about the middle of the month bourdoncle did not like these married couples however they had managed to get the necessary permission and even hoped to obtain a fortnight's holiday for their honeymoon on hearing denise's remark pauline laughed heartily <laughs> but my dear said she borsch is going to marry me because he is borsch he is my equal that's natural whereas monsieur moret do you think that monsieur moret would marry one of his saleswomen oh no oh no exclaimed denise shocked by the absurdity of the question and that's why he ought never to have written to me this argument seemed to astonish pauline her coarse face with small tender eyes assumed quite an expression of maternal pity then she got up opened the piano and with one finger softly played the air of king dagobert doubtless to enliven the situation the noises of the street the distant melopoeia of a woman crying out green peas ascended to the bare saloon whose emptiness seemed increased by the white coverings of the furniture denise had thrown herself back on the sofa her head against the woodwork and shaken by a fresh flood of sobs which she stifled in her handkerchief again resumed pauline turning round really you are not reasonable why did you bring me here we ought to have stopped in your room she knelt down before her and had begun lecturing her again when a sound of footsteps was heard in the passage and thereupon she ran to the door and looked out hush madame Aurélie, she murmured i'm off and just you dry your eyes she need not know what's up when denise was alone she rose and forced back her tears and her hands still trembling fearful of being caught there weeping she closed the piano which her friend had left open however on hearing madame Aurélie knocking at her door she had once left the drawing-room what you are up exclaimed the first hand it's very thoughtless of you my dear child i just came to see how you were and to tell you that we did not require you downstairs denise assured her however that she felt much better and that it would do her good to have some occupation i shan't tire myself madam you can put me on a chair and i'll do some writing both then went downstairs madame Aurélie, most attentive insisted on denise leaning on her shoulder she must have noticed the young girl's red eyes for she was stealthily examining her no doubt she was aware of much that was going on denise had gained an unexpected victory she had at last conquered the department formerly she had struggled on for six months amidst all the torments of drudgery without disarming her comrades ill-will 
but now in a few weeks she had overcome them and saw them submissive and respectful around her madame oralie's sudden affection had greatly assisted her in this ungrateful task of propitiating her companions indeed the first hand had taken the young girl under her protection with such warmth that the latter must have been recommended to her in a very special manner however denise had also brought her own charm into play in order to disarm her enemies the task was all the more difficult from the fact that she had to obtain their forgiveness for her appointment to the situation of second hand the other young ladies spoke of this at first as an injustice and even added a lot of abominable accusations but in spite of their revolt the title of second hand influenced them and denise with her promotion assumed a certain air of authority which astonished and overawed even the most hostile spirits soon afterwards she actually found flatterers among the new hands and her sweetness and modesty completed the conquest marguerite came over to her side and clara was the only one to continue her ill-natured ways still venturing to allude to denise as the unkempt one an insult in which nobody now saw any fun during the short time that she had engaged moret's attention clara had profited by the caprice to neglect her work being of a wonderfully idle gossiping nature unfitted for any responsible duty nevertheless she considered that denise had robbed her of madame frederic's place she would never have accepted it on account of the worry but she was vexed that no attention had been paid to her claims nine o'clock struck as denise came down leaning on madame oralie's arm out of doors an ardent blue sky was warming the streets cabs were rolling towards the railway station the whole population of paris rigged out in sunday attire was streaming towards the suburban woods inside the paradise which the large open base flooded with sunshine the imprisoned staff had just commenced stock-taking they had closed the doors and people halted on the pavement looking through the windows in astonishment that the shop should be shut when such extraordinary activity prevailed inside from one end of the galleries to the other from the top to the bottom floor there was a continual tramping of employees arms were ever being raised and parcels were flying about above their heads and all this amidst a tempest of shouts and calling out of figures ascending in confusion and becoming a deafening roar each of the thirty-nine departments did its work apart without troubling about its neighbour at this early hour the shelves had hardly been touched there were only a few bales of goods on the floors they must get up a good deal more steam if they were to finish that evening why have you come down asked marguerite of denise good-naturedly you'll only make yourself worse and we are quite numerous enough to do the work that's what i told her declared madame oralie but she insisted on coming down to help us all the young ladies flocked round denise the work was even interrupted for a time they complimented her listening with all sorts of exclamations to the story of her sprained ankle at last madame oralie made her sit down at a table and it was understood that she should merely write down the articles as they were called out on such a day as this they requisitioned all the employees who were capable of holding a pen the inspectors the cashiers the clerks even the shop messengers and each department annexed some of these assistants of a day in order to get the work over more quickly it was thus that denise found herself installed near l'homme the cashier and joseph the messenger both of whom were bending over large sheets of papers five mantles cloth fur trimming third size at two hundred and forty francs called marguerite four ditto first size at two hundred and twenty the work once more commenced behind marguerite three saleswomen were emptying the cupboards classifying the articles and giving them to her in bundles and when she had called them out she threw them on the table where they were gradually accumulating in huge piles l'homme jotted down the articles whilst joseph checked him by keeping another list whilst this was going on madame oralie herself assisted by three other saleswomen was counting out the silk garments which denise entered on the sheets of paper given to her 
Clara, on her side, was looking after the heaps, arranging them in such a manner that they should occupy the least possible space on the tables. But she was not paying much attention to her work, for many things were already tumbling down. "'I say,' she asked of a little saleswoman who had joined that winter, "'are they going to give you a rise? You know that the second hand is to have two thousand francs, which, with her commission, will bring her nearly seven thousand. The little saleswoman, without ceasing to pass some cloaks down, replied that if they didn't give her eight hundred francs, she would take her hook. The rises were always given on the day after the stock-taking. It was also then, as the amount of business done during the year became known, that the managers of the department drew their commission on the increase of this amount, as compared with that of the preceding year. Thus, despite the bustle and uproar of the work, the impassioned gossiping went on everywhere. Between every two articles that were called out, they talked of nothing but money. The rumour ran that Madame Aurélie's gains would exceed twenty-five thousand francs, and this huge sum greatly excited the young ladies. Marguerite, the best saleswoman after Denise, had for her part made four thousand five hundred francs, that is fifteen hundred francs salary, and about three thousand francs commission, whilst Clara had not made two thousand five hundred altogether. "'I don't care a button for their rices,' she resumed, still talking to the little saleswoman. "'If papa were dead, I would jolly soon clear out of this. Still, it exasperates me to see seven thousand francs given to that strip of a girl. What do you say?' Madame Aurélie, turning round with her imperial air, violently interrupted the conversation. "'Be quiet, young ladies. We can't hear ourselves speak. My word of honour. Then she again went on calling out. Seven mantles. Old style. Sicilian. First size. At a hundred and thirty. Three pelisses. Sora. Second size. At a hundred and fifty. Have you got that down, Mademoiselle Bardou?' "'Yes, madame.' Clara then had to look after the armfuls of garments piled upon the tables. She pushed them about and made some more room, but she soon left them again to reply to a salesman who was looking for her. It was the glover, Mignon, who had escaped from his department. He whispered a request for twenty francs. He already owed her thirty, a loan effected on the day after some races when he had lost his week's money on a horse. This time he had squandered his commission, drawn overnight, and had not ten sous left him for his Sunday. Clara had only ten francs about her, and she lent them with a fairly good grace. And they then went on talking of a party of six, which they had formed part of, at a restaurant at Bougival, where the women had paid their shares. It was much better to do that. They all felt more at ease. Next, Mignot, who wanted his twenty francs, went and bent over Lhomme's shoulder. The latter, stopped in his writing, was looking for a ten-franc piece in his purse, when Madame Aurélie, astonished at not hearing the voice of Marguerite, who had been obliged to pause, perceived Mignon and understood everything. She roughly sent him back to his department, saying that she didn't want anyone to come and distract a young lady's attention from their work. The truth was, she dreaded this young man, a bosom friend of Albert's, and his accomplice in all sorts of questionable pranks, which she dared would some day turn out badly. Accordingly, when Mignot had got his ten francs and run away, she could not help saying to her husband, "'Is it possible to let a fellow like that get over you?' "'But, my dear, I really couldn't refuse the young man.' She closed his mouth with a shrug of her substantial shoulders. Then, as the saleswomen were slyly grinning at this family explanation, she resumed severely. Now, Mademoiselle Vadon, don't let us go to sleep. Twenty cloaks, cashmere extra, fourth size, at eighteen francs and a half, resumed Marguerite in her sing-song voice. Lhomme, with his head bowed down, again began writing. They had gradually raised his salary to nine thousand francs a year. But he was very humble before Madame Aurélie, who still brought nearly three times as much into the family. For a while the work was pushed forward. Figures were banded about, garments rained thick and fast on the tables. But Clara had invented another amusement. She was teasing the messenger, 
Joseph, about a passion which he was said to nourish for a young lady in the pattern room. This young lady, already twenty-eight years old, and thin and pale, was a protégée of Madame de Forges, who had wanted Moret to engage her as a saleswoman, backing up her recommendation with a touching story. An orphan, the last of the Fontenelle, and all the noble family of Poutin had been thrown on to the streets of Paris with a drunken father. Still, she had remained virtuous amidst this misfortune, which was the greater, as her education was altogether too limited to enable her to secure employment as governess or music mistress. Moret generally got angry when anyone recommended these broken-down gentlewomen to him. There were no more incapable, more insupportable, more narrow-minded creatures than these gentlewomen, said he. And, besides, a saleswoman could not be improvised. She must serve an apprenticeship. It was an intricate and delicate business. However, he took Madame de Vosges's protégé, placing her in the pattern room, in the same way as, to oblige friends, he had already found places for two countesses and a baroness in the advertising department, where they addressed wrappers and envelopes. Mademoiselle de Fontenelle earned three francs a day, which just enabled her to live in her modest room in the Rue d'Argentuille. It was on seeing her with her sad look and shabby attire that Joseph's heart, very tender, despite his rough, soldierly manner, had been touched. He did not confess, but blushed when the young ladies of the mantle department chaffed him, for the pattern room was not far off, and they had often observed him prowling about the doorway. "'Joseph is somewhat absent-minded,' murmured Clara. "'His nose is always turning towards the underlinen department.' They had requisitioned Mademoiselle de Fontenelle there, and she was assisting at a trousseau counter. As the messenger continually glanced in that direction, the saleswoman began to laugh, whereupon he became very confused, and plunged into his accounts, whilst Marguerite, in order to arrest the burst of gaiety which was tickling her throat, cried out louder still, Fourteen jackets, English cloth, second size, at fifteen francs! At this... Madame Moralie, who was calling out some cloaks, could not make herself heard. She interfered with a wounded air, and the majestic slowness of manner. "'A little softer, mademoiselle. We are not in a market, and you are all of you very unreasonable, to be amusing yourself with such childish matters, when our time is so precious.' Just at that moment, as Clara was not paying any attention to the packages, a catastrophe took place. Several mantles tumbled down, and all the heaps on the tables, carried with them, toppled over one after the other, so that the carpet was quite strewn with them. "'There! What did I say?' cried the first hand, beside herself. "'Pray be more careful, Mademoiselle Prenet. It's altogether intolerable.' But a hum ran along. Moret and Bordoncle, making their round of inspection, had just appeared. The voices began calling again, and the pens sputtered, whilst Clara hastened to pick up the garments. The governor did not interrupt the work. He stood there for several minutes, mute and smiling, with the gay victorious face of stock-taking days. And it was only on his lips that a slight feverish quiver could be detected. When he perceived Denise, he nearly gave way to a gesture of astonishment. She had come down, then. His eyes met Madame Moralis. Then, after a moment's hesitation, he went away into the underlinen department. However, Denise, warned by the slight noise, had raised her head, and, having recognised Moret, she had immediately bent over her work again. Since she had been writing in this mechanical way, amidst the calling out of the goods, a peaceful feeling had stolen over her. She had always yielded thus to the first outburst of her sensitiveness. Tears suffocated her, and passion increased her torments. But then she regarded her self-command, a grand calm courage, a quiet but inexplorable strength of will. And now, with her limpid eyes and pale complexion, she was free from all agitation, entirely absorbed in her work, resolved to silence her heart and to do nothing but her will. Ten o'clock struck. The uproar of the stock-taking was increasing, 
and amidst the incessant shouts which rose and flew about on all sides the same news circulated with surprising rapidity every salesman knew that moret had written that morning inviting denise to dinner the indiscretion came from pauline on going downstairs still greatly excited she had met deloche in the lace department and without noticing that leonard was talking to the young man had immediately relieved her mind of the secret it's all over my dear fellow she just received the letter he has invited her to dinner for this evening deloche turned very pale he had understood for he often questioned pauline each day they spoke of their common friend and moret's passion for her moreover she frequently scolded him for his secret love for denise with whom he would never succeed and shrugged her shoulders when he expressed his approval of the girl's conduct with reference to their employer her foot's better she's coming down continued pauline pray don't put on that funeral face there's no reason to cry and thereupon she hastened back to her department ah good murmured leonard who had heard everything you're talking about the young girl with a sprain you were quite right to make haste in defending her last night at the cafe then he also ran off but before he had returned to the woollen department he had already related the story to four or five fellows in less than ten minutes it had gone the round of the whole shop end of chapter ten part one section twenty three of the ladies paradise by emile zola translated by ernest alfred visitelli this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Christine G. Chapter 10, Part 2 Leonard's last remark to Deloche referred to a scene which had occurred on the previous evening at the Café Saint-Roche. Deloche and he were now constantly together. The former had taken Houtin's room at the Hôtel de Smyrne, when that gentleman, on being appointed second-hand, had hired a suite of three rooms and the two salesmen came to the ladies' paradise together in the morning, and waited for each other in the evening, in order to go away together. Their rooms, which adjoined one another, overlooked a black yard, a narrow well, the stench from which pervaded the hotel. They got on very well together, notwithstanding their difference of character, the one carelessly squandering the money which she drew from his father, and the other penniless, perpetually tormented by ideas of thrift, both having, however, one point in common, their unskilfulness as salesmen, which kept them vegetating at their counters without any increase of salary. After leaving the shop, they spent the greater part of their time at the Café Saint-Roche. Void of customers during the day, this café filled at about half-past eight with an overflowing crowd of employees, the stream of shopmen which rolled into the street from the great doorway in the Place Gaillon. Then a deafening uproar of dominoes, laughter, and yelping voices burst forth amidst dense tobacco smoke. Beer and coffee were in great demand. Seated in the left-hand corner, Leonard would order the most expensive beverages, whilst the Loche contented himself with a glass of beer, which he would take four hours to drink. It was here that the latter had heard Favier relating, at a neighbouring table, some abominable things about the way in which Denise had hooked the governor. He had with difficulty restrained himself from striking him. However, as the other went on adding still viler and viler stories of the girl, he had at last called him a liar, feeling mad with rage. "'What a blackguard!' he had shouted. "'It's a lie! It's a lie! I tell you!' and in the emotion agitating him he had added a confession entirely opening his heart in a stammering voice i know her and it isn't true she has never had any affection except for one man yes for monsieur rotin and even he has never noticed it the report of this quarrel exaggerated and distorted was already affording amusement to the whole shop when the story of moret's letter ran round in fact, it was to a salesman in the silk department that Leonard first confided the news. With the silk vendors, the stock-taking was going on rapidly. Favier and two shopmen, mounted on stools, were emptying the shelves and passing the pieces of stuff to Houtin, 
who, standing on a table, called out the figures, after consulting the tickets, and he then dropped the pieces onto the floor, over which they spread, rising slowly like an autumn tide. Other employees were writing, Albert Lhomme being among the helpers, his face pale and heavy after a night spent in a low show at La Chapelle. A sheet of light fell from the glazed roof of the hall, through which could be seen the intense blue of the sky. "'Draw those blinds!' cried out Boutemont, who was very busy superintending the work. "'The sun is unbearable!' Favier, on tiptoe, trying to reach a piece of silk, then grumbled under his breath. "'A nice thing to shut people up on a lovely day like this. No fear of it raining on stock-taking day. And they keep us under lock and key, like convicts, when all Paris is out of doors.' He passed the silk to Hutin. On the ticket was the measurements, diminished at each sale by the quantity sold, which greatly simplified the work. The second hand cried out, Fancy silk, small check, twenty-one yards, at six francs and a half. And then the piece went to increase the heap already on the floor. Whilst waiting for another, he resumed a conversation previously begun, by saying to Favier, So he wanted to fight you? Yes, I was quietly drinking my glass of beer. It was hardly worth his while to contradict me, for she has just received a letter from the governor inviting her to dinner. The whole shop is talking about it. What? Hadn't she dined with him before? Favier handed him another piece of silk. No, it seemed not, though my opinion was all the other way. The whole department was now joking about the affair, without, however, allowing the work to suffer. The young girl's name passed from mouth to mouth, and the salesmen arched their backs and winked. Boutemont himself, who took a rare delight in all such stories, could not help adding his joke. Just then, however, Mignot came down, with the twenty francs which he had just borrowed, and he stopped to slip ten francs into Albert's hand, making an appointment with him for the evening. A projected spree, hampered by lack of money, but still possible, notwithstanding the smallness of the sum secured. However, when Mignon heard about the famous letter, he made such an abominable remark that Boutemont was obliged to interfere. That's enough, gentlemen. It isn't any of our business. Go on, Monsieur Rotin. Fancy silk, small check, thirty-two yards, at six francs and a half, cried out the latter. The pens started off again, the pieces fell, the flood of material still increased, as if the water of a river had emptied itself there. And there was no end to the calling out of the fancy silks. Favier, in an undertone, thereupon remarked that the stock in hand would form a nice total. The governors would be enchanted. That big fool of a Boutemont might be the best buyer in Paris, but as a salesman he was not worth his salt. Houtin smiled, delighted, and giving the other a friendly look of approval, for after having himself introduced Boutemont to the Lady's Paradise, in order to get rid of Robinot, he was now undermining him also, with the firm intention of depriving him of his birth. It was the same war as formerly. Treacherous insinuations whispered in the partner's ears, excessive zeal to push one's self forward, a regular campaign carried on with affable cunning. Houtard was again displaying some condescension towards Favier, but the latter, thin and frigid with a bilious look, gave him a sly glance as if to count how many mouthfuls this short little fellow would make, and to imply that he was waiting till he had swallowed up Boutemont, in order to eat him afterwards. He, Favier, hoped to get the second hand's place, should his friend be appointed manager. And after that they would see consumed by the fever which was raging from one to the other end of the shop both of them began talking of the probable increases of salary without however ceasing to call out the stock of fancy silks they felt sure that boutemont would secure thirty thousand francs that year Houtard, for his part would exceed ten thousand whilst favier estimated his pay and commission at five thousand five hundred the amount of business in the department was increasing yearly the salesmen secured promotion and increase of pay, like officers in time of war. Won't those fancy silks soon be finished? 
asked Boutemont, suddenly, with an expression of annoyance. But it was a miserable spring, always raining. People bought nothing but black silks. His fat, jovial face became cloudy as he gazed at the growing heap on the floor, whilst Hortin called out louder, still, in a sonorous voice tinged with an accent of triumph. Fancy silks, small check, twenty-eight yards, at six francs and a half. There was still another shelfful. Favier, whose arms were getting tired, was now progressing but slowly. As he handed Hortin the last pieces, he resumed in a low tone. "'Oh, I say, I forgot. Have you heard that the second hand in the mantle department once had a regular fancy for you?' Hortin seemed greatly surprised. "'What? How do you mean?' "'Yes, that great booby Deloche let it out to us. But I remember her casting sheep's eyes at you some time back.' Since his appointment as second hand, Hutar had thrown up his music hall singers. Flattered at heart by Favier's word, he nevertheless replied with a scornful air, I don't care for such scraggy creatures. And then he called out, White pal, thirty five yards at eight francs seventy five. Oh, at last, murmured Boutemont, greatly relieved. But a bell rang, that for the second table, to which Favier belonged. He jumped off the stool where another salesman took his place, and he was obliged to climb over the mountain of materials with which the floor was littered. Similar heaps were scattered about in every department. The shelves, the boxes, the cupboards were being gradually emptied, whilst the goods overflowed on all sides, underfoot, between the counters and the tables, in ever-rising piles. In the linen department you could hear heavy bales of calico falling, in the mercery department there was a clicking of boxes, whilst distant rumbling sounds came from amongst the furniture. Every sort of voice was heard too, shrill, full, deep and husky, figures whizzed through the air and a rustling clamour reigned in the immense nave, the clamour of forests in January, when the wind whistles through the branches. Favier at last got clear and went up the dining-room staircase. Since the enlargement of the ladies' paradise, the refectories had been shifted to the fourth story of the new buildings. As he hurried up, he overtook Deloche and Léonard, who had gone on before him, so he fell back on Mignon, who was following at his heels. "'The douche!' said he, in the corridor leading to the kitchen, on reaching the blackboard on which the bill of fare was inscribed. "'You can see it's stock-taking day, a regular feast!' chicken or a leg of mutton and artichokes their mutton won't be much of a success mignot sniggered murmuring is there a poultry epidemic on then however deloche and leonard had taken their portions and gone away favier thereupon leaned over the wicked and called out chicken but he had to wait one of the kitchen helps had cut his finger in carving and this caused some confusion Favier stood there with his face to the opening, gazing into the kitchen with its giant appliances. There was a central range, over which, by a system of chains and pulleys, a couple of rails fixed to the ceiling brought colossal cauldrons, which four men could not have lifted. Several cooks, quite white in the ruddy glow of the cast iron, were attending to the evening soup mounted on mental ladders, and armed with skimmers fixed to long handles. Then against the wall were grills large enough for the roasting of martyrs, saucepans big enough for the stewing of entire sheep, a monumental plate warmer, and a marble basin filled by a continual stream of water. To the left could be seen a scullery with stone sinks as large as ponds, whilst on the other side, to the right, was a huge meat safe, where a glimpse was caught of numerous joints of red meat hanging from steel hooks. A machine for peeling potatoes was working with the tic-tac of a mill, and two small trucks laden with freshly picked salad were being wheeled by some kitchen helps into a cool spot under a gigantic filter. "'Chicken!' repeated Favier, getting impatient. Then, turning round, he added in a lower tone, "'One fellow has cut himself. It's disgusting. His blood's running over the food.' Mignot wanted to see— Quite a string of shopmen had now arrived. There was a deal of laughing and pushing. 
the two young men their heads at the wicket exchanged remarks about this phalansterian kitchen in which the least important utensils even the spits and larding pins assumed gigantic proportions two thousand luncheons and two thousand dinners had to be served and the number of employees was increasing every week it was quite an abyss into which something like forty-five bushels of potatoes one hundred and twenty pounds of butter and sixteen hundred pounds of meat were cast every day and at each meal they had to broach three casks of wine over a hundred and fifty gallons being served out at the wine counter ah at last murmured favier when the cook reappeared with a large pan out of which he handed him the leg of a fowl chicken said mignot behind him and with their plates in their hands they both entered the refectory after taking their wine at the bar whilst behind them the word chicken was repeated without cessation and one could hear the cook picking up the portions with his fork with a rapid rhythmical sound the men's dining room was now an immense apartment supplying ample room for five hundred people at each repast the places were laid at long mahogany tables placed parallel across the room and at either end were similar tables reserved for the managers of departments and the inspectors whilst in the centre was a counter for the extras right and left large windows admitted a white light to the gallery whose ceiling although over twenty feet from the floor seemed very low owing to the development of the other proportions the sole ornaments on the walls painted a light yellow were the napkin cupboards behind this first refectory came that of the messengers and carmen where the meals were served irregularly according to the needs of the moment what you've got a leg as well mignon said favier as he took his place at one of the tables opposite his companion other young men now sat down around them there was no tablecloth the plates clattered on the bare mahogany and in this particular corner everybody was raising exclamations for the number of legs distributed was really prodigious these chickens are all legs remarked mignon yes they're real centipedes reported another salesman those who had merely secured pieces of carcass were greatly discontented however the food had been of much better quality since the late improvements moret no longer treated with a contractor at a fixed rate he had taken the kitchen into his own hands organizing it like one of the departments with a head cook under cooks and an inspector and if he spent more money he got on the other hand more work out of the staff a practical humanitarian calculation which had long terrified bourdoncle mine is pretty tender all the same said mignon pass the bread the big loaf was sent round and after cutting a slice for himself he dug the knife into the crust a few dilatory ones now hurried in taking their places a ferocious appetite increased by the morning's work burst forth from one to the other end of the immense tables there was an increasing clatter of forks a gurgling sound of bottles being emptied a noise of glasses laid down too violently amidst the grinding rumble of five hundred pairs of powerful jaws chewing with wondrous energy and the talk still infrequent seemed to be hampered by the fullness of the mouths the loche however seated between bourges and leonard found himself nearly opposite favier they had glanced at each other with a rancorous look some neighbours aware of their quarrel on the previous day began whispering together then there was a laugh at poor deloche's ill luck although always famished he invariably fell on the worst piece at table by a sort of cruel fatality this time he had come in for the neck of a chicken and some bits of carcass without saying a word however he let them joke away swallowing large mouthfuls of bread and picking the neck with the infinite art of a fellow who entertains great respect for meat why don't you complain asked borge but he shrugged his shoulder what would be the use of that it was always the same when he did venture to complain things went worse than ever you know the bobinards have got their club now said mignon at once yes my boy the bobbin club it's held at a wine shop in the rue saint honore where they hire a room on saturdays he was speaking of the mercery salesman 
the whole table began to joke between two mouthfuls with his voice still thick each made some remark adding a detail and only the obstinate readers remained mute with their noses buried in the newspapers it could not be denied that shopmen were gradually assuming a better style nearly half of them now spoke english or german it was no longer considered good form to go and kick up a row at bullier or prowl about the music halls for the pleasure of hissing ugly singers no a score of them got together and formed a club have they a piano like the linen men asked leonard i should rather think they had exclaimed mignot and they play my boy and sing there's even one of them little bavour who recites verses the gaiety redoubled and they chaffed little bavou nevertheless beneath their laughter lay a great respect then they spoke of a piece at the vaudeville in which a counter-jumper played a nasty part which annoyed several of them whilst others began anxiously wondering at what time they would get away that evening having invitations to pass the evening at friends houses and from all points came similar conversations amidst an increasing rattle of crockery to drive away the odour of the food the warm steam which rose from the five hundred plates they had opened the windows whose lowered blinds were scorching in the heavy august sun burning gusts came in from the street golden reflection yellowed the ceiling steeping the perspiring eaters in a reddish light a nice thing to shut people up in such a fine sunday as this repeated favier this remark brought them back to the stock-taking it had been a splendid year and they went on to speak of the salaries the rises the eternal subject the stirring question which occupied them all it was always thus on chicken days a wonderful excitement declared itself the noise at last became unbearable when the waiters brought the artichokes you could not hear yourself speak however the inspector on duty had ordered to be indulgent by the way cried favier you've heard the news but his voice was drowned by mignot asking who doesn't like artichoke i'll sell my dessert for an artichoke no one replied everybody liked artichoke that lunch would be counted amongst the good ones for peaches were to be given for the set he has invited her to dinner my dear fellow said favier to his right-hand neighbour finishing his story what he didn't know it the whole table knew it they were tired of talking about it since early morning and the same poor jokes passed from mouth to mouth deloche was quivering again and his eyes at last rested on favier who was persisting in his shameful remarks but all at once the silk salesman ducked his head for deloche yielding to an irresistible impulse had thrown his last glass of wine into his face stammering take that you infernal liar i ought to have drenched you yesterday this caused quite a scandal a few drops had spurted on favier's neighbours whilst he himself only had his hair slightly wetted the wine thrown by an awkward hand had fallen on the other side of the table however the others got angry asking the loche if the girl was his property that he defended her in this way what a brute he was he deserved a good drubbing to teach him better manners however their voices fell for an inspector was observed coming along and it was useless to let the management interfere in the quarrel favier contented himself with saying if it had caught me you would have seen some spot then the affair wound up in jeers when deloche still trembling wished to drink by way of hiding his confusion and mechanically caught hold of his empty glass they all burst out laughing he laid his glass down again awkwardly enough and commenced sucking the leaves of the artichoke which he had already eaten pass deloche the water bottle said mignot quietly he's thirsty the laughter increased the young men took clean plates from the piles standing at equal distances on the table whilst the waiters handed round the dessert which consisted of peaches in baskets and they all held their sides when mignot added with a grin each man to his taste the loche takes wine with his peaches the loche however sat motionless with his head hanging down as if deaf to the joking going on around him he was full of despairing regret at the thought of what he had just done those fellows were right what right had he to defend her they would now think all sorts of villainous things 
he could have killed himself for having thus compromised her in attempting to prove her innocence such was always his luck he might just as well kill himself at once for he could not even yield to the prompting of his heart without doing some stupid thing and then tears came to his eyes was it not also his fault if the whole shop was talking of the letter written by the governor he heard them grinning and making abominable remarks about the invitation which leonard alone had been informed of and he reproached himself he ought never to have let pauline speak before that fellow he was really responsible for the annoying indiscretion which had been committed why did you go and relate that he murmured at last in a sorrowful voice it's very wrong i replied leonard but i only told it to one or two persons enjoining secrecy one never knows how these things get about when deloche made up his mind to drink a glass of water everybody burst out laughing again they had finished their meal and were lolling back on their chairs waiting for the bell to recall them to work they had not asked for many extras at their great central counter especially as on stock-taking day the firm treated them to coffee the cups were steaming perspiring faces shone under the light vapour floating like bluey clouds from cigarettes at the windows the blinds hung motionless without the slightest flapping one of them on being drawn up admitted a ray of sunshine which sped across the room and gilded the ceiling the uproar of the voices beat upon the walls with such force that the bell was at first only heard by those at the tables near the door then they got up and for some time the corridors were full of the confusion of the departure the loche however remained behind to escape the malicious remarks that were still being made borsch even went out before him and borsch was as a rule the last to leave taking a circuitous route as to meet pauline on her way to the ladies dining-room a manoeuvre they had arranged between them the only chance they had of seeing one another for a minute during business hours that day however just as they were indulging in a lovely kiss in a corner of the passage they were surprised by denise who was also going up to lunch she was walking slowly on account of her foot oh, oh my dear stammered pauline very red don't say anything will you borsch with his big limbs and giant stature was trembling like a little boy he muttered they'd pressure soon pitch us out although our marriage may be announced they don't allow any kissing the brutes denise greatly agitated affected not to have seen them and borsch disappeared just as deloche also going the longest way round in his turn appeared he wished to apologize stammering out phrases that denise did not at first catch then as he blamed pauline for having spoken before leonard and she stood there looking very embarrassed denise at last understood the meaning of the whispers she had heard around her all the morning it was a story of the letter circulating and again was she shaken by the shiver with which this letter had agitated her but i didn't know repeated pauline besides there's nothing bad in the letter let them gossip they're jealous of course my dear said denise at last with her sensible air i don't blame you in any way you've spoken nothing but the truth i have received a letter and it is my duty to answer it the loche went off heartbroken in the belief that the girl accepted the situation and would keep the appointment that evening when the two saleswomen had lunched in a small room adjoining the larger one where the women were served much more comfortably pauline had to assist denise downstairs again as her sprain was getting more painful End of chapter 10, part 2section twenty four of the ladies paradise by emile zola translated by ernest alfred visitelli this librivox recording is in the public domain read by christine g chapter ten part three in the afternoon warmth below the stock-taking was roaring more loudly than ever the moment for the supreme effort had arrived when as the work had not made such progress during the morning everybody put forth their strength in order that all might be finished that night the voices grew louder still you saw nothing but waving arms continually emptying the shells and throwing the goods down 
and it was impossible to get along, for the tide of the bales and packages on the floor rose as high as the counters. A sea of heads, brandished fists, and flying limbs seemed to extend to the very depths of the department, with the confused aspect of a distant riot. It was the last fever of the clearing. The machine seemed ready to burst, and past the plate-glass windows, all round the closed shop, there still went a few pedestrians, pale with the stifling boredom of a summer Sunday. On the pavement in the Rue Neveau saint augustine three tall girls, bareheaded and sluttish-looking, were impudently pressing their faces against the windows, trying to see the curious work going on inside. When Denise returned to the mantle department, Madame Aurélie told Marguerite to finish calling out the garments. There was still the checking to be done, and for this, being desirous of silence, she retired into the pattern room, taking Denise with her. "'Come with me, we'll do the checking,' she said, "'and then you can add up the figures.' However, as she wished to leave the door open, in order to keep an eye on her young ladies, the noise came in, and they could not hear themselves much better, even in this pattern room. A large, square apartment furnished merely with some chairs and three long tables. In one corner were the great machine knives, for cutting up the patterns. Entire pieces of stuff were consumed. Every year they sent away more than sixty thousand francs worth of material, cut up in strips. From morning to night the knives were cutting silk, wool and linen, with a scythe-like noise. Then, too, the books had to be got together, gummed or sewn. And between the two windows there was also a little printing press for the tickets. "'Not so loud, please!' cried Madame Aurélie every now and again, quite unable as she was to hear Denise reading out the articles. Then, the checking of the first lists being completed, she left the young girl at one of the tables, absorbed in the adding up, but came back almost immediately and placed Mademoiselle de Fontenelle near her. The underlinen department, not requiring Madame de Forges protégé any longer, had placed her at her disposal. She could also do some adding up, it would save time. But the appearance of the marchioness, as Clara ill-naturedly called the poor creature, had disturbed the department. They laughed and joked at poor Joseph, and their ferocious sallies were wafted into the pattern room. "'Don't draw back. You are not at all in my way,' said Denise, seized with pity. "'My inkstand will suffice. We'll dip together.' Mademoiselle de Fontenelle, brutified by her unfortunate position, could not even find a word of gratitude. She looked like a woman who drank. Her meagre face had a livid hue, and her hands alone— white and delicate attested to the distinction of her birth however the laughter all at once ceased and the work resumed its regular roar moret was once more going through the departments but he stopped and looked round for denise surprised at not seeing her there then he made a sign to madame aurélie and both drew aside and for a moment talked in a low tone he must have been questioning her she nodded towards the pattern room, and then seemed to be making a report. No doubt she was relating that the young girl had been weeping that morning. "'Very good,' said Moret, aloud, coming nearer. "'Show me the lists.' "'This way, sir,' said the first hand. "'We have run away from the noise.' He followed her into the next room. Clara was not duped by this manoeuvre, but Marguerite threw her the garments at a quicker rate, in order to take up her attention and close her mouth. Wasn't a second hand a good comrade? Her affairs did not concern them. The whole department was now aiding and abetting the intrigue. The young ladies grew more agitated than ever. Lom and Joseph affected not to see or hear anything. An inspector Jove, who, in passing by, had remarked Madame Aurélie's tactics, began walking up and down before the pattern room door, with a regular step of a sentry guarding the will and pleasure of a superior. "'Give Monsieur Moret the lists,' said the first hand. Denise handed them over, and sat there with her eyes raised. She had started slightly, but had promptly conquered herself, and retained a fine, calm look, although her cheeks were pale. For a moment, Moret appeared to be absorbed in the list of articles, 
never giving the girl a glance a silence reigned then madame oralie all at once stepped up to mademoiselle de fontenelle who had not even turned her head and apparently dissatisfied with her counting said to her in an undertone go and help with the parcels you are not used to figures mademoiselle de fontenelle got up and returned to the department where she was greeted with whispering joseph under the laughing eyes of these young minxes was writing anyhow clara though delighted to have an assistant nevertheless treated her very roughly hating her as she hated all the women in the shop what an idiotic thing to yield to the love of a workman when you were a marchioness and yet she envied the poor creature this love very good repeated moret still pretending to read however madame oralie hardly knew how to get away in her turn in a decent fashion she turned about went to look at the machine knives furious with her husband for not inventing a pretext for calling her but then he was never of any use in serious matters he would have died of thirst close to a pond it was marguerite who proved intelligent enough to go and ask the first hand a question i'm coming replied the latter and her dignity now being saved having a pretext to join the young ladies who were watching her she at last left denise and moret alone together coming out of the pattern room with a majestic step and so noble an air that the saleswomen did not even dare to smile moret had slowly laid the lists on the table and stood looking at denise who had remained seated pen in hand she did not avert her gaze but she had merely turned paler you will come this evening asked he no sir i cannot my brothers are to be at my uncle's to-night and i have promised to dine with them but your foot you walk with such difficulty oh i can get so far very well i feel much better since the morning in his turn he had turned pale on hearing this quiet refusal a nervous revolt made his lips quiver however he restrained himself and with the air of a good-natured master simply interesting himself in one of his young ladies resumed come now if i begged of you you know what great esteem i have for you denise retained her respectful attitude i am deeply touched sir by your kindness to me and thank you for this invitation but i repeat i cannot my brothers expect me this evening she persisted in not understanding the door remained open and she felt that the whole shop was urging her on to ruin pauline had amicably called her a great simpleton the others would laugh at her if she refused the invitation madame oralie who had gone away marguerite whose rising voice she could hear l'homme whom she could espy sitting motionless and discreet all these people were wishing for her fall and the distant roar of the stock-taking the millions of goods enumerated on all sides and thrown about in every direction were like a warm breeze wafting the breath of passion towards her there was a silence now and again moret's voice was drowned by the noisy accompaniment the formidable uproar of a kingly fortune gained in battle when will you come then he asked again to-morrow the simple question troubled denise she lost her calmness for a moment and stammered i-i don't know i can't i can't he smiled and tried to take her hand which she withheld what are you afraid of he asked but she quickly raised her head looked him straight in the face and smiling with her sweet brave look replied i am afraid of nothing sir i can do as i like can i not i don't wish to that's all as she finished speaking she was surprised to hear a creaking noise and on turning round saw the door slowly closing it was inspector jove who had taken upon himself to pull it to the doors were a part of his duty none ought ever to remain open and he gravely resumed his position as sentinel no one appeared to have noticed that this door was being closed in such a simple manner clara alone risked a strong remark in the air of mademoiselle de fontenelle but the latter's face remained expressionless denise however had risen moret was saying to her in a low and trembling voice listen denise i love you you have long known it pray don't be so cruel as to play the ignorant i love you denise she was standing there very pale listening to him and still looking straight into his face tell me 
he went on, why do you refuse? Have you no wants? Your brothers are a heavy burden. Anything you might ask of me, anything you might require of me. But with a word, she stopped him. Thanks. I now earn more than I need. But it's perfect liberty that I am offering you, an existence of pleasure and luxury. I will set you up in a home of your own. I will assure you a little fortune. No, thanks. I should soon get tired of doing nothing. I earned my own living before I was ten years old. He made a wild gesture. This was the first one who did not yield. With the others he had merely had to stoop. His passion, long restrained, goaded on by resistance, became stronger than ever, and he pressed her more and more urgently. But without faltering, she each time replied, No. No. Then at last he let his heart cry escape him, But don't you see that I am suffering? Yes, it's stupid, but I am suffering like a child. Tears came into his eyes. A fresh silence reigned. They could still hear the softening roar of the stock-taking behind the closed door. It was like a dying note of triumph. The accompaniment subsided into a lower key in presence of this defeat of the master. And yet, if I liked, he said in an ardent voice, seizing her hands. She left them in his. Her eyes turned pale. Her whole strength was deserting her. A warmth came from this man's burning grasp, filling her with a delicious cowardice. Good heavens, how she loved him, and with what delight she could have hung on his neck and remained there. But in his passionate excitement he grew brutal. She set up a low cry. The pain she felt at her wrists restored her courage. With an angry shake she freed herself. Then, very stiffly, looking taller in her weakness. No, leave me alone. I am not a Clara to be thrown over in a day. Besides, you love another. Yes, that lady who comes here. I do not accept half an affection. He remained motionless with surprise. What was she saying, and what did she want? The other girls had never asked to be loved. He ought to have laughed at such an idea. Yet this attitude of tender pride completely conquered his heart. Now, sir, please open the door, she resumed. It is not proper that we should be shut up together in this way. He obeyed, and with his temples throbbing, hardly knowing how to conceal his anguish, he recalled Madame Moralie, and broke out angrily about the stock of cloaks, saying that the prices must be lowered, until every one had been got rid of. Such was the rule of the house. A clean sweep was made every year. They sold at sixty per cent loss, rather than keep an old pattern or any stale material. At that moment, Bourdoncle, seeking Moret, was waiting for him outside, having been stopped before the closed door by Jove, who had whispered a word in his ear with a grave air. He got very impatient, without, however, summoning up sufficient courage to interrupt the governor's tete-a-tete. Was it possible, on such a day too, and with that creature? And when Moret at last came out, Bourdoncle spoke to him about the fancy silks, of which the stock left on hand would be something enormous. This was a relief for Moret, as it gave him an opportunity for shouting. What the devil was Boudemont thinking about? He went off declaring that he could not allow a buyer to display such lack of sense as to buy beyond the requirements of the business. What is the matter with him? murmured Madame Morali, quite overcome by his reproaches, while the young ladies looked at each other in surprise. At six o'clock the stock-taking was finished. The sun was still shining, a fair summer sun, whose golden reflections streamed through the glazed roofs of the halls. In the heavy air of the streets, tired families were already returning from the suburbs, laden with bouquets and dragging their children along. One by one the departments had become silent. In the depths of the galleries you now only heard the lingering calls of a few men clearing a last shelf. Then even these voices ceased, and of all the bustle of the day there only remained a quivering vibration above the formidable piles of goods. The shelves, cupboards, boxes and bandboxes were now empty. Not a yard of stuff, not an object of any sort had remained in its place. 
the vast establishment displayed but the carcass of its usual appearance the woodwork was absolutely bare as on the day of taking possession the bareness was the visible proof of the complete exact taking of the stock and on the floor was sixteen million francs worth of goods a rising sea which had finished by submerging the tables and counters however the shopmen surrounded to the shoulders began to put each article back into its place they expected to finish by about ten o'clock when madame Aurélie, who went to the first dinner came back from the dining-room she announced the amount of business done during the year which the totals of the various departments had just enabled one to arrive at the figure was eighty million francs ten millions more than the previous year the only real decrease had been on the fancy silks if monsieur moret is not satisfied i should like to know what more he wants added the first hand see he is fuming over there at the top of the grand staircase the young ladies went to look at him he was standing alone with a sombre countenance above the millions scattered at his feet madame said denise at this moment would you kindly let me go away now i can't do anything more on account of my foot and as i am to dine at my uncle's with my brothers they were all astonished she had not yielded then madame Aurélie hesitated and speaking in a sharp and disagreeable voice seemed inclined to forbid her going out whilst clara shrugged her shoulders full of incredulity when pauline learned the news she was in the baby linen department with deloche and the sudden joy exhibited by the young man made her very angry as for bourdoncle who did not dare to approach moret in his savage isolation he marched up and down amidst these rumours in despair also and full of anxiety however denise went down as she slowly reached the bottom of the left-hand staircase leaning on the banister she came upon a group of grinning salesmen her name was pronounced and she realised that they were talking about her adventure they had not noticed her descent oh all that's put on you know favier was saying she's full of vice yes i know some one whom she set her eyes on and thereupon he glanced at Houtin who in order to preserve his dignity a second hand was standing a short distance away without joining in their conversation however he was so flattered by the envious air with which the others contemplated him that he deigned to murmur she was a regular nuisance to me was that girl denise wounded to the heart clung to the banister they must have seen her for they all disappeared laughing he was right she thought and she reproached herself for her former ignorance when she had been wont to think of him but what a coward he was and how she scorned him now a great trouble had come upon her was it not strange that she should have found the strength just now to repulse a man whom she adored when she had felt herself so feeble in bygone days before that worthless fellow whom she had only dreamed of her sense of reason and her bravery foundered in these contradictions of her being which she could not clearly read then she hastened to cross the hall but a sort of instinct prompted her to raise her head whilst an inspector was opening the door closed since the morning and still at the top of the stairs on the great central landing dominated the gallery she perceived moret he had quite forgotten the stock-taking he no longer beheld his empire that building bursting with riches everything had disappeared his former uproarious victories his future colossal fortune with a desponding look he was watching denise and when she had crossed the threshold everything disappeared a darkness came over the house end of chapter ten part three Section twenty five of the Ladies' Paradise by Emile Zola. Translated by Ernest Alfred Vizitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Christine G. Chapter eleven. Part one. That day Boutemont was the first to arrive at Madame de Forges' four o'clock tea. Still alone in her large Louis sixteenth drawing room, the brasses and brocatelle of which shone out with a clear gaiety, the latter rose with an air of impatience, saying, "'Well?' "'Well,' replied the young man, "'when I told him I should doubtless call on you, "'he formally promised me to come.' 
you made him thoroughly understand that i counted on the baron to-day certainly that's what appeared to decide him they were speaking of moret who the year before had suddenly taken such a liking to boutemont that he had admitted him to share his pleasures and had even introduced him to henriette glad to have an agreeable fellow always at hand to enliven an intimacy of which he was getting tired it was thus that boutemont had ultimately become the confidant of his governor and of the handsome widow he did their little errands talked of the one to the other and sometimes reconciled them henriette in her jealous fits abandoned herself to a familiarity which sometimes surprised and embarrassed him for she lost all her ladylike prudence using all her art to save appearances she resumed violently you ought to have brought him i should have been sure then well said he with a good-natured laugh it isn't my fault if he escapes so frequently now oh he is very fond of me all the same were it not for him i should be in a bad way at the shop his situation at the ladies paradise was really menaced since the last stock taking it was in vain that he had used the rainy season one could not overlook the considerable stock of fancy silks and as hutin was improving the occasion undermining him with a governess with an increase of sly rage he felt the ground cracking under him moret had condemned him weary no doubt of this witness who prevent him breaking with henriette tired of a familiarity which was profitless but in accordance with his usual tactics he was pushing bourdoncle forward it was bourdoncle and the other partners who insisted on his dismissal at each board meeting whilst he resisted still according to his account defending his friend energetically at the risk of getting into serious trouble with the others well i shall wait resumed madame de forges you know that girl is coming here at five o'clock i want to see them face to face i must discover their secret and she returned to this long meditated plan she repeated in her fever that she had requested madame oralie to send her denise to look at a mantle which fitted badly when she had once got the young girl in her room she would find a means of calling moret and could then act boutemont who had sat down opposite her was gazing at her with his fine laughing eyes which he endeavoured to render grave this jovial dissipated fellow with his cold black beard whose warm gascon blood empurpled his cheeks was thinking that these fine ladies were not much good and that they let out a nice lot of secret when they opened their hearts his friend's mistresses simple shop girls certainly never made more complete confessions Come he ventured to say at last what does that matter to you i swear to you there is nothing whatever between them just so cried she because he loves her i don't care in the least for the others chance acquaintances friends of a day she spoke of clara with disdain she was well aware that moret after denise's refusal had fallen back on this tall red-haired girl with a horse's head doubtless by calculation for he maintained her in the department loading her with presents not only that for the last three months he had been leading a terrible life squandering his money with prodigality which caused a great many remarks he had bought a mansion for a worthless actress and was being ruined by two or three other jades who seemed to be struggling to outdo each other in costly stupid caprices it's this creature's fault repeated henriette i feel sure he's ruining himself with the others because she repulses him besides what is money to me i should have loved him better poor you know how i love him you who have become our friend she stopped choked ready to burst into tears and with a movement of abandon she held out her two hands to him it was true she adored moret for his youth and his triumphs never had any man thus conquered her so entirely in a quiver of her flesh and of her pride but at the thought of losing him she also heard a knell of her fortieth year and she asked herself with terror how she should replace this great love i'll have my revenge murmured she i'll have my revenge if he behaves badly boutemore continued to hold her hands in his she was still handsome but she would be a very awkward mistress thought he and he did not like that style of woman 
The thing, however, deserved thinking over. Perhaps it would be worth while risking certain annoyances. "'Why don't you set up for yourself?' she asked all at once, drawing her hands away. He was astonished. Then he replied, "'But it would require an immense sum. Last year I had an idea in my head. I feel convinced that there are customers enough in Paris for one or two more big shops, but the district would have to be chosen. The Bon Marché has the left side of the river. The Louvre occupies the centre. We monopolise, at the Paradise, the rich West End district. There remains the north, where a rival to the Place Clégy could be created. And I had discovered a splendid position, near the Opera House. Well? He set up a noisy laugh. <laughs> Just fancy. I was stupid enough to go and talk to my father about it. Yes, I was simple enough to ask him to find some shareholders at Toulouse. And he gaily described the anger of the old man, enraged against the great Parisian bazaars, in his little country shop. Old Boutemont, suffocated by the thirty thousand francs a year earned by his son, had replied that he would give his money and that of his friends to the hospitals rather than contribute a sou to one of those shops which were pests of the drapery business. Besides, continued the young man, it would require millions. Suppose they were found, observed Madame de Forges, simply. He looked at her, serious all at once. Was it not merely a jealous woman's word? But she did not give him time to question her, adding, in short, you know what a great interest I take in you. We'll talk about it again. The outer bell had rung. She got up, and he himself, with an instinctive movement, drew back his chair, as if they might have been surprised. A silence reigned in the drawing-room, with its pretty hangings, and decorated with such a profusion of green plants that there was quite a small wood between the two windows. She stood there waiting, with her air towards the door, there he is she murmured the footman announced monsieur moret and monsieur de valagnosc andriette could not restrain a movement of anger why had he not come alone he must have gone after his friend fearful of a tete-a-tete -tete with her however she smiled and shook hands with the two men what a stranger you are getting i may say the same for you monsieur de valagnosc her great grief was to be becoming stout, and she squeezed herself into tight black silk dresses to conceal her increasing obesity. However, her pretty face, with her dark hair, preserved its amiable expression, and Moret could familiarly tell her, enveloping her with a look, "'It's useless to ask how you are. You are as fresh as a rose.' "'Oh, I am almost too well,' replied she. "'Besides, I might have died. You would have known nothing about it.' She was examining him also, and thought him looking tired and nervous, his eyes heavy, his complexion livid. "'Well,' she resumed, in a tone which she endeavoured to render agreeable, "'I cannot return the compliment. You don't look at all well to-day.' "'Overwork,' remarked de Valagnosc. Moret shrugged his shoulders, without replying. He had just perceived Boutemont, and nodded to him in a friendly way. During the time of their close intimacy, he used to take him away direct from the department, bringing him to Henriette's during the busiest moments of the afternoon. But times had changed. He said to him in a half-whisper, "'You went away rather early. They noticed your departure, and are furious about it.' He referred to Bourdoncle, and the other persons who had an interest in the business, as if he were not himself the master. Ah, murmured Boutemont, rather anxious. Yes, I want to talk to you. Wait for me. We'll leave together. Meanwhile, Henriette had sat down again, and while listening to de Valagnosc, who was announcing that Madame de Bove would probably pay her a visit, she did not take her eyes off Moret. The latter, silent again, gazed at the furniture, seemed to be looking for something on the ceiling. Then, as she laughingly complained that she had only gentlemen at her four o'clock tea, he so far forgot himself as to blurt out, "'I expect you to find Baron Hartmann here.' Andriette turned pale. No doubt she knew he came to her house solely to meet the Baron, but he might have avoided throwing his indifference in her face like this. 
At that moment the door had opened, and the footman was standing behind her. When she had interrogated him by a sign, he leant over her and said in a very low tone, "'It's for that mantle. You wished me to let you know. The young lady is there.' Then Henriette raised her voice, so as to be heard. All her jealous suffering found relief in the following words, of a scornful harshness. "'She can wait!' "'Shall I show her into your dressing-room?' "'No, no, let her stay in the ante-room.' And when the servant had gone out, she quietly resumed her conversation with the Valagnosc. Moret, who had relapsed into his former lassitude, had listened with a careless, distracted air, without understanding. Boutemont, preoccupied by the adventure, was reflecting. But almost immediately after, the door was opened again, and two ladies were shown in. "'Just fancy,' said Madame Marty. "'I was alighting at the door when I saw Madame de Boff coming under the arcade.' "'Yes,' explained the latter. "'It's a fine day, and my doctor says I must take walking exercise.' Then, after a general handshaking, she asked Henriette, "'You're engaging a new maid, then?' "'No,' replied the other, astonished. "'Why?' "'Because I've just seen a young girl in the ante-room.' Henriette interrupted her, laughing. <laughs> it's true. All these shop girls look like ladies' maids, don't they? Yes, it's a young person come to alter a mantle. Moret looked at her intently, a suspicion crossing his mind. She went on with a forced gaiety, explaining that she had bought this mantle at the ladies' paradise the previous week. What? asked Madame Marty. Have you deserted Savoir, then? "'No, dear, but I wish to make an experiment. "'Besides, I was pretty well satisfied with the first purchase, "'a travelling cloak, but this time it has not succeeded at all. "'You may say what you like. "'One is horribly trussed up in the big shops. "'I speak out plainly, even before you, Monsieur Moret. "'You will never know how to dress a woman with the slightest claim of distinction.' "'Moret did not defend his house, still keeping his eyes on her.' thinking to himself that she would never have dared to do such a thing. And it was Boutemont who had to plead the cause of the ladies' paradise. "'If all the aristocratic ladies who patronise us announce the fact,' replied he gaily, "'you would be astonished at our customers. Order a garment to measure at our place, it will equal one from Severs, and it will cost but half the money. But there, just because it's cheaper, it's not so good.' "'So it doesn't fit, this mantle you speak of?' resumed madame de boeuf ah now i remember the young person it's rather dark in your ante-room yes added madame marty i was wondering where i had seen that figure well go my dear don't stand on ceremony with us henriette assumed a look of disdainful unconcern oh presently there is no hurry the ladies continued to discuss the articles from the big shops then Madame de Boves spoke of her husband, who, she said, had gone to inspect the breeding depot at saint lô And just then Henriette was relating that through the illness of an aunt, Madame Guibal had been suddenly called into Franche Comté. Moreover, she did not reckon that day on Madame Bordelais, who at the end of every month shut herself up with a needlewoman to look over her young people's underlinen. But Madame Marty seemed agitated with some secret trouble. Her husband's position at the Lysée Bonaparte was menaced, in consequence of lessons given by the poor man in certain doubtful institutions where a regular trade was carried on with the B.A. diplomas. The poor fellow picked up a pound where he could, feverishly, in order to meet the ruinous expenses which pillaged his household, and his wife, on seeing him weeping one evening in the fair of dismissal, had conceived the idea of getting her friend Henriette to speak to a director at the Ministry of Public Instruction, with whom she was acquainted. Henriette finished by quieting her with a few words. It was understood that Monsieur Marty was coming himself to know his fate, and to thank her. "'You look ill, Monsieur Moret, observed Madame de Boves. "'Overwork,' repeated de Valagnosc, with his ironical phlegm. Moray quickly got up, as if ashamed at forgetting himself thus. He went and took his accustomed place in the midst of the ladies, summoning up all his agreeable talent. He was now occupied with the winter novelties, and spoke of a considerable arrival of lace. 
and madame de boves questioned him as to the price of the bruges lace she felt inclined to buy some she had now got so far as to economize the thirty sous for a cab often going home quite ill from the effect of stopping before the windows draped in a mantle which was already two years old she tried in imagination on her queenly shoulders all of the dearest things she saw and it was like tearing her flesh away when she awoke and found herself dressed in her patched old dresses without the slightest hope of ever satisfying her passion baron hartmann announced the man-servant henriette observed with what pleasure moret shook hands with the new arrival the latter bowed to the ladies and looked at the young man with that subtle expression which sometimes illumined his big alsatian face always plunged in dress murmured he with a smile then like a friend of the house he ventured to add there's a charming young girl in the ante-room who is it oh nobody replied madame de Fauche, in her ill-natured voice only a shop girl waiting to see me but the door remained half open the servant was bringing in the tea he went out came in again placed the china service on the table then some plates of sandwiches and biscuits in the vast room a bright light softened by the green plants illuminated the brasswork bathing the silk hangings in a tender flame and each time the door was opened one could perceive an obscure corner of the ante-room which was only lighted by two ground glass windows there in the darkness appeared a sombre form motionless and patient it was denise still standing up there was a leather-covered form there but a feeling of pride prevented her sitting down on it she felt the insult keenly she had been there for the last half hour without a gesture without a word the ladies and the baron had taken stock of her in passing she could now hear the voices from the drawing-room all this amiable luxury wounded her with its indifference and still she did not move suddenly through the half-open door she perceived moret and he on his side had at last guessed it to be her is it one of your saleswomen asked baron hartmann moret had succeeded in concealing his great agitation but his voice trembled somewhat with emotion no doubt but i don't know which it's the little fair girl from the ready-made department replied madame marty obligingly the second hand i believe henriette looked at moret in her turn ah said he simply and he tried to change the conversation speaking of the fetes given to the king of prussia then passing through paris but the baron returned maliciously to the young ladies in the big establishments he affected to be desirous of gaining information and put several questions where did they come from in general was their conduct as bad as it was said to be quite a discussion ensued really he repeated you think them well behaved moret defended their virtue with a conviction that made de valagnosc smile boutemont then interfered to save his chief of course there were some of all sorts bad and good formerly they had nothing but the refuse of the trade a poor vague class of girls drifted into the drapery business whilst now such respectable families as those living in the rue de sevres for instance positively brought up their girls for the bon marche in short when they liked to conduct themselves well they could for they were not like the work girls of paris obliged to board and lodge themselves they had bed and board their existence was provided for an existence excessively hard no doubt the worst of all was their neutral badly defined positions between the shopman and the lady thrown into the midst of luxury often without any previous instruction they formed a singular nameless class their misfortunes and vices sprung from that i said madame de boves i don't know any creatures more disagreeable really one could slap them sometimes and the ladies vented their spite they devoured each other before the shop counters it was a question of woman against woman in the sharp rivalry of money and beauty it was an ill-natured jealousy felt by the saleswomen towards the well-dressed customers the ladies whose manners they try to imitate and a still stronger feeling on the part of the poorly dressed customers the lower class ones against the saleswomen those girls dressed in silk from whom they would have liked to exact a servant's humility when serving a ten sous purchase don't speak of them 
said Henriette, by way of conclusion, a wretched lot of beings, ready to sell themselves the same as their goods. Moret had the strength to smile. The baron was looking at him, so touched by his graceful command over himself, that he changed the conversation, returning to the fete to be given to the king of Prussia, saying they would be superb, the whole trade of Paris would profit by them. Henriette remained silent and thoughtful, divided between the desire to forget Denise in the ante-room and the fear that Moret, now aware of her presence, might go away. At last she quitted her chair. "'You will allow me?' "'Certainly, my dear,' replied Madame Marty. "'I'll do the honours of the house for you.' She got up, took the teapot, and filled the cups. Henriette turned towards Baron Hartmann, saying, "'You'll stay a few minutes, won't you?' "'Yes, I want to speak to Monsieur Moret. "'We are going to invade your little drawing-room.' "'She went out, and her black silk dress, rustling against the door, "'produced a noise like that of a snake wriggling through the brushwood. "'The baron at once manoeuvred to carry Moret off, "'leaving the ladies to Boutemont and the val "'Then they stood talking before the window of the other room in a low tone. "'It was quite a fresh affair.' For a long time, Moret had cherished a desire to realise his former project, the invasion of the whole block by the Ladies' Paradise, from the Rue Monsigny to the Rue de la Michaudière, and from the Rue Nouveau saint augustine to the Rue de Dix de Zambre. There was still a vast piece of ground, in the latter street, remaining to be acquired, and that sufficed to spoil his triumph. He was tortured with the desire to complete his conquest, to erect there a sort of apotheosis, a monumental façade. As long as his principal entrance should remain in the Rue Neuve saint augustine in a dark street of old Paris, his work would be incomplete, wanting in logic. He wished to set it up before new Paris, in one of these modern avenues, through which passed the busy crowd of the latter part of the nineteenth century. He saw it dominating, imposing itself as a giant palace of commerce, casting a greater shadow over the city than the old Louvre itself. But up to the present he had been balked by the obstinacy of the Crédit Immobilier, which still held to its first idea of building a rival to the Grand Hôtel on this land. The plans were ready, they were only waiting for the clearing of the Rue de Dix de Zambre to commence the work. At last, by a supreme effort, Moret had almost convinced Baron Hartmann. "'Well,' commenced the latter, "'we had a board meeting yesterday, "'and I came to-day thinking I should meet you, "'and being desirous of keeping you informed. "'They still resist.' "'The young man gave way to a nervous gesture. "'But it's ridiculous. "'What do they say?' "'Dear me, they say what I have said to you myself, "'and what I am still inclined to think. "'Your façade is only an ornament.' The new buildings would only extend by about a tenth the surface of your establishment, and it would be throwing away immense sums on a mere advertisement. At this, Moret burst out. An advertisement! An advertisement! In any case, this will be in stone and outlive all of us. Just consider that it would increase our business tenfold. We should see our money back in two years. What matters about what you call the wasted ground, if this ground returns you an enormous interest? You will see the crowd when our customers are no longer obliged to struggle through the Rue Nouveau Saint Augustine, but can freely pass down a thoroughfare large enough for six carriages abreast. No doubt, replied the baron, laughing, but you are a poet in your way. Let me tell you once more. These gentlemen think it would be dangerous to further extend your business. They want to be prudent for you. What do they mean? Prudent? I don't understand. Don't the figures show the constant progression of our business? At first, with a capital of five hundred thousand francs, I did business to the extent of two millions, turning the capital over four times. It then became four million francs, which, turned over ten times, has produced business to the extent of forty millions. In short, after successive increases, I have just learnt, from the last stock-taking, that the amount of business done now amounts to a total of eighty millions, Thus the capital, only slightly increased, for it does not exceed six millions, has passed over our counters, in the form of more than twelve times. He raised his voice, tapping the fingers of his right hand on the palm of his left hand, knocking down these millions as he would have cracked a few nuts. The baron interrupted him. I know, I know. 
"'But you don't hope to keep on increasing in this way, do you?' "'Why not?' asked Moray ingenuously. "'There's no reason why it should stop. "'The capital can be turned over as often as fifteen times. "'I predicted as much long ago. "'In certain departments it can be turned over twenty-five or thirty times. "'And after? "'Well, after we'll find a means of turning it over more than that. "'So you'll finish by drinking up all the money in Paris, "'as you drink a glass of water?' Most decidedly, doesn't Paris belong to the women, and don't the women belong to us? End of chapter 11, part 1《Chapter Eleven, Part Two. The Baron laid his hands on Moray's shoulders, looking at him with a paternal air. Listen, you're a fine fellow, and I'm really fond of you. There is no resisting you. We'll go into the matter seriously, and I hope to make them listen to reason. Up to the present, we are perfectly satisfied with you. Your dividends astonish the boars. You must be right. It will be better to put more money into your business than to risk this competition with the Grand Hotel, which is hazardous. Moray's excitement subsided at once. He thanked the baron, but without any of his usual enthusiasm. And the latter saw him turn his eyes towards the door of the next room, again seized with the secret anxiety which he was concealing. However, the Valagnosque had come up, understanding that they had finished talking business. He stood close to them, listening to the baron, who was murmuring with the gallant air of an old man who had seen life. "'I say, I fancy they're taking their revenge.' "'Who?' asked Moret, embarrassed. "'Why, the women. They're getting tired of belonging to you. You now belong to them, my dear fellow. It's only just.' He joked him, well aware of the young man's notorious love affairs. The mansion bought for the actress, the enormous sums squandered with girls picked up in private supper-rooms, amused him as an excuse for the follies he had formerly committed himself. His old experience rejoiced. "'Really, I don't understand,' repeated Moret. "'Oh, you understand well enough. They always get the last word. In fact—' I said to myself, it isn't possible, he's boasting. He can't be so strong as that. And there you are. Bleed the women, work them as you would a coal mine, and what for? In order that they may work you afterwards, and force you to refund at last. Take care, for they'll draw more blood and money from you than you have ever sucked from them. He laughed louder still, and the Valagnosque was also grinning without, however, saying a word. "'Dear me! One must have a taste of everything,' confessed Moray at last, pretending to laugh as well. <laughs> "'Money is so stupid, if it isn't spent.' "'As for that, I agree with you,' resumed the baron. "'Enjoy yourself, my dear fellow. I'll not be the one to preach to you, nor to tremble for the great interests we have confided to your care.' Every one must sow his wild oats, and his head is generally clearer afterwards. Besides, there's nothing unpleasant in ruining one's self when one feels capable of building up another fortune. But if money is nothing, there are certainly sufferings. He stopped. His smile became sad. Former sufferings presented themselves amid the irony of his scepticism. He had watched the duel between Henriette and Moray, with the curiosity of one who still felt greatly interested in other people's love battles, and he felt that the crisis had arrived. He guessed the drama, well acquainted with the story of this Denise, whom he had seen in the ante-room. "'Oh, as for suffering, that's not in my line,' said Moray, in a tone of bravado. "'It's quite enough to pay.' The baron looked at him for a moment without speaking. Without wishing to insist on his discreet illusion, he added, slowly, "'Don't make yourself worse than you are. You'll lose something else besides your money at that game. Yes, 
you lose a part of yourself, my dear fellow. He stopped, again laughing, to ask. That often happens, doesn't it, Monsieur de Valangnosc? So they say, Baron, the young man simply replied. Just at this moment, the door was opened. Moret, who was going to reply, slightly started. The three men turned around. It was Madame de Forge, looking very gay, putting her head through the doorway to call, in a hurried voice. Monsieur Moret, Monsieur Moret. Then, when she perceived the three men, she added, Oh, you'll excuse me, won't you, gentlemen? I'm going to take Monsieur Moret away for a minute. The least he can do, as he has sold me a frightful mantle, is to give me the benefit of his experience. This girl is a stupid, without the least idea. Come, come, I'm waiting for you. He hesitated, undecided, flinching before the scene he could foresee. But he had to obey. The baron said to him, with his air at once paternal and mocking, "'Go, my dear fellow, go, madame wants you.' Moret followed her. The door closed, and he thought he could hear de Valagnosque's grin stifled by the hangings. His courage was entirely exhausted. Since Henriette had quitted the drawing-room, and he knew Denise was alone in the house in jealous hands, he had experienced a growing anxiety, a nervous torment, which made him listen from time to time as if suddenly startled by a distant sound of weeping. What could this woman invent to torture her? And his whole love, this love, which surprised him even now, went out to the young girl like a support and a consolation. Never had he loved her so strongly, with that charm so powerful in suffering— his former affections, his love for Henriette herself, so delicate, so handsome, the possession of whom was so flattering to his pride, had never been more than agreeable pastimes, frequently a calculation, in which he sought nothing but a profitable pleasure. He used quietly to leave his mistresses and go home to bed, happy in his bachelor liberty, without a regret or a care on his mind, whilst now his heart beat with anguish, his life was taken. He no longer enjoyed the forgetfulness of sleep in his great, solitary bed. Denise was his only thought. Even at this moment she was the sole object of his anxiety, and he was telling himself that he preferred to be there to protect her, notwithstanding his fear of some regrettable scene with the other one. At first they both crossed the bedroom, silent and empty. Then Madame de Vorges, Pushing open a door, entered the dressing-room, followed by Moret. It was a rather large room, hung with red silk, furnished with a marble toilet-table and a large wardrobe with three compartments and great glass doors. As the window looked into the yard, it was already rather dark, and the two nickel-plated gas-burners on either side of the wardrobe had been lighted. "'Now let's see,' said Henriette. "'Perhaps we shall get on better.' On entering, Moret had found Denise standing upright, middle of the bright light. She was very pale, modestly dressed in a cashmere jacket and a black hat, and was holding on one arm the mantle bought at the Ladies' Paradise. When she saw the young man, her hands slightly trembled. "'I wish Monsieur Moret to judge,' resumed Henriette. "'Just help me, mademoiselle.' And Denise, approaching, had to give her the mantle— she had already placed some pins on the shoulders, the part that did not fit. Henriette turned round to look at herself in the glass. "'Is it possible? Speak frankly.' "'It really is a failure, madame,' said Moret, to cut the matter shortly. "'It's very simple. The young lady will take your measure, and we will make you another.' "'No, I want this one. I want it immediately,' resumed she, with vivacity. "'But—' It's too narrow across the chest, and it forms a ruck at the back between the shoulders. Then, in her sharpest voice, she added, It's no use you standing looking at me, mademoiselle. That won't make it any better. Try and find a remedy. It's your business. Denise again commenced to place the pins, without saying a word. That went on for some time. She had to pass from one shoulder to the other, and was even obliged to go almost on her knees to pull the mantle down in front. 
above her placing herself entirely in denise's hands madame de forges gave her face the harsh expression of a mistress exceedingly difficult to please delighted to lower the young girl to this servant's work she gave her sharp and brief orders watching for the least sign of suffering on moret's face put a pin here no not there here near the sleeve you don't seem to understand that isn't it there's a ruck showing again take care you're pricking me now twice had moret vainly attempted to interfere to put an end to the scene his heart was beating violently from this humiliation of his love and he loved denise more than ever with a deep tenderness in the presence of her admirably silent and patient attitude if the young girl's hands still trembled somewhat at being treated in this way before his face she accepted the necessities of her position with the proud resignation of a courageous girl when madame de forge found they were not likely to betray themselves she tried another way she commenced to smile on moret treating him openly as her lover the pins having run short she said to him look my dear in the ivory box on the dressing-table really it's empty kindly see on the chimney-piece in the bedroom you know at the corner of the looking-glass she spoke as if he were quite at home in the habit of sleeping there and knew where to find everything even the brushes and combs when he brought back a few pins she took them one by one and forced him to stay near her looking at him and speaking low i don't fancy i'm humpbacked give me your hand feel my shoulders just to please me am i really made like that denise slowly raised her eyes paler than ever and set about placing the pins in silence moret could only see her blonde tresses twisted at the back of her delicate neck but by the slight shudder which was raising them he thought he could perceive the uneasiness and shame of her face now she would certainly repulse him and send him back to this woman who did not conceal her connection even before strangers brutal thoughts came into his head he could have struck henriette how was he to stop her talk how should he tell denise that he adored her that she alone existed for him at this moment and that he was ready to sacrifice for her all his former affections the worst of women would not have indulged in the equivocal familiarities of this well-born lady he took his hand away and drew back saying you are wrong to go so far madame since i myself considered the garment to be a failure one of the gas burners was hissing and in the stuffy moist air of the room nothing else was heard but this ardent breath the looking-glasses threw large sheets of light on the red silk hangings on which were dancing the shadows of the two women a bottle of verbena of which the cork had been left out spread a vague odour something like that of a fading bouquet there madame i can do no more said denise at last rising up she felt thoroughly worn out twice she had run the pins in her fingers as if blinded her eyes in a mist was he in the plot had he sent for her to avenge himself for her refusal by showing that other women loved him and this thought chilled her she never remembered to have stood in need of so much courage not even during the terrible hours of her life when she wanted for bread it was comparatively nothing to be humiliated but to see him almost in the arms of another woman as if she had not been there henriette looked at herself in the glass and once more broke out in harsh words but it's absurd mademoiselle it fits worse than ever just look how tight it is across the chest i look like a wet nurse denise losing all patience made a rather unfortunate remark you are slightly stout madame we cannot make you thinner than you are stout stout exclaimed henriette who now turned pale in her turn you're becoming insolent mademoiselle really i should advise you to criticize others they both stood looking at each other face to face trembling there was now neither lady or shop-girl they were simply two women made equal by their rivalry the one had violently taken off the mantle and cast it on a chair whilst the other was throwing on the dressing-table the few pins she had in her hands what astonishes me resumed henriette is that monsieur moret should tolerate such insolence 
I thought, sir, that you were more particular about your employees. Denise had again assumed her brave, calm manner. She gently replied. If Monsieur Moret keeps me, it's because he has no fault to find. I am ready to apologize to you, if he wishes it. Moret was listening, excited by this quarrel, and able to find a word to put a stop to it. He had a great horror of these explanations between women, their asperity wounding his sense of elegance and gracefulness. Henriette wished to force him to say something in condemnation of the young girl, and, as he remained mute, still undecided, she stung him with a final insult. "'Very good, sir. It seems that I must suffer the insolence of your mistresses in my own house, even. A girl you've picked up out of the gutter.' Two big tears gushed from Denise's eyes. She had kept them back for some time, but her whole being succumbed beneath this last insult. When he saw her weeping like that, without the slightest attempt at retaliation, with a silent, despairing dignity, Moray no longer hesitated. His heart went out towards her in an immense burst of tenderness. He took her hands in his and stammered, "'Go away immediately, my child, and forget this house.' Andriette, perfectly amazed, choking with anger, stood looking at them. "'Wait a minute,' continued he, folding up the mantle himself. "'Take this garment away. Madame can buy another elsewhere. And pray, don't cry any more. You know how much I esteem you.' He went with her to the door, which he closed after her. She had not said a word, but a pink flame had coloured her cheeks, whilst her eyes were wet with fresh tears.' tears of a delicious sweetness. Henriette, who was suffocating, had taken out her handkerchief and was crushing her lips with it. This was a total overthrowing of her calculations. She herself had been caught in the trap she had laid. She was mortified with herself for having pushed the matter too far, tortured with jealousy. To be abandoned for such a creature as that, to see herself disdained before her, her pride suffered more than her love. "'So, it's that girl that you love,' said she, painfully, when they were alone. Moret did not reply at once. He was walking about from the window to the door, as if absorbed by some violent emotion. At last he stopped, and very politely, in a voice which he tried to render cold, he replied with simplicity. "'Yes, madame.' The gas burner was still hissing in the stifling air of the dressing-room, but the reflex of the glasses were no longer traversed by dancing shadows. The room seemed bare, of a heavy dullness. Henriette suddenly dropped on a chair, twisting her handkerchief in her febrile fingers, repeating amidst her sobs, "'Good heavens! How miserable I am!' He stood looking at her for several seconds, and then went away quietly. She, left all alone, wept on in silence, before the pins scattered over the dressing-table and the floor. When Moret returned to the little drawing-room, he found de Valagnosc alone, the baron having gone back to the ladies. As he felt himself very agitated still, he sat down at the further end of the room, on a sofa, and his friend, seeing him turn pale, charitably came and stood before him, to conceal him from curious eyes. At first they looked at each other without saying a word, then de Valagnosc, who seemed to be inwardly amused at Moray's confusion, finished by asking in his bantering voice, "'Are you still enjoying yourself?' Moray did not appear to understand him at first. But remembering their former conversations on the empty and the useless torture of life, he replied, "'Of course, before lived so much. Ah, my boy, don't you laugh. The hours that make one die of grief are by far the shortest.' He lowered his voice, continuing gaily, beneath his half-wiped tears. Yes, you know all, don't you? Between them they have rent my heart. But yet it's nice, as nice as kisses, the wounds they make. I am thoroughly worn out. But, no matter, you can't think how I love life. Oh, I shall win her at last, this little girl who still says no. The Valagnosc simply said, And after? After? Why, I shall have her. Isn't that enough? 
if you think yourself strong because you refuse to be stupid and to suffer you make a great mistake you are merely a dupe my boy nothing more try and long for a woman and win her at last that pays you in one minute for all your misery but de valagnosc once more trotted out his pessimism what was the good of working so much if money could not buy everything he would very soon have shut up shop and given up work for ever the day he found out that his millions could not even buy the woman he wanted moret listening to him became grave then he set off violently he believed in the all-powerfulness of his will i want her and i'll have her and if she escapes me you'll see what a place i shall have built to cure myself it will be splendid all the same you don't understand this language old man otherwise you would know that action contains its own recompense to act to create to struggle against facts to overcome them or be overthrown by them all human health and joy consists in that simple method of diverting oneself murmured the other well i prefer diverting myself as one must die i would rather die of passion than boredom they both laughed this reminded them of their old discussions at college the valagnosc in an effeminate voice then commenced to parade his theories of the insipidity of things investing with a sort of fanfaronade the immobility and emptiness of his existence yes he dragged on from day to day at the office in three years he had had a rise of six hundred francs he was now receiving three thousand six hundred barely enough to pay for his cigars it was getting worse than ever and if he did not kill himself it was simply from a dislike of all trouble moret having spoken of his marriage with mademoiselle de Beauve, he replied that notwithstanding the obstinacy of the aunt in refusing to die the matter was going to be concluded at least he thought so the parents were agreed and he was ready to do anything they might tell him to do what was the use of wishing or not wishing since things never turned out as one desired he quoted as an example his future father-in-law who expected to find in madame gibal an indolent blonde the caprice of an hour but who was now led by her with a whip like an old horse on its last leg whilst they supposed him to be busy inspecting the stud at saint lo she was squandering his last resources in a little house hired by him at versailles he is happier than you said moret getting up oh rather declared de valagnosc perhaps it's only doing wrong that's somewhat amusing moret had now recovered his spirits he was thinking about getting away but not wishing his departure to resemble a flight he resolved to take a cup of tea and went into the other drawing-room with his friend both in high spirits the baron asked him if the mantle had been made to fit and moret replied carelessly that he gave it up as far as he was concerned they all seemed astonished whilst madame marty hastened to serve him madame de Beauve accused the shop of always keeping their garments too narrow at last he managed to sit down near boutemont who had not stirred they were forgotten for a moment and in reply to anxious questions put by boutemont desirous of knowing what he had to say to him moret did not wait to get into the street but abruptly informed him that the board of directors had decided to deprive themselves of his services between each phrase he drank a drop of tea protesting all the while that he was in despair oh a quarrel that he had not even then got over for he had left the meeting beside himself with rage but what could he do he could not break with these gentlemen about a simple question of staff boutemont very pale had to thank him once more what a terrible mantle observed madame marty henriette can't get over it and really this prolonged absence began to make every one feel awkward but at that very moment madame de forges appeared so you've given it up as well cried madame de Beauve gaily how do you mean why monsieur moret told us you could do nothing with it henriette affected the greatest surprise monsieur was joking the mantle will fit splendidly she appeared very calm and smiling 
no doubt she had bathed her eyes for they were quite fresh without the slightest trace of redness whilst her whole being was still trembling and bleeding she managed to conceal her torture beneath the mask of her smiling well-bred elegance and she offered the sandwiches to de Valognosc with her usual graceful smile the baron alone who knew her so well remarked the slight contraction of her lips and the sombre fire which she had not been able to extinguish in her eyes he guessed the whole scene dear me each one to his taste said madame de Bove, also accepting a sandwich i know some women who would never buy a ribbon except at the louvre others only swear by the bon marche it's a question of temperament no doubt the bon marche is very provincial murmured madame marty and one gets so crushed at the louvre they had again returned to the big shops moret had to give his opinion he came up to them and affected to be very just the bon marche was an excellent house solid respectable but the louvre certainly had a more aristocratic class of customers in short you prefer the ladies paradise said the baron smiling yes replied moret quietly there we really love our customers all the women present were of his opinion it was just that they were at a sort of private party at the ladies paradise they felt there a continual caress of flattery an overflowing adoration which detained the most dignified and virtuous woman the enormous success of the establishment sprung from this gallant seduction by the way asked Henriette, who wished to appear entirely at her ease what have you done with my protege monsieur moret you know mademoiselle de fontenelle and turning towards madame Marty, she explained a marchioness my dear a poor girl fallen into poverty oh said moret she earned three francs a day stitching pattern books and i fancy i shall be able to marry her to one of my messengers oh fie what a horror exclaimed madame de Bove. he looked at her and replied in his calm voice why madame isn't it better for her to marry an honest, hard-working messenger than to run the risk of being picked up by some good-for-nothing fellow outside? The Valagnosque wished to interfere for a joke. Don't push him too far, madam, or he'll tell you that all the old families of France ought to sell calico. Well, declared Moret, it would at least be an honourable end for a great many of them. They set up a laugh. The paradox seemed rather strong. He continued to sing the praises of what he called the aristocracy of work. A slight flush had coloured Madame de Bove's cheeks. She was wild at the shifts she was put to by her poverty, whilst Madame Marty, on the contrary, approved, stricken with remorse on thinking of her poor husband. The footman had just ushered in the professor, who had called to take her home. He was drier, more emaciated than ever by his hard labour, and still wore his thin, shining frock-coat. When he had thanked Madame de Forge for having spoken for him at the ministry, he cast at Moret the timid glance of a man meeting the evil that is to kill him. And he was quite confused when he heard the latter asking him, "'Isn't it true, sir, that work leads to everything?' "'Work and economy,' replied he, with a slight shivering of his whole body. "'Add economy, sir.' Meanwhile, Boutemore had not moved from his chair, Moret's words were still ringing in his ears. He at last got up, and went and said to Henriette in a low tone, "'You know, he's given me notice, oh, in the kindest possible manner, but may I be hanged if he shan't repent it. I've just found my sign, the Four Seasons, and shall plant myself close to the opera house.' She looked at him with a gloomy expression. "'Reckon on me, I'm with you. Wait a minute.' and she immediately drew Baron Hartmann into the recess of a window, and boldly recommended Boutemont to him, as a fellow who was going to revolutionise Paris, in his turn, by setting up for himself. When she spoke of an advance of funds for her new protégé, the Baron, though now astonished at nothing, could not suppress a gesture of bewilderment. This was the fourth fellow of genius she had confided to him, and he began to feel himself ridiculous but he did not directly refuse. The idea of starting a competitor to the ladies' paradise even pleased him somewhat. For he had already invented, in banking matters, 
this sort of competition, to keep off others. Besides, the adventure amused him, and he promised to look into the matter. "'We must talk to Ava tonight,' whispered Andréette, returning to Boutemont. "'Don't fail to call about nine o'clock. The Baron is with us.' At this moment the vast room was full of voices. Moray, still standing up, in the midst of the ladies, had recovered his habitual elegant gracefulness, and was gaily defending himself from the charge of ruining them in dress, offering to prove by the figures that he enabled them to save thirty per cent on their purchases. Baron Hartmann watched him, seized with the fraternal admiration of a former man about town. Come, the duel was finished. Henriette was decidedly beaten. She certainly was not the coming woman. And he thought he could see the modest profile of the young girl whom he had observed and passing through the ante-room. She was there, patient, alone, redoubtable in her sweetness. End of chapter 11, part 2section twenty seven of the ladies paradise by emile zola translated by ernest alfred visitelli this librivox recording is in the public domain read by christine g chapter twelve part one it was on the twenty fifth of september that the building of the new facade of the ladies paradise was commenced Baron Hartmann, according to his promise, had had the matter settled at the last general meeting of the Crédit Immobilier, and Moret was at length going to enjoy the realisation of his dream. This façade, about to arise from the Rue de Dix Décembre, was like the very blossoming of his fortune. He wished, therefore, to celebrate the laying of the first stone, to make a ceremony of the work, and he distributed gratuities amongst his employees, and gave them game and champagne for dinner in the evening. Every one noticed his wonderfully good humour during the ceremony, his victorious gesture as he laid the first stone with a flourish of the trowel. For weeks he had been anxious, agitated by a nervous torment that he did not always succeed in concealing, and his triumph served as a respite, a distraction in his suffering. During the afternoon he seemed to have returned to his former healthy gaiety. But, after dinner, when he went through the refectory to drink a glass of champagne with his staff, he appeared feverish again, smiling with a painful look, his features drawn upon the unavowed pain that was devouring him. He was once more mastered by it. The next day, in the ready-made department, Clara tried to be disagreeable with Denise. She had noticed Columban's bashful passion, and took it into her head to joke about the Baudus. As Marguerite was sharpening her pencil while waiting for customers, she said to her in a loud voice, "'You know my lover opposite. It really grieves me to see him in that dark shop, where no one ever enters.' "'He's not so badly off,' replied Marguerite. "'He's going to marry the governor's daughter.' "'Oh, oh!' replied clara it would be good fun to lead him astray then i'll try the game on my word of honour and she continued in the same strain happy to feel denise was shocked the latter forgave her everything else but the idea of her dying cousin genevieve finished by this cruelty threw her into an indignant rage at that moment a customer came in and as madame oralie had just gone downstairs she took the direction of the counter and called Clara. "'Mademoiselle Prunaire, you had better attend to this lady instead of gossiping there.' "'I wasn't gossiping.' "'Have the kindness to hold your tongue, and attend to this lady immediately.' Clara gave in, conquered. When Denise showed her authority, quietly, without raising her voice, not one of them resisted. She had acquired absolute authority by her very moderation and sweetness. For a moment she walked up and down in silence amidst the young ladies, who had become very serious. Marguerite had resumed sharpening her pencil, the point of which was always breaking. She alone continued to approve of Denise's resistance to Moray, shaking her head, not acknowledging the baby she had had, but declaring that if they had any idea of the consequences of such a thing, they would prefer to remain virtuous. 
"'What? You're getting angry?' said a voice behind Denise. It was Pauline, who was crossing the department. She had noticed the scene, and spoke in a low tone, smiling. "'But I'm obliged to,' replied Denise in the same tone. "'I can't manage them otherwise.' Pauline shrugged her shoulders. "'Nonsense! You can be queen over all of us whenever you like.' She was still unable to understand her friend's refusal. Since the end of August, Pauline had been married to Bourges, a most stupid affair she would sometimes gaily remark. The terrible Bordoncle treated her anyhow, now considering her as lost for trade. Her only terror was that they might one fine day send them to love each other elsewhere, for the managers had decreed love to be execrable and fatal to business. So great was her fear that when she met Bourges in the galleries, she affected not to know him. She had just had a fright. Old Jove had nearly caught her talking to her husband behind a pile of dusters. "'See, he's followed me,' added she, after having hastily related the adventure to Denise. "'Just look at him scenting me out with his big nose.' Jove, in fact, was then coming from the lace department, correctly arrayed in a white tie, his nose on the scent for some delinquent. But when he saw Denise, he assumed a knowing air, and passed by with an amiable smile. "'Saved,' murmured Pauline. "'My dear, you made him swallow that. I say, if anything should happen to me, you would speak for me, wouldn't you? Yes, yes, don't put on that astonished air. We know that a word from you would revolutionise the house.' Denise had blushed, troubled by these amicable allusions. It was true, however— she had a vague sensation of her power by the flatteries with which she was surrounded. When Madame Aurélie returned, and found the department quiet and busy under the surveillance of the second hand, she smiled at her amicably. She threw over Moret himself, her amiability increased daily for this young girl, who might one fine morning desire her situation as first hand. Denise's reign was commencing. Bordoncle alone still stood out. In the secret war which he continued to carry on against the young girl, there was in the first place a natural antipathy. He detested her for her gentleness and her charm. Then he fought against her as a fatal influence which would place the house in peril the day when Moray should succumb. The governor's commercial genius seemed bound to sink amidst this stupid affection. What they had gained by women would be swallowed up by this woman. None of them touched his heart. He treated them with the disdain of a man without passion, whose trade is to live on them, and who had had his last illusions dispelled by seeing them too closely in the miseries of his traffic. Instead of intoxicating him, the odour of these seventy thousand customers gave him frightful headaches, and so soon as he reached home he beat his mistresses. And what made him especially anxious in the presence of this little saleswoman, who had gradually become so redoubtable, was that he did not in the least believe in her disinterestedness, in the genuineness of her refusals. For him she was playing a part, the most skilful of parts, for if she had yielded at once, Moret would doubtless have forgotten her the next day, whilst by refusing she had goaded his desires, rendering him mad, capable of any folly. An artful jade, a woman learned in vice, would not have acted any different to this pattern of innocence. Thus Bordoncle could never catch sight of her, with her clear eyes, sweet face, and simple attitude, without being seized with a real fear, as if he had before him some disguised female flesh-eater, the sombre enigma of woman, death in the guise of a virgin. In what way could he confound the tactics of this false novice? He was now only anxious to penetrate her artful ways, in hope of exposing them to the light of day. She would certainly commit some fault. He would surprise her with one of her lovers, and she should again be dismissed. The house would then resume its regular working, like a well-wound-up machine. "'Keep a good lookout, Monsieur Jove,' repeated Bordoncle to the inspector, I'll take care that you shall be rewarded. But Jove was somewhat lukewarm. He knew something about women, and was asking himself whether he had not better take the part of this young girl, who might be the future sovereign mistress of the place. 
though he did not now dare to touch her he still thought her bewitchingly pretty his colonel in bygone days had killed himself for a similar little thing with an insignificant face delicate and modest one look from whom ravaged all hearts i do replied he but on my word i cannot discover anything and yet stories were circulating there was quite a stream of abominable tittle-tattle running beneath the flattery and respect denise felt arising around her the whole house now declared that she had formerly had hutin for a lover no one could swear that the intimacy still continued but they were suspected of meeting from time to time deloche also was said to sleep with her they were continually meeting in dark corners talking for hours together it was quite a scandal so nothing about the first hand in the silk department nor about the young man in the lace one asked bordoncle no sir nothing yet replied the inspector it was with deloche especially that bordoncle expected to surprise denise one morning he himself had caught them laughing together downstairs in the meantime he treated her on a footing of perfect equality for he no longer disdained her he felt her to be strong enough to overthrow even him notwithstanding his ten years service if he lost the game keep your eye on the young man in the lace department concluded he each time they are always together if you catch them call me i'll manage the rest moret however was living in anguish was it possible that this child could torture him in this manner he could always recall her arriving at the lady's paradise with her big shoes thin black dress and savage airs she stammered they all used to laugh at her he himself had thought her ugly at first ugly and now she could have brought him on his knees by a look he thought her nothing less than an angel then she had remained the last in the house repulsed joked at treated by him as a curious specimen of humanity for months he had wanted to see how a girl sprung up and had amused himself at this experiment without understanding that he was risking his heart she little by little grew up became redoubtable perhaps he had loved her from the first moment even at the time he thought he felt nothing but pity for her and yet he had only really begun to feel this love the evening of their walk under the chestnut trees of the tuileries his life started from there he could still hear the laughing of a group of little girls the distant fall of a jet of water whilst in the warm shade she walked on beside him in silence after that he knew no more his fever had increased hour by hour all his blood his whole being in fact was sacrificed and for such a child was it possible when she passed him now the slight wind from her dress seemed so powerful that he staggered for a long time he had struggled and even now he frequently became indignant endeavouring to extricate himself from this idiotic possession what secret had she to be able to bind him in this way had he not seen her without boots had she not been received almost out of charity he could have understood it had it been a question of one of those superb creatures who charm the crowd but this little girl this nobody she had in short one of those insignificant faces which excite no remark she could not even be very intelligent for he remembered her bad beginning as a saleswoman but after every explosion of anger he had experienced a relapse of passion like a sacred terror at having insulted his idol she possessed everything that renders a woman good courage gaiety simplicity and there exhaled from her gentleness a charm of a penetrating perfume-like subtlety one might at first ignore her or elbow her like any other girl but the charm soon began to act with a slow invincible force one belonged to her for ever if she deigned to smile everything then smiled in her white face her pretty eyes her cheeks and chin full of dimples whilst her heavy blonde hair seemed to light up also with a royal and conquering beauty he acknowledged himself vanquished she was as intelligent as she was beautiful her intelligence came from the best part of her being whilst the other saleswomen had only a superficial education the varnish which scales off from girls of that class 
she without any false elegance retained her native grace the savour of her origin the most complete commercial ideas sprang up from her experience under this narrow forehead the pure lines of which clearly announced the presence of a firm will and a love of order and he could have clasped his hands to ask her pardon for having blasphemed her during his hours of revolt why did she still refuse with such obstinacy twenty times had he entreated her increasing his office offering money and more money then thinking she must be ambitious he had promised to appoint her first hand as soon as there should be a vacant department and she refused and still she refused for him it was a stupor a struggle in which his desire became enraged such an adventure appeared to him impossible this child would certainly finish by yielding for he had always regarded a woman's virtue as a relative matter he could see no other object everything disappeared before this necessity to have her at last in his room to take her on his knees and kiss her on her lips and at this vision the blood of his veins ran quick and strong he trembled distracted by his own powerlessness his days now passed in the same grievous obsession denise's image rose with him after having dreamed of her all night it followed him before the desk in his office where he signed his bills and orders from nine to ten o'clock a work which he accomplished mechanically never ceasing to feel her present still saying no with her quiet air then at ten o'clock came the board meeting a meeting of the twelve directors at which he had to preside they discussed matters affecting the indoor arrangements examined the purchases settled the window displays and she was still there he heard her soft voice amidst the figures he saw her bright smile in the most complicated financial situations after the board meeting she still accompanied him making with him the daily inspection of the counters returned with him to his office in the afternoon remaining close to his chair from two till four o'clock whilst he received a crowd of important business men the principal manufacturers of all france bankers inventors a continual come and go of the riches and intelligence of the land an excited dance of millions rapid interviews during which were hatched the biggest affairs on the paris market if he forgot her for a moment whilst deciding on the ruin or the prosperity of an industry he found her again at a twitch of his heart his voice died away he asked himself what was the use of this princely fortune when she still refused at last when five o'clock struck he had to sign the day's correspondence the mechanical working of his hand again commenced whilst she rose up before him more dominating than ever seizing him entirely to possess him during the solitary and ardent hours of the night and the morrow was the same day over again those days so active so full of a colossal labour which the slight shadow of a child sufficed to ravage with anguish but it was especially during his daily inspection of the departments that he felt his misery to have built up this giant machine to reign over such a world of people and to be dying of grief because a little girl would not accept him he scorned himself dragging the fever and shame of his pain about with him everywhere on certain days he became disgusted with his power feeling a nausea at the very sight of the long galleries at other times he would have wished to extend his empire and make it so vast that she would perhaps yield out of sheer admiration and fear he first of all stopped in the basement opposite the chute it was still in the rue Nove saint augustine but it had been necessary to enlarge it and it was now as wide as the bed of a river down which the continual flood of goods rolled with a loud noise of rushing water it was a constant succession of arrivals from all parts of the world rows of wagons from all railways a ceaseless discharging of merchandise a stream of boxes and bales running underground absorbed by the insatiable establishment he gazed at this torrent flowing into his house thought of his position as one of the masters of the public fortune 
that he held in his hands the fate of the French manufacturers, and that he was unable to buy a kiss from one of his saleswomen. Then he passed on to the receiving department, which now occupied that part of the basement running along the Rue Monsigny. Twenty tables were ranged there, in the pale light of the air-holes. Dozens of shopmen were bustling about, emptying the cases, checking the goods, and marking them in plain figures, amidst the roar of the chute, which almost drowned their voices. Various managers of departments stopped him. He had to resolve difficulties and confirm orders. This cellar was filled with the tender glimmer of the satin, the whiteness of the linen, a prodigious unpacking in which the furs were mingled with the lace, the fancy good with the eastern curtains. With a slow step he made his way amongst all these riches thrown about in disorder, heaped up in their state. Above they were destined to ornament the window displays, letting loose the rays after money across the counters, no sooner shown than carried off, and the furious current of business which traversed the place. He thought of his having offered the young girl silks, velvets, anything she liked to take in any quantities from these enormous heaps, and that she had refused by a shake of her fair head. After that he passed on to the other end of the basement to pay his usual visit to the delivery department. Interminable corridors ran along, lighted up with gas. To the right and to the left, the reserves, closed in with gratings, were like so many subterranean stores. A complete commercial quarter, with its haberdashery, underclothing, glove and other shops, sleeping in the shade. Further on was placed one of the three stoves, further still a fireman's post guarding the gas meter, enclosed in its iron cage. He found, in the delivery department, the sorting tables already blocked with loads of parcels, bandboxes and cases continually arriving in large baskets, and Campion, the superintendent, gave him some particulars about the current work, whilst the twenty men placed under his orders distributed the parcels into large compartments, each bearing the name of a district of Paris, and from whence the messengers took them up to the vans, ranged along the pavement. One heard a series of cries, names of streets, and recommendations shouted out, quite an uproar, an agitation such as on board a mail-boat about to start. And he stood there for a moment, motionless, looking at this discharge of goods which he had just seen absorbed by the house, at the opposite extremity of the basement. The enormous current there discharged itself into the street, after having filled the tills with gold. His eyes became misty. This colossal business no longer had any importance. He had but one idea, that of going away to some distant land and abandoning everything, if she persisted in saying no. He then went upstairs, continuing his inspection, talking and agitating himself more and more, without finding any respite. On the second floor he entered the correspondence department, picking quarrels, secretly exasperated against the perfect regularity of this machine that he had himself built up. This department was the one that was daily assuming the most considerable importance. It now required two hundred employees. Some opening, reading, and classifying the letters coming from the provinces and abroad, whilst others gathered into compartments the goods ordered by the correspondents and the number of letters was increasing to such an extent that they no longer counted them. They weighed them, receiving as much as a hundred pounds per day. He, feverish, went through the three offices, questioning Levasseur as to the weight of the correspondence. Eighty pounds, ninety pounds, sometimes on a Monday, a hundred pounds. The figure increased daily. He ought to have been delighted." but he stood shuddering in the noise made by the neighbouring squad of packers nailing down the cases. Vainly he roamed about the house. The fixed idea remained fast in his mind, and as his power unfolded itself before him, as the mechanism of the business and the army of employees passed before his gaze, he felt more profoundly than ever the insult of his powerlessness. Orders from all of Europe were flowing in, a special post-office van was required for his correspondence, and yet she said no, always no. 
he went downstairs again, visiting the central cashier's office, where four clerks guarded the two giant safes, in which there had passed the previous year forty-eight million francs. He glanced at the clearing-house, which now occupied twenty-five clerks, chosen from amongst the most trustworthy. He went into the next office, where twenty-five young men, junior clerks, were engaged in checking the debit notes and calculating the salesman's commission. He returned to the chief cashier's office, exasperated at the sight of the safes, wandering amidst these millions, the uselessness of which drove him mad. She said no, always no. And it was always no, in all the departments, in the galleries, in the saloons, and in every part of the establishment. He went from the silk to the drapery department, from the linen to the lace department. He ascended to the upper floors, stopping on the flying bridges, prolonging his inspection with a maniacal, grievous minuteness. The house had grown out of all bounds. He had created this department, then this other. He governed this fresh domain. He extended his empire into this industry, the last one conquered. And it was no, always no, in spite of everything. His staff would now have sufficed to people a small town. There were fifteen hundred salesmen and a thousand other employees of every sort, including forty inspectors and seventy cashiers. The kitchens alone gave occupation to thirty-two men. Ten clerks were set apart for the advertising. There were three hundred and fifty shop messengers, all wearing livery, and twenty-four firemen living on the premises. And, in the stables, royal buildings situated in the Rue Monsigny, opposite the warehouse, were one hundred and forty-five horses, a luxurious establishment which was already celebrated in Paris. The first four conveyances, which used formerly to stir up the whole neighbourhood when the house occupied only the corner of the Place Gaillon, had gradually increased to sixty-two trucks, one-horse vans, and heavy two-horse ones. They were continually scouring Paris, driven with knowing skill by drivers dressed in black, promenading the gold and purple sign of the ladies' paradise. They even went beyond the fortifications, into the suburbs. They were to be met on the dusty roads of Bicetre, along the banks of the Marne, even in the shady drives of the forest of Saint-Germain. Sometimes one would spring up from the depth of some sunny avenue, where all was silent and deserted, the suburb animals trotting along, throwing into the mysterious peacefulness of this grand nature the loud advertisement of its varnished panels. He was even dreaming of launching them further still, into the neighbouring departments. He would have liked to hear them rolling along every road in France, from one frontier to the other. But he no longer even troubled to visit his horses, though he was passionately fond of them. Of what good was this conquest of the world, since it was no, always no? End of chapter 12, part 1 Section 28 of The Ladies' Paradise by Emile Zola Translated by Ernest Alfred Vizitelli This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Christine G. Chapter 12, Part 2 At present, in the evening, when he arrived at Lom's desk, he still looked, through habit, at the amount of takings written on the card, which the cashier stuck on an iron file at his side. This figure rarely fell below a hundred thousand francs, sometimes it ran up to eight and nine hundred thousand on big sale days, but these figures no longer sounded in his ears like a trumpet blast. He regretted having looked at them, going away full of bitterness and scorn for money. But Moray's sufferings were destined to increase, for he became jealous. One morning, in the office, before the board meeting commenced, Bourdoncle ventured to hint that the little girl in the ready-made department was playing with him. How? he asked very pale. Yes, she has lovers in this very building. Moray found strength to smile. I don't think any more about her, my dear fellow. You can speak freely. 
Who are her lovers? Hutin, they say, and then the salesman in the lace department. Deloche, that tall, awkward fellow. I can't speak with certainty, never having seen them together. But it appears that it's notorious. There was a silence. Moret affected to arrange the papers on his desk, to conceal the trembling of his hands. At last he observed, without raising his head, "'We must have proofs. Try and bring me some proofs. As for me, I assure you I don't care in the least, for I am quite sick of her. But we can't allow such things to go on here.' Bordoncle simply replied, "'Never fear. You shall have proofs one of these days. I am keeping a good lookout.' This news deprived Moret of all rest. He no longer had the courage to return to this conversation, but lived in the continual expectation of a catastrophe, in which his heart would be crushed. And this torment rendered him terrible. The whole house trembled before him. He now disdained to conceal himself behind Bordoncle, but performed the executions in person, feeling a nervous desire for revenge, solacing himself by an abuse of his power, of that power which could do nothing for the contentment of his sole desire. Each one of his inspections became a massacre, his appearance caused a panic to run along from counter to counter. The dead winter season was just then approaching, and he made a clean sweep in their departments, multiplying the victims and pushing them into the streets. His first idea had been to dismiss Rotard and Deloche. Then he had reflected that if he did not keep them, he would never discover anything, and the others suffered for them. The whole staff trembled. In the evening, when he found himself alone again, his eyes swelled up, big with tears. One day especially, terror reigned supreme. An inspector had the idea that Mignon was stealing— there were always a lot of strange-looking girls prowling around his counter, and one of them had just been arrested, her thighs and bosom padded with sixty pairs of gloves. From that moment a watch was kept, and the inspector caught Mignot in the act, facilitating the sleight of hand of a tall fair girl, formerly a saleswoman at the Louvre, but since gone wrong. The manoeuvre was very simple. He affected to try some gloves on her, waited till she had padded herself, and then conducted her to the pay-desk, where she paid for a single pair only. Moret happened to be there just at that moment. As a rule, he preferred not to mix himself up with these sort of adventures, which were pretty frequent, for notwithstanding the regular working of the well-arranged machine, great disorder reigned in certain departments of the ladies' paradise, and scarcely a week passed without some employee being dismissed for theft. The authorities preferred to hush up such matters as far as possible, considering it useless to set the police at work, and thus expose one of the fatal plague spots of these great bazaars. But, that day, Moret felt the real need of getting angry with someone, and he treated the handsome Mignon with such a violence, and the latter stood there, trembling with fear, his face pale and discomposed. "'I ought to call a policeman!' cried Moret, before all the other salesmen. "'But why don't you answer? Who is this woman? I swear I'll send for the police if you don't tell me the truth.' They had taken the woman away, and two saleswomen were undressing her. Mignot stammered out, I, I, "'I don't know her, sir. She's the one who came.' "'Don't tell lies,' interrupted Moret in a violent rage. "'And there's nobody here to warn us. You're all in the plot on my word.' We are in a regular wood, robbed, pillaged, plundered. It's enough to make us have the pockets of each one searched before going out. Murmurs were heard. The three or four customers buying gloves stood looking on, frightened. Silence, resumed he furiously, or I'll clear the place. But Bordoncle came running up, anxious at the idea of the scandal. He whispered a few words in Moray's air, the affair was assuming an exceptional gravity, and he prevailed on him to take Mignot into the inspector's office, a room on the ground floor near the entrance in the Rue Gaillot. The woman was there, quietly putting on her stace again. She had just mentioned Albert Lhomme's name. Mignot, again questioned, lost his head and commenced to sob. He wasn't in fault, it was Albert who sent him his mistresses. At first he had merely afforded them certain advantages, enabling them to profit by the bargains. 
Then, when they last took to stealing, he was already too far compromised to report the matter. The principals now discovered a series of extraordinary robberies, goods taken away by girls who went into the neighbouring water-closets, built near the refreshment bar and surrounded by evergreen plants, to hide the goods under their petticoats, purchases that a salesman neglected to call out at a pay-desk when he accompanied a customer there, the price of which he divided with the cashier, even down to false returns, articles which they announced as brought back to the house, pocketing the money thus repaid. Without even mentioning the classical robbery, parcels taken out under their coats in the evening, rolled round their bodies, and sometimes even hung down their legs. For the last fourteen months, thanks to Mignon and other salesmen, no doubt, whom they refused to name, this pilfering had been going on at Albert's desk, quite an impudent trait, for sums of which no one ever knew the exact total. Meanwhile, the news had spread into the various departments, causing the guilty consciences to tremble, and the most honest to quake at the general sweep that seemed imminent. Albert had disappeared into the inspector's office. Next his father had passed, choking, his face full of blood, showing signs of apoplexy. Madame Aurélie herself was then called, and she, her head high beneath the affront, had the fat, puffed-up appearance of a wax mask. The explanation lasted some time. No one knew the exact details, but it was said the first hand had slapped her son's face, and that the worthy old father wept, whilst the governor, contrary to all his elegant habits, swore like a trooper, absolutely wanting to deliver the offenders up to justice. However, the scandal was hushed up. Mignon was the only one dismissed there and then. Albert did not disappear till two days later. No doubt his mother had begged that the family should not be dishonoured by an immediate execution. But the panic lasted several days longer, for after this scene Moray had wandered from one end of the establishment to the other with a terrible expression, venting his anger on all those who dared even to raise their eyes. "'What are you doing there, sir? Looking at the flies? Go and be paid!' At last the storm burst one day on the head of Houtin himself. Favier, appointed second-hand, was undermining the first-hand in order to dislodge him from his position. This was always the way. He addressed crafty reports to the directors, taking advantage of every occasion to have the first-hand caught doing something wrong. Thus, one morning, as Moret was going through the silk department, he stopped. Surprised to see Favier engaged in altering the price tickets of a stock of black velvet. Why are you lowering the prices? asked he. Who gave you the order to do so? The second hand, who was making a great noise over this work, as if he wished to attract the governor's attention, foreseeing the result, replied with an innocent, surprised air. Why, Monsieur Hautin told me, sir. Monsieur Hautin? Where is Monsieur Hautin? And when the latter came upstairs, called by a salesman, an animated explanation ensued. What? He undertook to lower the prices himself now. But he appeared greatly astonished in his turn, having merely talked over the matter with Favier, without giving any positive orders. The latter then assumed the sorrowful air of an employee who finds himself obliged to contradict his superior. However, he was quite willing to accept the blame, if it would get the latter out of a scrape things began to look very bad. "'Understand, Monsieur Houtin,' cried Moret, "'I have never tolerated these attempts at independence. We alone decide about the prices.' He continued with a sharp voice and wounding intentions, which surprised the salesman, for as a rule these discussions were carried on quietly, and the case might really have resulted from a misunderstanding. One could feel he had some unavowed spite to satisfy. He had at last caught that Houtin at fault, that Houtin who was said to be Denise's lover. He could now solace himself by making him feel that he was the master. And he exaggerated matters, even insinuating that this reduction of price appeared to conceal very questionable intentions. Sir, repeated Houtin, I meant to consult you about it. It is really necessary, as you know, for these velvets have not succeeded. Moret cut him short with a final insult. "'Very good, sir. We will look into the matter. But don't do such a thing again, if you value your place.' And he walked off. 
Houtin, bewildered, furious, finding no one but Favier to confide in, swore he would go and throw his resignation at the brute's head. But he soon left off talking of going away, and began to stir up all the abominable accusations which were current amongst the salesmen against their chiefs. And Favier, his eyes sparkling, defended himself with a great show of sympathy. He was obliged to reply, wasn't he? Besides, could any one have foreseen such a row for so trifling a matter? What had come to the governor lately that he should be so unbearable? We all know what's the matter with him, replied Houtin. Is it my fault if that little jade in the dress department is turning his head? My dear fellow, you can see the blow comes from there. He's aware I've slept with her and he doesn't like it. Or perhaps it's she herself who wants to get me pitched out because I'm in her way. But I swear she shall hear from me if she ever crosses my path. Two days later, as Sotar was going up into the workroom, upstairs, under the roof, to recommend a person, he started on perceiving at the end of a passage Denise and Deloche leaning out of a window, and plunged so deeply in private conversation that they did not even turn round. The idea of having them caught occurred to him suddenly, when he perceived with astonishment that Deloche was weeping. He at once went away without making any noise, and meeting Bourdoncle and Jove on the stairs, told them some story about one of the extincters the door of which seemed to be broken. In this way they would go upstairs and drop on the two others. Bourdoncle discovered them first. He stopped short, and told Jove to go and fetch the governor whilst he remained there. The inspector had to obey, greatly annoyed at being forced to compromise himself in such a matter. This was a lost corner of the vast world in which the people of the ladies' paradise worked. One arrived there by a complication of stairs and passages. The workrooms occupied the top of the house, a succession of low sloping rooms, lighted by large windows cut in the zinc roof, furnished solely with long tables and enormous iron stoves, and right along were a crowd of work girls of all sorts, for the underclothing, the lace, the dressmaking, and the house furnishing living winter and summer in a stifling heat, amidst the odour special to the business. And one had to go straight through the wing, and turn to the right on passing the dressmakers, before coming to this solitary end of the corridor. The rare customers that a salesman occasionally brought here for an order, gasped for breath, tired out, frightened with the sensation of having been turning round for hours and hours, and of being a hundred leagues above the street. The niece had often found Deloche waiting for her. As second-hand, she had a charge of the arrangements between her department and the workroom where only the models and alterations were done, and was always going up and down to give the necessary orders. He watched for her, inventing any pretext to run after her. Then he affected to be surprised when he met her at the workroom door. She got to laugh about the matter. It became quite an understood thing. The corridor ran alongside the cistern, an enormous iron tank containing twelve thousand gallons of water, and there was another one of equal size on the roof, reached by an iron ladder. For an instant, Deloche would stand talking, leaning with one shoulder against the cistern in the continual abandonment of his long body, bent with fatigue. The noise of the water was heard, a mysterious noise of which the iron tank ever retained the musical vibration. Notwithstanding the deep silence, the niece would turn round anxiously, thinking she had seen a shadow pass on the bare, yellow-painted walls. But the window would soon attract them, they would lean out and forget themselves in a pleasant gossip, in endless souvenirs of their native place. Below them extended the immense glass roof of the central gallery, a lake of glass bounded by the distant housetops, like a rocky coast. Beyond, they saw nothing but the sky, a sheet of sky, which reflected in the sleeping water of the glazed work the flight of its clouds and the tender blue of its azure. It so happened that Deloche was speaking of Valonia that day. I was six years old. My mother took me to Valonia market in a cart. You know it's ten miles away. We had to leave Bricquebec at five o'clock. It's a fine country down our way. Do you know it? "'Yes, yes,' replied Denise, slowly, her looks lost in the distance. "'I was there once, but was very little then. 
Nice roads, with grass on each side, aren't there? And now and again sheep browsing in couples, dragging their clog along by the rope. She stopped, then resumed with a vague smile. Our roads run as straight as an arrow for miles between rows of trees, which afford a lot of shade. We have meadows surrounded with hedges taller than I am, where there are horses and cows feeding. We have a little river, and the water is very cold, under the brushwood, in a spot I know well. It is the same with us, exactly, cried Deloche, delighted. There's grass everywhere, each one encloses his plot with thorns and elms, and is at once at home, and it's quite green, a green far different to what we see in Paris. Dear me! What fun I've had at the bottom of the road, to the left, coming down from the mill. And their voices died away. They stopped with their eyes fixed and lost on the sunny lake of the glazed work. A mirage rose up before them from this blinding water. They saw an endless succession of meadows, the cotton tar bathed in the balmy breath of the ocean, a luminous vapour which melted the horizon into a delicate pearly grey. Below, under the colossal iron framework in the silk hall, roared the business, the trepidation of the machine at work. The entire house vibrated with the trampling of the crowd, the bustle of the shopmen, and the life of the thirty thousand persons elbowing each other there. And they, carried away by their dreams, on feeling this profound and dull clamour with which the roofs were resounding, thought they heard the wind passing over the grass, shaking the tall trees. "'Ah, Madame Denise,' stammered Deloche, "'why aren't you kinder to me? I love you so much!' Tears had come into his eyes, and as she tried to interrupt him with a gesture, he continued quickly, "'No, let me tell you these things once more. We should get on so well together. People always find something to talk about when they come from the same place.' He was choking, and she at last managed to say kindly, "'You're not reasonable. You promised me never to speak of that again. It's impossible. I have a good friendship for you, because you're a nice fellow, but I wish to remain free.' "'Yes, yes, I know it,' replied he in a broken voice. "'You don't love me. Oh, you may say so, I quite understand it. There's nothing in me to make you love me.' "'Listen, I've only had one sweet moment in my life, "'and that was when I met you at Joinville. "'Do you remember? "'For a moment under the trees, "'when it was so dark, I thought your arm trembled "'and was stupid enough to imagine if—' "'But she again interrupted him. "'Her quick air had just caught Bordoncle "'and Jove's step at the end of the corridor. "'Hark, there's someone coming.' "'No,' said he, preventing her leaving the window. It's in the cistern. All sorts of extraordinary noises come up from it, as if there was someone inside. And he continued his timid, caressing complaints. She was no longer listening to him, rocked into dreamland by this declaration of love, her looks wandering over the roofs of the ladies' paradise. To the right and the left of the glazed gallery, other galleries, other halls, were glistening in the sun, between the tops of the houses, pierced with windows, and running along symmetrically, like the wings of a barracks. Immense metallic works rose up, ladders, bridges, describing a lacework of iron in the air, whilst the kitchen chimneys threw out an immense volume of smoke like a factory, and the great square cistern, supported in the air on wrought iron pillars, assumed a strange, barbarous profile, hoisted up to this height by the pride of one man. In the distance, Paris was roaring. When Denise returned from this dreamy state, from this fanciful development of the ladies' paradise, in which her thoughts floated as in a vast solitude, she found that the loche had seized her hand, and he appeared so woe-begone, so full of grief, that she had not a heart to draw it away. "'Forgive me,' he murmured. "'It's all over now. I should be quite too miserable if you punished me by withdrawing your friendship.' I assure you, I intended to say something else. Yes, I had determined to understand the situation and be very good. His tears again began to flow. He tried to steady his voice. For I know my lot in life. It is too late for my luck to turn. Beaten at home, beaten in Paris, beaten everywhere. I've now been here for four years and I'm still the last in the department. 
so I wanted to tell you not to trouble on my account. I won't annoy you any longer. Try to be happy. Love someone else. Yes, that would really be a pleasure for me. If you are happy, I shall be also. That will be my happiness. He could say no more. As if to seal his promise, he raised the young girl's hand to his lips, kissing it with the humble kiss of a slave. She was deeply affected, and said simply in a tender sisterly tone, which attenuated somewhat the pity of the words, "'My poor boy!' But they started and turned round. Moret was standing before them. For the last ten minutes, Jove had been searching for the governor all over the place, but the latter was looking at the works going on for the new façade in the Rue de Dix de Sambre. He spent long hours there every day, trying to interest himself in this work, of which he had so long dreamed. This was his refuge against his torments, amidst the masons laying the immense cornerstones and the engineers setting up the great iron framework. The façade already appeared above the level of the street, indicating the vast porch, and the windows of the first story, a palace-like development in its crude state. He scaled the lattice, discussing with the architect the ornamentation which was to be something quite new, scrambled over the heaps of brick and iron, and even went down into the cellar. And the roar of the steam engine, the tick-tack of the trowels, the noise of the hammers, the clamour of this people of workmen, all over this immense cage surrounded by sonorous planks, really distracted him for an instant. He came out white with plaster, black with iron filings, his feet splashed by the water from the pumps, his pain so far from being cured that his anguish returned and his heart beat stronger than ever. As the noise of the works died away behind him, it so happened, on the day in question, a slight distraction had restored him his gaiety, and he was deeply interested in an album of drawings of the mosaics and enameled terracottas, which were to decorate the friezes. When Jove came up to fetch him, out of breath, annoyed at being obliged to dirty his coat amongst all this building material. At first Moret had cried out that they must wait. Then, at a word spoken in a low tone by the inspector, he had immediately followed him, shivering, a prey again to his passion. Nothing else existed, the façade crumbled away before being built. What was the use of this supreme triumph of his pride if the simple name of a woman whispered in his ear tortured him to this extent? Upstairs, Bordoncle and Jove thought it prudent to vanish. The Loche had already run away. Denise alone remained to face Moret, paler than usual, but looking straight into his eyes. "'Have the kindness to follow me, mademoiselle,' said he in a harsh voice. She followed him. They descended the two stories and crossed the furniture and carpet departments without saying a word. When he arrived at his office, he opened the door wide, saying, "'Walk in, mademoiselle.' And, closing the door, he went to his desk. The new director's office was fitted up more luxuriously than the old one. The reps hanging had been replaced by velvet ones, and a bookcase, encrusted with ivory, occupied one whole side." but on the walls there was still no picture but the portrait of Madame Hedouin, a young woman with a handsome calm face, smiling in its gold frame. "'Mademoiselle,' said he at last, trying to maintain a cold, severe air, "'there are certain things that we cannot tolerate. Good conduct is absolutely necessary here.' He stopped, choosing his words, in order not to yield to the furious anger which was rising up within him. What? She loved this fellow, this miserable salesman, the laughing-stock of his counter. And it was the humblest, the most awkward of all that she preferred to him, the master. For he had seen them, she leaving her hand in his, and he covering that hand with kisses. I have been very good to you, mademoiselle, continued he, making a fresh effort. I little expected to be rewarded in this way. Denise, immediately on entering, had been attracted by Madame Hedouin's portrait, and, notwithstanding her great trouble, was still preoccupied by it. Every time she came into the director's office, her eyes were sure to meet those of this lady. She felt almost afraid of her, although she knew her to have been very good. This time, she felt her to be a protection. "'You are right, sir,' she said softly. 
I was wrong to stop and talk, and I beg your pardon for doing so. This young man comes from my part of the country. I'll dismiss him, cried Moret, putting all his suffering into this furious cry, and, completely overcome, entirely forgetting his position as a director lecturing a saleswoman guilty of an infraction of the rules, he broke out into a torrent of violent words. Had she no shame in her, a young girl like her abandoning herself to such a being, and he even made the most atrocious accusations, introducing Houtard's name into the affair, and then others, in such a flood of words, that she could not even defend herself. But he would make a clean sweep and kick them all out. The severe explanation he had promised himself when following Jove had degenerated into the shameful violence of a scene of jealousy. "'Yes, your lovers! They told me about it, and I was stupid enough to doubt it. But I was the only one! I was the only one!' End of chapter 12, part 2section twenty nine of the ladies paradise by emile zola translated by ernest alfred vizitelli this librivox recording is in the public domain read by christine g chapter twelve part three denise suffocating bewildered stood listening to these frightful charges which she had not at first understood did he really suppose her to be as bad as this at another remark harsher than all the rest she silently turned towards the door, and, in reply to a movement he made to stop her, said, "'Let me alone, sir. I am going away. If you think me what you said, I will not remain in the house another second. But he rushed in front of the door, exclaiming, "'Why don't you defend yourself? Say something!' She stood there very stiff, maintaining an icy silence. For a long time he pressed her with questions, with a growing anxiety, and the mute dignity of this innocent girl once more appeared to be the artful calculation of a woman learned in all the tactics of passion. She could not have played a better game calculating to bring him to her feet, tortured by doubt, desirous of being convinced. "'Come, you say he is from your part of the country. Perhaps you've met there formerly.' "'Swear that there has been nothing between you and this fellow.' "'And as she obstinately remained silent, "'as if still wishing to open the door and go away, "'he completely lost his head "'and broke out into a supreme explosion of grief. "'Good heavens! I love you! I love you! "'Why do you delight in tormenting me like this? "'You can see that nothing else exists, "'that the people of whom I speak only touch me through you, "'and you alone can occupy my thoughts.' Thinking you were jealous, I gave up all my pleasures. You were told I had mistresses. Well, I have them no longer. I hardly set foot outside. Did I not prefer you at that lady's house? Have I not broken with her to belong solely to you? And I am still waiting for a word of thanks, a little gratitude. And if you fear that I should return to her, you may feel quite easy. She is avenging herself by helping one of our former salesmen to found a rival establishment. Tell me, must I go on my knees to touch your heart? He had come to this. He, who did not tolerate the slightest peccadillo with the shop women, who turned them out for the least caprice, found himself reduced to imploring one of them not to go away, not to abandon him in his misery. He held the door against her, ready to forgive her everything, to shut his eyes if she merely deigned to lie. And it was true. He had got thoroughly sick of girls picked up at theatres and night-houses. He had long since given up Clara, and now ceased to visit at Madame de Forge's house, where Boutemont reigned supreme, while waiting for the opening of the new shop, the Four Seasons, which was already filling the newspapers with its advertisements. "'Must I go on my knees?' repeated he, almost choked by suppressed tears. She stopped him, herself quite unable to conceal her emotion, deeply affected by this suffering passion. "'You are wrong, sir, to agitate yourself in this way,' replied she at last. "'I assure you that all these wicked reports are untrue. This poor fellow you have just seen is no more guilty than I am.' She said this with her brave, frank air, looking with her bright eyes straight into his face. "'Very good.' I believe you, 
murmured he. I'll not dismiss any of your comrades, since you take all these people under your protection. But why, then, do you repulse me if you love no one else? A sudden constraint, an anxious bashfulness seized the young girl. You love someone, don't you? resumed he in a trembling voice. Oh, you may speak out. I have no claim on your affections. Do you love any one? She turned very red. Her heart was in her mouth, and she felt all falsehood impossible before this emotion which was betraying her, this repugnance for a life which made the truth appear in her face in spite of all. Yes, she at last confessed feebly. But I beg you to let me go away, sir. You are torturing me. She was now suffering in her turn. Was it not enough to have to defend herself against him? Was she to be obliged to fight against herself, against the breath of tenderness which sometimes took away all her courage? When he spoke to her thus, when she saw him so full of emotion, so overcome, she hardly knew why she still refused. And it was only afterwards that she found, in the depths of her healthy, girlish nature, the pride and the prudence which maintained her intact in her virtuous resolution. It was by a sort of instinct of happiness that she still remained so obstinate to satisfy her need of a quiet life, and not from any idea of virtue. She would have fallen into this man's arms, her heart seduced, her flesh overpowered, if she had not experienced a sort of revolt, almost a feeling of repulsion before the definite bestowal of her being, ignorant of her future fate. The lover made her afraid, inspiring her with that fear that all women feel at the approach of the male. Moret gave way to a gesture of gloomy discouragement. He could not understand her. He turned towards his desk, took up some papers, and then laid them down again, saying, "'I will retain you no longer, mademoiselle. I cannot keep you against your will.' "'But I don't wish to go away,' replied she, smiling. If you believe me to be innocent, I will remain. One ought always to believe a woman to be virtuous, sir. There are numbers who are so, I assure you. Denise's eyes had involuntarily wandered towards Madame Hedouin's portrait, that lady so wise and so beautiful, whose blood, they said, had brought good fortune to the house. Moret followed the young girl's look with a start, for he thought he heard his dead wife pronounce this phrase, one of her own sayings which he had once recognised. And it was like a resurrection. He discovered in Denise the good sense, the just equilibrium of her he had lost, even down to the gentle voice, sparing of useless words. He was struck by this resemblance, which rendered him sadder still. "'You know I am yours,' murmured he in conclusion. "'Do what you like with me.' Then she resumed gaily, that is right, sir. The advice of a woman, however humble she may be, is always worth listening to when she has a little intelligence. If you put yourself in my hands, be sure I'll make nothing but a good man of you. She smiled, with that simple unassuming air which had such a charm. He also smiled in a feeble way, and escorted her as far as the door, as he would a lady. The next day Denise was appointed first hand, the dress and costume department was divided, the management creating especially for her one for children's costumes, which was installed close to the ready-made one. Since her son's dismissal, Madame Aurélie had been trembling, for she found the directors getting cool towards her, and saw the young girl's power increasing daily. Would they not shortly sacrifice her in favour of this latter, by taking advantage of the first pretext? Her emperor's masked, puffed up with fat, seemed to have got thinner from the shame which now stained the whole Lom dynasty, and she made a show of going away every evening on her husband's arm, for they were brought nearer together by the misfortune, and felt vaguely that the evil came from the disorder of their home, whilst the poor old man, more affected than her, in a sickly fear of being himself suspected of robbery, counted over the receipts, again and again, noisily performing miracles with his amputated arm, so that, when she saw Denise appointed first hand in the children's costume department, she experienced such a joy that she paraded the most affectionate feelings towards the young girl, 
really grateful to her for not having taken her place away. And she overwhelmed her with attentions, treating her as an equal, often going to talk to her in the neighbouring department, with a stately air, like a queen mother paying a visit to a young queen. In fact, Denise was now at the summit. Her appointment as first hand had destroyed the last resistance. If some still babbled, from that itching of the tongue which ravages every assemblage of men and women, they bowed very low before her face. Marguerite, now second hand, was full of praise for her. Clara herself, inspired with a secret respect before this good fortune, which she felt herself incapable of achieving, had bowed her head. But Denise's victory was more complete still over the gentleman, over Jove, who now bent almost double whenever he addressed her, over Houtin, seized by anxiety on feeling his position giving way under him, and over Bordoncle, reduced at last to powerlessness. When the latter saw her coming out of the director's office, smiling, with a quiet air, and that the next day Moret had insisted on the board creating this new department, he had yielded, vanquished by a sacred terror of woman. He had always given in thus before Moret, recognising him to be his master, notwithstanding his escapades and his idiotic love affairs. This time the woman had proved the stronger, and he was expecting to be swept away by the disaster. However, Denise bore her triumph in a peaceable, charming manner, happy at these marks of consideration, even affecting to see in them a sympathy for the miseries of her debut and the final success of her patient carriage. Thus she received with a laughing joy the slightest marks of friendship, and this caused her to be really loved by some. She was so kind, sympathetic, and full of affection. The only person for whom she still showed an invincible repugnance was Clara, having learned that this girl had amused herself by taking Columban home with her one night, as she had said she would do for a joke, and he, carried away by his passion, was becoming more dissipated every day, whilst poor Genevieve was slowly dying. The adventure was talked of at the lady's paradise, and thought very droll. But this trouble, the only one she had outside, did not in any way change Denise's equable temper. It was especially in her department that she was seen at her best, in the midst of her little world of babies of all ages. She was passionately fond of children, and she could not have been placed in a better position. Sometimes there were fully fifty girls, and as many boys there, quite a turbulent school, let loose in their growing coquettish desires. The mothers completely lost their heads. She, conciliating, smiling, had the little ones placed in a line, on chairs, and when there happened to be amongst a number a rosy-cheeked little angel whose pretty face tempted her, she would insist on serving her herself, bringing the dress and trying it on the child's dimpled shoulders with the tender precaution of an elder sister. There were fits of laughter, cries of joys, amidst the scolding voices of the mothers. Sometimes the little girl, already a grand lady, nine or ten years old, having a cloth jacket to try on, would stand studying it before a glass, turning round with an absorbed air, her eyes sparkling with a desire to please. The counters were encumbered with the things unpacked, dresses in pink and blue Asian linen for children of from one to five years, blue sailor costumes with plaited skirt and blouse, trimmed with fine cambric muslin, Louis the Fifteenth costumes, mantles, jackets, a pell-mell of narrow garments, stiffened in their infantine grace. Something like the cloakroom of a regiment of big dolls, taken out of the wardrobes and given up to pillage. Denise had always a few sweets in her pockets, to appease the tears of some youngster in despair at not being able to carry off a pair of red trousers, and she lived there among these little ones, as in her own family, feeling quite young again herself, from the contact of all this innocence and freshness incessantly renewed around her skirts. She now had frequent friendly conversations with Moret. When she went to the office to take orders and furnish information, he kept her talking, enjoying the sound of her voice. It was what she laughingly called, making a good man of him. In her prudent, cautious Norman head, there sprang up all sorts of projects, ideas about the new business which she had already ventured to hint at when at Robinot's, and some of which she had expressed on the evening of their walk in the Tuileries gardens. 
she could not be occupied in any matter, see any work going on, without being moved with a desire to introduce some improvement in the mechanism. Then, since her entries into the ladies' paradise, she was especially pained by the precarious position of the employees. The sudden dismissals shocked her, she thought them iniquitous and stupid, hurtful to all, to the house as much as to the staff. Her former sufferings were still fresh in her mind, and her heart was seized with pity every time she saw a newcomer, her feet bruised, her eyes dim with tears, dragging herself along in her misery in her silk dress amidst the spiteful persecution of the old hands. This dog's life made the best of them bad, and the sad work of destruction commenced, all eaten up by the trade before the age of forty, disappearing, falling into unknown places, a great many dying in harness, some of consumption and exhaustion, others of fatigue and bad air, a few thrown on the street, the happiest married, buried in some little provincial shop. Was it humane, was it just, this frightful consumption of human life that the big shops carried on every year? And she pleaded the course of the wheelwork of the colossal machine, not from any sentimental reasons, but by arguments appealing to the very interests of the employers. To make a machine solid and strong, it is necessary to use good iron. If the iron breaks or is broken, there is a stoppage of work, repeated expenses of starting, quite a loss of power. Sometimes she would become quite animated. She would picture an immense ideal bazaar, the phalansterium of modern commerce, in which each one should have his exact share of the profits, according to his merits, with the certainty of the future, assured to him by a contract. Moret would feel amused at this, notwithstanding his fever. He accused her of socialism, embarrassed her by pointing out the difficulties of carrying out these schemes. For she spoke in the simplicity of her soul, bravely trusting in the future, when she perceived a dangerous hole underlying her tender-hearted plans. He was, however, shaken, captivated by this young voice, still trembling from the evils endured, so convinced and earnest in pointing out the reforms which would tend to consolidate the house. Yet he listened while joking with her. The salesman's position gradually improved. The wholesale dismissals were replaced by a system of holidays granted during the dead seasons, and there was also about to be created a sort of benefit club, which would protect the employees against bad times and ensure them a pension. It was the embryo of the vast traders' unions of the twentieth century. Denise did not confine her attention solely to healing the wounds from which she had herself bled. She conceived various delicate feminine ideas, which, communicated to Moret, delighted the customers. She also caused Lhomme's happiness by supporting a scheme he had long nourished, that of creating a band of music, in which all the executants should be chosen from amongst the staff. Three months later, Lhomme had a hundred and twenty musicians under his direction, the dream of his whole life was realised, and a grand fete was given on the premises, a concert and a ball, to introduce the band of the ladies' paradise to the customers and the whole world. The newspapers took the matter up. Bordoncle himself, frightened by these innovations, was obliged to bow before this immense advertisement. Afterwards, a recreation room for the men was established, with two billiard tables and backgammon and chessboards. Then classes were held in the house of an evening. There were lessons in English and German, in grammar, arithmetic, and geography. They even had lessons in riding and fencing. A library was formed, ten thousand volumes were placed at the disposal of the employees. And a resident doctor giving consultations gratis was also added, together with baths and hairdressing and refreshment saloons. Every want in life was provided for, everything was to be obtained without going outside. Board, lodging and clothing. The ladies' paradise sufficed entirely for all its own wants and pleasures, in the very heart of Paris, taken up by all this clatter, by this working city which was springing up so vigorously out of the ruins of the old streets, at last opened to the race of the sun. Then a fresh movement of opinion took place in Denise's favour. 
as Bordoncle, vanquished, repeated with despair to his friends that he would give a great deal to put Denise into Moray's arms himself, it was concluded that she had not yielded, that her all-powerfulness resulted from her refusal. From that moment she became immensely popular. They knew for what indulgences they were indebted to her, and they admired her for the force of her will. There was one, at least, who could master the governor, who avenged all the others, and knew how to get something else besides promises out of him. So she had come at last, she who was to make him treat the poor devils with a little respect. When she went through the shop, with her delicate, self-willed head, her tender, invincible air, the salesman smiled at her, were proud of her, and would willingly have exhibited her to the crowd. Denise, in her happiness, allowed herself to be carried along by this increasing sympathy. Was it all possible? She saw herself arrive in a poor dress, frightened, lost amidst the mechanism of the terrible machine. For a long time she had had the sensation of being nothing, hardly a grain of seed beneath these millstones which were crushing a whole world. And now today she was the very soul of this world— she alone was of consequence able at a word to increase or slacken the pace of the colossus lying at her feet and yet she had not wished for these things she had simply presented herself without calculation with the sole charm of her sweetness her sovereignty sometimes caused her an uneasy surprise why did they all obey her she was not pretty she did nothing wrong then she smiled her heart at rest feeling within herself nothing but goodness and prudence, a love of truth and logic which constituted all of her strength. One of Denise's greatest joys was to be able to assist Pauline. The latter, being about to become a mother, was trembling, aware that two other saleswomen in the same condition had been sent away. The principals did not tolerate these accidents, maternity being suppressed as cumbersome and indecent. They occasionally allowed marriage, but would admit of no children. Pauline had, it was true, her husband in the house, but still she felt anxious, it being almost impossible for her to appear at the counter, and in order to postpone a probable dismissal, she laced herself very tightly, resolved to conceal her state as long as she could. One of the two saleswomen who had been dismissed had just been delivered of a stillborn child, through having laced herself up in this way, and it was not certain that she herself would recover. Meanwhile, Bordoncle had observed that Pauline's complexion was getting very livid, and that she had a painfully stiff way of walking. One morning he was standing near her, in the underlinen department, when a messenger, taking away a bundle, ran up against her with such force that she cried out in pain. Bordoncle immediately took her on one side, made her confess, and submitted the question of her dismissal to the board, under the pretext that she stood in need of country air. The story of this accident would spread, and would have a disastrous effect on the public, if she should have a miscarriage, as had already taken place in the baby linen department the year before. Moret, who was not at the meeting, could only give his opinion in the evening. But Anise having had time to interfere, he closed Bordoncle's mouth, in the interest of the house itself. Did they wish to frighten the heads of families and the young mothers amongst their customers? And it was decided, with great pomp, that every married saleswoman should, when in the family way, be sent to a special midwife's as soon as her presence at the counter became offensive to the customers. The next day, when Denise went up into the infirmary to see Pauline, who had been obliged to take her bed on account of the blow she had received, the latter kissed her violently on both cheeks. "'How kind you are! Had it not been for you, I should have been turned away. Pray don't be anxious about me. The doctor says it's nothing.' Borge, who had slipped away from his department, was also there, on the other side of the bed. He likewise stammered his thanks, troubled before Denise, whom he now treated as an important person, of a superior class. "'Ah!' If he heard any more nasty remarks about her, he would soon close the mouths of the jealous ones. But Pauline sent him away with a good-natured shrug of the shoulders. "'My poor darling, you're always saying something stupid. Leave us to talk together.' 
The infirmary was a long, light room, containing twelve beds, with their white curtains. Those who did not wish to go home to their families were nursed here. But on the day in question, Pauline was the only occupant, in a bed near one of the large windows, which looked on to the Rue Nove Saint Augustine, and they immediately commenced to exchange whispered words, tender confidences, in a calm air, perfumed with a vague odour of lavender. So he does just what you wish him to. How cruel you are to make him suffer so. Come, just explain it to me, now I have ventured to approach the subject. Do you detest him? Pauline had retained hold of Denise's hand, as the latter sat near the bed, with her elbow on the bolster. And overcome by a sudden emotion, her cheeks invaded with colour, she had a moment of weakness at this direct and unexpected question. Her secret escaped her, she buried her head in the pillow, murmuring, I love him. Pauline was astonished. What? You love him? But it's very simple. Say yes. Denise, her face still concealed, replied, No, by an energetic shake of the head. And she did so simply because she loved him, without being able to explain the matter. No doubt it was ridiculous, but she felt like that. She could not change her nature. Her friend's surprise increased, and she at length asked, So it's all to make him marry you? At this the young girl sprung up, quite confused. Marry me? <laughs> no, oh, I assure you that I have never wished for anything of the kind. No, never has such an idea entered my head, and you know what a horror I have of all falsehood. Well, dear, resumed Pauline kindly, you couldn't have acted otherwise, if such had been your intention. All this must come to an end, and it is very certain that it can only finish by a marriage, as you won't let it be otherwise. I must tell you that every one has the same idea. Yes, they feel persuaded that you are riding the high horse, in order to make him take you to church. Dear me, what a funny girl you are! And she had to console Denise, who had again dropped her head onto the bolster, sobbing, declaring that she would certainly go away, since they attributed all sorts of things to her that had never crossed her mind. No doubt, when a man loved a woman, he ought to marry her. But she asked for nothing, she had made no calculations, she simply begged to be allowed to live quietly, with her joys and her sorrows, like other people. She would go away. At the same moment, Moray was going through the premises below. He had wanted to forget his thoughts by visiting the works once more. Several months had elapsed, the façade now reared its monumental lines behind the vast hoardings which concealed it from the public. Quite an army of decorators were at work, marble cutters, mosaic workers, and others. The central group above the door was being gilded, whilst on the acroteria were being fixed the pedestals destined to receive the statues of the manufacturing cities of France. From morning to night, in the Rue de Distesambre, lately open to the public, a crowd of idlers stood gaping about, their noses in the air, seeing nothing but preoccupied by the marvels that were related of this façade, the inauguration of which was going to revolutionise Paris. And it was on this feverish working ground, amidst the artists putting the finishing touches to the realisation of his dream commenced by the masons, that Moray felt more bitterly than ever the vanity of his fortune. The thought of Denise had suddenly arrested him, this thought which incessantly pierced him with a flame, like the shooting of an incurable pain. He had run away, unable to find a word of satisfaction, fearful lest he should show his tears, leaving behind him the disgust of his triumph. This façade, which was at last erected, seemed little in his eyes, very much like one of those walls of sand that children build, and it might have been extended from one end of the city to the other, elevated to the starry sky, yet it would not have filled the emptiness of his heart, that the yes of a mere child could alone fill. When Moray entered his office he was almost choking with sobs. What did she want? He dared not offer her money now, and the confused idea of a marriage presented itself amidst his young widower's revolts, and, in the debility of his powerlessness, his tears began to flow. 
he was very miserable. End of chapter 12, part 3section thirty of the ladies paradise by emile zola translated by ernest alfred visitelli this librivox recording is in the public domain read by christine g chapter thirteen part one one morning in november denise was giving her first orders in the department when the baudus servant came to tell her that mademoiselle genevieve had passed a very bad night and wished to see her cousin immediately for some time the young girl had been getting weaker and weaker and she had been obliged to take her to bed two days before say i am coming at once replied denise very anxious the blow which was finishing genevieve was columban's sudden disappearance at first chaffed by clara he had stopped out several nights then yielding to the mad desires of a quiet chaste fellow he had become her obedient slave and had not returned one monday but had simply sent a farewell letter to baudu written in the studied terms of a man about to commit suicide perhaps at the bottom of this passion there was also the crafty calculation of a fellow delighted at escaping a disastrous marriage the draper's business was in as bad a way as his betrothed the moment was propitious to break with them through any stupidity and every one cited him as an unfortunate victim of love. When Denise arrived at the old Elbeuf, Madame Baudu was there alone, sitting motionless behind the pay-desk, with her small white face, eaten up by anemia, silent and quiet in the cold, deserted shop. There were no assistants now. The servant dusted the shelves, and it was even a question of replacing her by a charwoman. A dreary cold fell from the ceiling, hours passed away without a customer coming to disturb the silence and the goods no longer touched became mustier and mustier every day what's the matter asked denise anxiously is genevieve in danger madame baudu did not reply at first her eyes filled with the tears then she stammered i don't know they don't tell me anything oh it's all over it's all over and she cast a sombre glance around the dark old shop, as if she felt her daughter and the shop disappearing together. The seventy thousand francs, produce of the sale of the Rambouillet property, had melted away in less than two years in this gulf of competition. In order to struggle against the ladies' paradise, which now kept men's clothes and materials for hunting in livery suits, the draper had made considerable sacrifices. At last he had been definitely crushed by the swanskin cloth and flannels sold by his rival, an assortment that had not its equal in the market. Little by little his debts had increased, and, as a last resource, he had resolved to mortgage the old building in the Rue de la Michaudière, where Finet, their ancestor, had founded the business. And it was now only a question of days. The crumbling away had commenced— the very ceilings seemed to fall down and turning into dust like an old worm-eaten structure carried away by the wind. "'Your uncle is upstairs,' resumed Madame Baudu in her broken voice. "'We stay with her two hours each. Someone must look out here. Oh, but only as a precaution, for to tell the truth.' Her gesture finished the phrase. They would have put the shutters up had it not been for their old commercial pride, which still propped them up in the presence of the neighbourhood. "'Well, I'll go up, aunt,' said Denise, whose heart was bleeding amidst this resigned despair that even the pieces of cloth themselves exhaled. "'Yes, you go upstairs quick, my girl. She's waiting for you. She's been asking for you all night. She has something to tell you.' But just at that moment, Baudu came down. The rising bile gave his yellow face a greenish tinge, and his eyes were bloodshot. He was still walking with the muffled step with which he had quitted the sick room, and murmured as if he might be heard upstairs. She's asleep. And, thoroughly worn out, he sat down on a chair, wiping his forehead with a mechanical gesture, puffing like a man who had just finished some hard work. A silence ensued, but at last he said to Denise, "'You'll see her presently. 
When she is sleeping, she seems to me to be all right again. There was again a silence. Face to face, the father and mother stood looking at each other. Then, in a half-whisper, he went over his grief again, naming no one, addressing no one directly. My head on the block, I wouldn't have believed it. He was the last one. I had brought him up as a son. If anyone had come and said to me, they'll take him away from you as well, he'll fall as well. I would have replied, impossible, it could not be. And he has fallen all the same. Ah, the scoundrel, he who was so well up in real business, who had all my ideas, and all for a young monkey, one of those dummies that parade at the windows of bad houses. No, really, it's enough to drive one mad. He shook his head. His eyes fell on the damp floor, worn away by generations of customers. Then he continued in a lower voice. There are moments when I feel myself the most culpable of all in our misfortune. Yes, it's my fault if our poor girl is upstairs devoured by fever. Ought not I to have married them at once, without yielding to my stupid pride, my obstinacy in refusing to leave them the house less prosperous than before? Had I done that, she would now have the man she loved, and perhaps their united youthful strength would have accomplished a miracle that I have failed to work. But I am an old fool, and saw through nothing. I didn't know that people fell ill over such things. Really, he was an extraordinary fellow, with such a gift for business and such probity, such simplicity of conduct, so orderly in every way. In short, my pupil... He raised his head, still defending his ideas, in the person of the shopman who had betrayed him. Denise could not bear to hear him accuse himself, and she told him so, carried away by her emotions, on seeing him so humble, with his eyes full of tears, he who used formerly to reign as absolute master. "'Uncle, pray don't apologise for him. He never loved Genevieve. He would have run away sooner if you had tried to hasten the marriage.' I have spoken to him myself about it. He was perfectly well aware that my cousin was suffering on his account, and you see that did not prevent him leaving. Ask aunt. Without opening her lips, Madame Baudu confirmed these words by a nod. The draper turned paler still, blinded by his tears. He stammered out, It must be in the blood. His father died last year through having led a dissolute life and he once more looked around the obscure shop, his eyes wandering from the empty counters to the full shelves, then resting on Madame Baudu, who was still at the pay-desk, waiting in vain for the customers who did not come. "'Come,' said he, "'it's all over. They've ruined our business, and now one of their hussies is killing our daughter.' No one spoke. The rolling of the vehicles, which occasionally shook the floor, passed like a funeral beating of drums in the still air, stifled under the low ceiling. Suddenly, amidst this gloomy sadness of the old, dying shop, could be heard several heavy knocks struck somewhere in the house. It was Genevieve, who had just awoke, and was knocking with a stick they had left near her bed. "'Let's go up at once,' said Baudu, rising with a start. "'Try and be cheerful. She mustn't know.' He himself rubbed his eyes to efface the trace of his tears. As soon as he had opened the door on the first story, they heard a frightened, feeble voice crying, "'I don't like to be left alone. Don't leave me. I'm afraid to be left alone.' Then, when she perceived Denise, Genevieve became calmer and smiled joyfully. "'You've come, then. Oh, how I've been longing to see you since yesterday. I thought you also had abandoned me.' It was a piteous sight. The young girl's room looked out onto the yard, a little room lighted by a livid light. At first her parents had put her in their own room, in the front, but the sight of the ladies' paradise opposite affected her so much that they had been obliged to bring her back to her own again. And there she lay, so very thin under the bedclothes, that one hardly suspected the form and existence of a human body. Her skinny arms, consumed by a burning fever, were in a perpetual movement of anxious, unconscious searching. 
whilst her black hair seemed thicker still, and to be eating up her poor face with its voracious vitality, the face in which was agonising the final degenerateness of a family sprung up in the shade, in this cellar of old commercial Paris. Denise, her heart bursting with pity, stood looking at her. She did not at first speak, for fear of giving way to tears. At last she murmured, "'I came at once. Can I be of any use to you? You asked for me. Would you like me to stay?' "'No, thanks. I don't want anything. I only wanted to embrace you.' Tears filled her eyes. Denise quickly leaned over and kissed her on both cheeks, trembling to feel on her lips the flame of those hollow cheeks. But Genevieve, stretching out her arms, seized and kept her in a desperate embrace. Then she looked towards her father. "'Would you like me to stay?' repeated Denise. "'Perhaps there is something I can do for you.' Genevieve's glance was still obstinately fixed on her father, who remained standing, with a stolid air, almost choking. He at last understood, and went away, without saying a word, and they heard his heavy footsteps on the stairs. "'Tell me, is he with that woman?' asked the sick girl immediately, seizing her cousin's hand and making her sit on the side of the bed. "'I want to know, and you are the only one can tell me. They're living together, aren't they?' Denise, surprised by these questions, stammered, and was obliged to confess the truth, the rumours that were current in the shop. Clara, tired of this fellow, who was getting a nuisance to her, had already broken with him, and Columban, desolate, was pursuing her everywhere, trying to obtain a meeting from time to time, with a sort of canine humility. They said that he was going to take a situation at the Grands Magazines du Louvre. "'If you still love him, he may return,' said Denise, "'to cheer the dying girl with this last hope. "'Get well quick. "'He will acknowledge his errors and marry you.' "'Genevieve interrupted her. "'She had listened with all her soul, "'with an intense passion that raised her in the bed, "'but she fell back almost immediately. "'No, I know it's all over.' I don't say anything, because I see Papa crying, and I don't wish to make Mamma worse than she is. But I am going, Denise, and if I called you last night, it was for fear of going off before the morning. And to think that he is not happy after all. And Denise, having remonstrated, assuring her that she was not so bad as all that, she cut her short again, suddenly throwing off the bedclothes, with a chaste gesture of a virgin who has nothing to conceal in death. Naked to the waist, she murmured, "'Look at me! Is it possible?' Trembling, Denise quitted the side of the bed, as if she feared to destroy this fearful nudity with a breath. It was the last of the flesh, a bride's body used up by waiting, returned to the first infantile slimness of her young days. Genevieve slowly covered herself up again, saying, "'You see, I am no longer a woman.' It would be wrong to wish for him still. There was a silence. Both continued to look at each other, unable to find a word to say. It was Genevieve who resumed. Come, don't stay any longer. You have your own affairs to look after. And thanks, I was tormented by the wish to know, and am now satisfied. If you see him, tell him I forgive him. Adieu, dear Denise. Kiss me once more for it's the last time. The young girl kissed her, protesting. No, no, don't despair. All you want is loving care, nothing more. But the sick girl, shaking her head in an obstinate way, smiled, quite sure of what she said. And as her cousin was making for the door, she exclaimed, Wait a minute. Knock with the stick, so that papa may come up. I'm afraid to stay alone. Then, when Baudu arrived in that small, gloomy room, where he spent hours seated on a chair, she assumed an air of gaiety, saying to Denise, "'Don't come to-morrow. I would rather not. But on Sunday I shall expect you. You can spend the afternoon with me.' 
The next morning, at six o'clock, Genevieve expired after four hours' fearful agony. The funeral took place on a Saturday, a fearfully black, gloomy day, under a sooty sky which hung over the shivering city. The old Elbeuf, hung with white linen, lighted up the street with a bright spot, and the candles burning in the fading day seemed so many stars drowned in the twilight. The coffin was covered with wreaths and bouquets of white roses. It was a narrow child's coffin, placed in the obscure passage of the house on a level with the pavement, so near the gutter that the passing carriages had already splashed the coverings. The whole neighbourhood exhaled a dampness, a cellar-like mouldy odour, with its continual rush of pedestrians on the muddy pavement. At nine o'clock Denise came over to stay with her aunt, but as the funeral was starting, the latter, who had ceased weeping, her eyes burnt with tears, begged her to follow the body and look after her uncle, whose mute affliction and almost idiotic grief filled the family with anxiety. Below, the young girl found the street full of people, for the small traders in the neighbourhood were anxious to show the bow a mark of sympathy, and in this eagerness there was also a sort of manifestation against the lady's paradise, whom they accused of causing Genevieve's slow agony. All the victims of the monster were there, Bedore and his sister from the Hosier's shop in the Rue Gaillon, Van Pouli brothers, and Desligniere, the toy man, and Pion and Revoir, the furniture dealers, even Mademoiselle Tati from the underclothing shop, and the glover, Kinette, long since cleared off by bankruptcy, had made it a duty to come, the one from Batignol, the other from Bastille, where they had been obliged to take situations. Whilst waiting for the hearse, which was late, these people, tramping about in the mud, cast glances of hatred towards the ladies' paradise, the bright windows and gay displays of which seemed an insult in face of the old Elbeuf, which, with its funeral trappings and glimmering candles, cast a gloom over the other side of the street. A few curious faces appeared at the plate-glass windows, but the colossus maintained the indifference of a machine going at full speed, unconscious of the deaths it may cause on the road. Denise looked around for her brother Jean, whom she at last perceived standing before Bourras' shop, and she went and asked him to walk with his uncle, to assist him if he could not get along. For the last few weeks Jean had been very grave, as if tormented by some worry. Today, buttoned up in his black frock-coat, a full-grown man, earning his twenty francs a day, he seemed so dignified and so sad that his sister was surprised, for she had no idea he loved his cousin so much as that. Desirous of sparing Pepe this needless grief, she had left him with Madame Gras, intending to go and fetch him in the afternoon to see his uncle and aunt. The hearse had still not arrived, and Denise, greatly affected, was watching the candles burn, when she was startled by a well-known voice behind her. It was Bourras. He had called the chestnut seller opposite, in his little box, against the public-house, and said to him, "'I say, Vigreux, just keep a lookout for me a bit, will you? You see I've closed the door. If anyone comes, tell them to call again. But don't let that disturb you. No one will come.' Then he took his stand on the pavement, waiting like the others. Denise, feeling rather awkward, glanced at his shop. He entirely abandoned it now. There was nothing left but a disorderly array of umbrellas eaten up by the damp air, and canes blackened by the gas. The embellishments that he had made, the delicate green paintwork, the glasses, the gilded sign, were all cracking, already getting dirty, presenting that rapid and lamentable decrepitude of false luxury laid over ruins. But though the old crevices were reappearing, though the spots of damp had sprung up over the gildings, the house still held its ground obstinately, hanging on to the flanks of the lady's paradise like a dishonouring wart, which, although cracked and rotten, refused to fall off. Ah, the scoundrels, growled Bourras, they won't even let her be carried away. The hearse, which had at last arrived, 
had just got into collision with one of the ladies' paradise vans, shedding in the mist its starry radiance with the rapid trot of two superb horses. And the old man cast on Denise an oblique glance, lightened up under his bushy eyebrows. Slowly the funeral started off, splashing through the muddy pools, amid the silence of the omnibuses and carriages suddenly pulled up. On the coffin, draped with white, crossed the Place Gaillon, the sombre looks of the cortege were once more plunged into the windows of the big shop, where two saleswomen alone had run up to look on, pleased at this distraction. Baudu followed the hearse with a heavy mechanical step, refusing by a sign the arm offered by Jean, who was walking with him. Then, after a long string of people, came three mourning coaches. As they passed the Rue Neuve de Petit Chance, Robineau ran out to join the cortege, very pale and looking much older. At Saint Roche, a great many women were waiting, the small traders of the neighborhood, who had been afraid of the crowd at the house. The manifestation was developing into quite a riot, and when, after the service, the procession started off back, all the men followed, although it was a longer walk back from Rue Saint Honore to the Montmartre cemetery. They had to go up the Rue Saint Roche and once more pass the Ladies' Paradise. It was a sort of obsession. This poor young girl's body was paraded round the big shop like the first victim fallen in time of revolution. At the door, some red flannels were flapping like so many flags and a display of carpets blazed forth in a fluorescence of enormous roses and full-blown peonies. Denise had got into one of the coaches, being agitated by some smarting doubts, her heart oppressed by such a feeling of grief that she had not the strength to walk. At that moment there was a stop, in the Rue de Dix Décembre, before the scaffolding of the new façade which still obstructed the thoroughfare and the young girl observed old Bourras, left behind, dragging along with difficulty, close to the wheels of the coach in which she was riding alone. He would never get as far as the cemetery, she thought. He raised his head, looked at her, and all at once got into the coach. "'It's my confounded niece!' exclaimed he. "'Don't draw back! Is it you that we detest?' She felt him to be friendly and furious as in former days. He grumbled, declared that Baudu must be fearfully strong to be able to keep up after such blows as he had received. The procession had resumed its slow pace, and on leaning out, Denise saw her uncle walking with his heavy step, which seemed to regulate the rumbling and painful march of the cortege. She then threw herself back into the corner, listening to the endless complaints of the old umbrella-maker, rocked by the melancholy movement of the coach. The police ought to clear the public thoroughfare, my word. They've been blocking up our street for the last eighteen months with the scaffolding of their façade, where a man was killed the other day. Never mind. When they want to enlarge further, they'll have to throw bridges over the street. They say there are now 2,700 employees, and that the business will amount to a hundred millions this year. A hundred millions. Just fancy. A hundred millions. Denise had nothing to say in reply. The procession had just turned into the Rue de la José d'Antine, where it was stopped by a block of vehicles. Bourras went on, with a vague expression in his eyes, as if he were dreaming aloud. He still failed to understand the triumph achieved by the Ladies' Paradise, but he acknowledged the defeat of the old-fashioned traders. Paul Robineau's done for. He's got the face of a drowning man. And the Bédoré and the Van Pulier, they can't keep going. They're like me, played out. There's Lignerier will die of apoplexy. Pio and Revoir have the yellow jaundice. Ah, we're a fine lot. A pretty cortege of skeletons to follow the poor child. It must be comical for those looking on to see this string of bankrupts pass. Beside, it appears that a clean sweep is to continue. The scoundrels are creating departments for flowers, bonnets, perfumery, shoemaking, all sorts of things. Grenet, the perfumer in the Rue de Grammont, can clear out, and I wouldn't give ten francs for Nord's shoe shop in the Rue d'Antin. The cholera has spread as far as the Rue Saint-Anne, where Lacazan, at the feather and flower shop, 
and Madame Jodille, whose bonnets are so well known, will be swept away before long. And after those, others, it will still go on. All the businesses in the neighbourhood will suffer. When counter-jumpers commence to sell soap and goloshes, they are quite capable of dealing in fried potatoes. My word, the world is turning upside down. The hearse was just then crossing the Place de la Trinite to ascend the steep Rue Blanche, and from the corner of the gloomy coach Denise, who, broken-hearted, was listening to the endless complaints of the old man, could see the coffin as they issued from the Rue de la Josère d'Antine. Behind her uncle, marching along with the blind mute face of an ox about to be poleaxed, she seemed to hear a trampling of a flock of sheep led to the slaughterhouse, the discomfiture of the shops of a whole district, the small traders dragging along their ruin, with a thud of damp shoes, through the muddy streets of Paris. Bourras still went on, in a deeper voice, as if slackened by the difficult ascent of the Rue Blanche. "'As for me, I am settled, but I still hold on all the same, and won't let go. He just lost his appeal case. Ah, that cost me something, what with nearly two years pleading, and the solicitors and the barristers. Never mind, he won't pass under my shop. The judges have decided that such a work could not be considered as a legitimate case of repairing. Fancy, he talked of creating underneath a light saloon to judge the colours of the stuffs by gaslight, a subterranean room which would have united the hosiery to the drapery department. And he can't get over it. He can't swallow the fact that an old humbug like me should stop his progress, when everybody are on their knees before his money. Never. I won't. That's understood. Very likely I may be worsted. Since I have had to go to the money-lenders, I know the villain is looking after my paper, in the hope to play me some villainous trick, no doubt. But that doesn't matter. He says yes, and I say no and shall still say no, even when I get between two boards like this poor little girl who has just been nailed up. When they reached the boulevard de Cligy, the coach went at a quicker pace. One could hear the heavy breathing of the mourners, the unconscious haste of the cortege, anxious to get the sad ceremony over. What Bourras did not openly mention was the frightful misery into which he had fallen, bewildered amidst the confusion of the small trader who is on the road to ruin and yet remains obstinate under a shower of protested bills denise well acquainted with his situation at last interrupted the silence by saying in a voice of entreaty monsieur Boras, pray don't stand out any longer let me arrange matters for you but he interrupted her with a violent gesture you be quiet that's nobody's business you're a good little girl, and I know you lead him a hard life, this man who thought you were for sale like my house. But what would you answer if I advised you to say yes? You'd send me about my business. Therefore, when I say no, don't you interfere in the matter. And the coach having stopped at the cemetery gate, he got out with the young girl. The Baudus vault was situated in the first alley on the left. In a few minutes the ceremony was terminated. Jean had drawn away his uncle, who was looking into the grave with a gaping air. The mourners wandered about amongst the neighbouring tombs, and the faces of all these shopkeepers, their blood impoverished by living in their unhealthy shops, assumed an ugly suffering look under the leaden sky. When the coffin slipped gently down, their blotched and pimpled cheeks paled, and their blurry eyes, blinded with figures, turned away. We ought all to jump into this hole, said Bourras to Denise, who had kept close to him. In burying this poor girl, they are burying the whole district. Oh, I know what I am saying. The old-fashioned business may go and join the white roses they are throwing onto her coffin. Denise brought back her uncle and brother in a morning coach. The day was for her exceedingly dull and melancholy. In the first place, she began to get anxious at Jean's paleness, and when she understood that it was on account of another woman, she tried to quiet him by opening her purse, but he shook his head and refused, saying it was serious this time, the niece of a very rich pastry cook, who would not accept even a bunch of violets. Afterwards, in the afternoon, when Denise went to fetch Pepe from Madame Gras, 
The latter declared that he was getting too big for her to keep any longer. Another annoyance, for she would be obliged to find him a school, perhaps send him away. And to crown all, she was thoroughly heartbroken on bringing Pepe back to kiss his aunt and uncle, to see the gloomy sadness of the old Elbeuf. The shop was closed, and the old couple were at the further end of the little room, where they had forgotten to light the gas, notwithstanding the complete obscurity of this winter's day. They were now quite alone, face to face in the house, slowly emptied by ruin, and the death of their daughter deepened the shady corners, and was like the supreme cracking which was soon to break up the old rafters, eaten away by the damp. Beneath this destruction, her uncle, unable to stop himself, still kept walking round the table, with his funeral-like step, blind and silent, whilst her aunt said nothing. She had fallen into a chair, with the white face of a wounded person, whose blood was running away drop by drop. They did not even weep, when Pepe covered their cold cheeks with kisses. Denise was choked with tears. That same evening, Moray sent for the young girl to speak of a child's garment he wished to launch forth, a mixture of the Scotch and Zouave costumes. And still trembling with pity, shocked at so much suffering, she could not contain herself. She first ventured to speak of Bourras, of that poor old man whom they were about to ruin. But, in hearing the umbrella maker's name, Moray flew into a rage at once. The old madman, as he called him, was the plague of his life, and spoilt his triumph by his idiotic obstinacy in not giving up his house, that ignoble hovel which was a disgrace to the lady's paradise, the only little corner of the vast block that escaped his conquest. The matter was becoming a regular nightmare. Anyone else but Denise speaking in favour of Bourras would have run the risk of being dismissed immediately, so violently was Moray tortured by the sickly desire to kick the house down. In short, what did they wish him to do? Could he leave this heap of ruins sticking to the ladies' paradise? It would be got rid of, the shop was to pass through it, so much the worse for the old fool. And he spoke of his repeated proposals. He had offered him as much as a hundred thousand francs. Wasn't that fair? He never haggled, he gave the money required but in return he expected people to be reasonable and allow him to finish his work. Did anyone ever try to stop the locomotives on a railway? She listened to him with drooping eyes, unable to find any but purely sentimental reasons. The old man was so old, they might have waited till his death. A failure would kill him. Then he added that he was no longer able to prevent things going their course. Bourdoncle had taken the matter up, for the board had resolved to put an end to it. She had nothing more to add, notwithstanding the grievous pity she felt for her old friend. After a painful silence, Moray himself commenced to speak of the Baudus, by expressing his sorrow at the death of their daughter. They were very worthy people, very honest, but had been pursued by the worst of luck. Then he resumed his arguments— at bottom, they had really caused their own misfortune by obstinately sticking to the old ways in their worm-eaten place. It was not astonishing that the place should be falling about their heads. He had predicted it scores of times. She must remember that he had charged her to warn her uncle of a fatal disaster, if the latter still clung to his old-fashioned stupid ways. And the catastrophe had arrived. No one in the world could now prevent it. They could not reasonably expect him to ruin himself to save the neighbourhood. Besides, if he had been foolish enough to close the ladies' paradise, another big shop would have sprung up of itself next door, for the idea was now starting from the four corners of the globe. The triumph of these manufacturing and industrial cities was sown by the spirit of the times, which was sweeping away the tumbling edifice of former ages. Little by little, Moray warmed up, and found an eloquent emotion with which to defend himself against the hatred of his involuntary victims, the clamour of the small, dying shops that was heard around him. They could not keep their dead, he continued, they must bury them, and with a gesture he sent down into the grave, swept away and threw into the common hole the corpse of old-fashioned business, the greenish, poisonous remains of which were becoming a disgrace to the bright, 
sun-lighted streets of new paris no no he felt no remorse he was simply doing the work of his age and she knew it she who loved life who had a passion for big affairs concluded in the full glare of publicity reduced to silence she listened to him for some time and then went away her soul full of trouble end of chapter thirteen part one Section thirty one of the Ladies Paradise by Emile Zola translated by Ernest Alfred Visitelli. This Librivox recording is in the public domain. Read by Christine G. Chapter thirteen Part two That night Denise slept but little. A sleeplessness traversed by nightmare kept her turning over and over in her bed. It seemed to her that she was quite little, and she burst into tears in their garden at Valence on seeing the black caps eat up the spiders, which themselves devoured the flies. Was it then really true, this necessity for the world to fatten on death, this struggle for existence which drove people into the charnel house of eternal destruction? Afterwards, she saw herself before the vault into which they had lowered Genevieve. Then she perceived her uncle and aunt in their obscure dining-room. In the profound silence, a heavy voice, as of something tumbling down, traversed the dead air. It was Bourras' house, giving way as if undermined by a high tide. The silence recommenced, more sinister than ever, and a fresh rumbling was heard. Then another, then another. The Robinots, the Bedorais, cracked and fell down in their turn the small shops of the neighbourhood were disappearing beneath an invisible pick with a brisk thundering noise as if a tumbrel being emptied then an immense pity awoke her with a start heavens what tortures there were families weeping old men thrown out into the street all the poignant dramas that ruin conjures up and she could save nobody and she felt that it was right, that all this misery was necessary for the health of the Paris of the future. When day broke she became calmer, a feeling of resigned melancholy kept her awake, turned towards the windows through which the light was making its way. Yes, it was the meed of blood that every revolution exacted from its martyrs, every step forward was made over the bodies of the dead. Her fear of being a wicked girl, of having assisted in the ruin of her fellow creatures, now melted into a heartfelt pity, in face of these evils without remedy, which are the painful accompaniment of each generation's birth. She finished by seeking some possible comfort in her goodness. She dreamed of the means to be employed in order to save her relations at least from the final crash. Moray now appeared before her with his passionate face and caressing eyes. He would certainly refuse her nothing. She felt sure he would accord her all reasonable compensation. And her thoughts went astray in trying to judge him. She knew his life, was aware of the calculating nature of his former affections, his continual exploitation of women, mistresses taking up to further his own ends, and his intimacy with Madame de Vorges, solely to get hold of Baron Hartmann, and all the others, such as Clara and the rest, pleasure brought, paid for, and thrown out on the pavement. But these beginnings of a love adventurer, which were the talk of the shop, were gradually effaced by the strokes of genius of this man, his victorious grace. He was seduction itself. What she could never have forgiven was his former deception, his lover's coldness under the gallant comedy of his attentions. But she felt herself to be entirely without rancour, now that he was suffering through her. This suffering had elevated him. When she saw him tortured by her refusal, atoning so fully for his former disdain for woman, he seemed to have made amends for all his faults. That morning, Denise obtained from Moray the compensation she might judge legitimate the day the Baudus and old Bourras should succumb. Weeks passed away, during which she went to see her uncle nearly every afternoon, escaping from her counter for a few minutes, bringing her smiling face and brave courage to enliven the sombre shop. 
She was especially anxious about her aunt, who had fallen into a dull stupor since Genevieve's death. It seemed that her life was quitting her hourly, and when people spoke to her she would reply with an astonished air that she was not suffering, but that she simply felt as if overcome by sleep. The neighbours shook their heads, saying she would not live long to regret her daughter. One day Denise was coming out of the bow dues when, on turning the corner of the Place Gaillon, she heard a loud cry. The crowd rushed forward, a panic arose, that breath of fear and pity which so suddenly seizes a crowd. It was a brown omnibus, belonging to the Bastille Batignol line, which had run over a man, coming out of the Rue Neuve Saint Augustine, opposite the fountain. Upright in his seat, with furious gestures, the driver was pulling in his two kicking horses and crying out in a great passion. "'Confound you! Why don't you look out, you idiot!' The omnibus had now stopped, and the crowd had surrounded the wounded man, and, strange to say, a policeman was soon on the spot. Still standing up, invoking the testimony of the people on the knife-board, who had also got up to look over and see the wounded man, the coachman was explaining the matter with exasperated gestures, choked by his increasing anger. "'It's something fearful. This fellow was walking in the middle of the road, quite at home. I called out, and he at once threw himself under the wheels.' A house-painter, who had run up, brush in hand, from a neighbouring house, then said, in a sharp voice amidst the clamour, "'Don't excite yourself. I saw him. He threw himself under. He jumped in, head first. Another unfortunate tide of life, no doubt.' Others spoke up, and all agreed upon it being a case of suicide, whilst the policeman pulled out his book and made his entry. Several ladies, very pale, got out quickly and ran away without looking back, filled with horror by the soft shaking which had stirred them up when the omnibus passed over the body. Denise approached, attracted by a practical pity, which prompted her to interest herself in all sorts of street accidents, wounded dogs, horses down, and tillers falling off roofs, and she immediately recognised the unfortunate fellow who had fainted away, his clothes covered with mud. "'It's Monsieur Robinot!' cried she, in her grievous astonishment. The policeman at once questioned the young girl, and she gave his name, profession, and address. Thanks to the driver's energy, the omnibus had twisted round, and thus only Robinot's legs had gone under the wheels— but it was to be feared that they were both broken. Four men carried the wounded draper to a chemist's shop in the Rue Gaillon, whilst the omnibus slowly resumed its journey. "'My stars!' said the driver, whipping up his horses. "'I've done a famous day's work.' Denise followed Robinot into the chemist's. The latter, waiting for a doctor who could not be found, declared there was no immediate danger, and that the wounded man had better be taken home, as he lived in the neighbourhood. A lad started off to the police station to order a stretcher, and Denise had the happy thought of going on in front and preparing Madame Robinot for this frightful blow. But she had the greatest trouble in the world to get into the street through the crowd, which was struggling before the door. This crowd, attracted by death, was increasing every minute. Men, women and children stood on tiptoe and held their own amidst the brutal pushing, and each newcomer had his version of the accident, so that at last it was said to be a husband pitched out of the window by his wife's lover. In the Rue Neuve de Petit Chans, Denise perceived Madame Robinot on the threshold of the silk warehouse. This gave her a pretext for stopping, and she talked on for a moment, trying to find a way of breaking the terrible news. The shop presented the disorderly, abandoned appearance of the last struggles of a dying business. It was the inevitable end of the great battle of the silks. The Paris paradise had crushed its rival by a fresh reduction of a sou. It was now sold at four francs nineteen sous. Grosjean's silk had found its Waterloo. For the last two months, Robinot, reduced to all sorts of shifts, had been leading a fearful life, trying to prevent a declaration of bankruptcy. "'I've just seen your husband pass through the Place Caillon murmured Denise, who had now entered the shop. Madame Robinot, whom a secret anxiety seemed to be continually attracting towards the street, said quickly, "'Ah, just now, was it? I'm waiting for him. He ought to be back. Monsieur Gargon came up this morning, and they have gone out together.' She was still charming, delicate, and gay, 
but her advanced state of pregnancy gave her a fatigued look, and she was more frightened, more bewildered than ever, by these business matters, which she did not understand, and which were all going wrong. As she often said, what was the use of it all? Would it not be better to live quietly in some small house, and be contented with modest fare? "'My dear child,' resumed she with her smile, which was becoming sadder, "'we have nothing to conceal from you. Things are not going well, and my poor darling is worried to death. Today this Gargon has been tormenting him about some bills overdue. I was dying with anxiety at being left here all alone.' and she was returning to the door when Denise stopped her, having heard the noise of the crowd and guessing that it was the wounded man being brought along, surrounded by a mob of idlers, anxious to see the end of the affair. Then, with a parched throat, unable to find the consoling words she would have wished, she had to explain the matter. "'Don't be anxious. There's no immediate danger. I've seen Monsieur Robinot. He has met with an accident. They are just bringing him home. Pray, don't be frightened.' The poor woman listened to her, white as a sheet, without clearly understanding. The street was full of people, the drivers of the impeded cabs were swearing, the men had laid down the stretcher before the shop in order to open both glass doors. "'It was an accident,' continued Denise, resolved to conceal the attempt at suicide. He was on the pavement and slipped under the wheels of an omnibus. Only his feet were hurt. They've sent for a doctor. There's no need to be anxious.' A shudder passed over Madame Robineau. She set up an inarticulate cry, then ceased talking and ran to the stretcher, drawing the covering away with her trembling hands. The men who had brought Robineau were waiting to take him away as soon as the doctor arrived. They dared not touch him, who had come round again, and whose sufferings were frightful at the slightest movement. When he saw his wife, his eyes filled with tears. She embraced him and stood looking fixedly at him, and weeping. In the street the tumult was increasing. The people pressed forward as at a theatre with glistening eyes. Some work girls, escaped from a shop, were almost pushing through the windows eager to see what was going on. In order to avoid this feverish curiosity, and thinking, besides, that it was not right to leave the shop open, Denise decided on letting the metallic shutters down. She went and turned the winch, the wheels of which gave out a plaintive cry, the sheet of iron slowly descended, like the heavy draperies of a curtain falling on the catastrophe of a fifth act. When she went in again, after closing the little round door in the shutters, she found Madame Robineau still clasping her husband in her arms, in the half-light which came from the two stars cut in the shutters. The ruined shop seemed to be gliding into nothingness, the two stars alone glittered on the sudden and brutal catastrophe of the streets of Paris. At last, Madame Robineau recovered her speech. "'Oh, my darling! Oh, my darling! My darling!' This was all she could say, and he, suffocated, confessed himself with a cry of remorse when he saw her kneeling thus before him. When he did not move, he only felt the burning lead of his legs. "'Forgive me, I must have been mad. When the lawyer told me before Gajon that the posters would be put up to-morrow, I saw flames dancing before me as if the walls were burning. After that I remember nothing else. I came down the Rue de la Mijodière. It seemed that the Paradise people were laughing at me. That immense house seemed to crush me, so when the omnibus came up I thought of Lhomme and his arm and threw myself underneath the omnibus. Madame Robineau had slowly fallen onto the floor, horrified by this confession. Heavens! He had tried to kill himself! She seized the hand of her young friend, who leaned over towards her, quite overcome. The wounded man, exhausted by emotion, had just fainted away again, and the doctor not having arrived, two men went all over the neighbourhood for him. The doorkeeper belonging to the house had gone off in his turn to look for him. "'Pray, don't be anxious,' repeated Denise, mechanically, herself also sobbing. Then Madame Robineau, seated on the floor, with her head against a stretcher, her cheek placed on the mattress where her husband was lying, relieved her heart. "'Oh, I must tell you, it's all for me he wanted to die. He's always saying, I've robbed you, it was not my money, and at night he dreams of this money, 
waking up covered with perspiration, calling himself an incapable fellow, saying that those who have no head for business ought not to risk other people's money. You know, he has always been nervous, his brain tormented. He finished by conjuring up things that frightened me. He saw me in the street in tatters, begging his darling wife, whom he loved so tenderly, whom he longed to see rich and happy. But on turning round she noticed he had opened his eyes, and she continued in a trembling voice, "'My darling, why have you done this? You must think me very wicked. I assure you I don't care if we are ruined. So long as we are together we shall never be unhappy. Let them take everything, and we will go away somewhere, where you won't hear any more about them. You can still work. You'll see how happy we shall be.' She placed her forehead near her husband's pale face, and both were silent in the emotion of their anguish. There was a pause. The shop seemed to be sleeping, benumbed by the pale night which enveloped it, whilst behind the thin shutters could be heard the noises of the street, the life of the busy city, the rumble of the vehicles, and the hustling and pushing of the passing crowd. At last Denise, who went every minute to glance through the hall door, came back exclaiming, Here's the doctor. He was a young fellow, with bright eyes, whom the doorkeeper had found and brought in. He preferred to examine the poor man before they put him to bed. Only one of his legs, the left one, had broken above the ankle. It was a simple fracture, no serious complication appeared likely to result from it, and they were about to carry the stretcher into the back room when Gaujon arrived. He came to give them an account of a last attempt to settle matters, an attempt which had failed. The declaration of bankruptcy was definite. "'Dear me,' murmured he, "'what's the matter?' In a few words Denise informed him. Then he stopped, feeling rather awkward, while Robineau said in a feeble voice, "'I don't bear you any ill will, but all this is partly your fault.' "'Well, my dear fellow,' replied Gaujon, "'it wanted stronger men than us. You know I'm not in a much better state than you.' They raised the stretcher. Robineau still found strength to say, "'No, no, stronger fellows than us would have given way as we have. I can understand such obstinate old men as Bourras and Baudou standing out. But you and I, who are young, who have accepted the new style of things, no, Gaujon, it is the last of a world.' They carried him off. Madame Robineau embraced Denise with an eagerness in which there was almost a feeling of joy— to have at last got rid of all those worrying business matters. And, as Gaujon went away with the young girl, he confessed to her that this poor devil of a Robineau was right. It was idiotic to try and struggle against the lady's paradise. He personally felt himself lost, if he did not give in. Last night, in fact, he had secretly made a proposal to Hutin, who was just leaving for Lyon. But he felt very doubtful, and tried to interest Denise in the matter aware, no doubt, of her powerfulness. "'My word,' said he, "'so much the worse for the manufacturers. Everyone would laugh at me if I ruined myself in fighting for other people's benefit, when these fellows are struggling who shall make at the cheapest price. As you said some time ago, the manufacturers have only to follow the march of progress by a better organization and new methods. Everything will come all right. It suffices that the public are satisfied.' Denise smiled and replied, Go and say that to Monsieur Moret himself. Your visit will please him, and he's not the man to display any rancour if you offer him even a centime profit per yard. Madame Baudu died in January, on a bright sunny afternoon. For some weeks she had been unable to go down into the shop that a charwoman now looked after. She was in bed, propped up by pillows. Nothing but her eyes seemed to be living in her white face, and her head erect she kept them obstinately fixed on the ladies' paradise opposite, through the small curtains of the windows. Baudu, himself suffering from this obsession, from the despairing fixity of her gaze, sometimes wanted to draw the large curtains too, but she stopped him with an imploring gesture, obstinately desirous of seeing the monster shop till the last moment. It had now robbed her of everything, her business, her daughter, she herself had gradually died away with the old L. Buff, losing a part of her life as the shop lost its customers. The day it succumbed, she had no more breath left. 
when she felt she was dying, she still found the strength to insist on her husband opening the two windows. It was very mild. A bright ray of sun gilded the ladies' paradise, whilst the bedroom of their old house shivered in the shade. Madame Baudu lay with her fixed gaze, absorbed by the vision of the triumphal monument, the clear, limpid windows, behind which a gallop of millions was passing. Slowly her eyes grew dim, invaded by darkness, and when they at last sunk in death, they remained wide open, still looking, drowned in tears. Once more the ruined traders of the district followed the funeral procession. There were the brothers Van Puyl, pale at the thought of the December bills, paid by a supreme effort which they would never be able to repeat. Bedoré, with his sister, leaned on his cane, so full of worry and anxiety that his liver complaint was getting worse every day. Des Lignerier had had a fit. Pio and Revoir walked on in silence, with downcast looks, like men entirely played out. They dared not question each other about those who had disappeared, Quinette, Mademoiselle Tati, and others, who were sinking, ruined, swept away by this disastrous flood, without counting Robineau, still in bed, with his broken leg. But they pointed with an especial air of interest to the new tradesmen attacked by the plague. The perfumer Gronette, the millionaire Madame Jodille, La Cassagne, the flower-maker, and Nord, the bootmaker, still standing firm, but seized by the anxiety of the evil, which would doubtless sweep them away in their turn. Baudu walked along behind the hearse, with the same heavy, stolid step as when he had followed his daughter, whilst at the back of a morning coach could be seen Bourras's sparkling eyes under his bushy eyebrows, and his hair of a snowy white. Denise was in great trouble. For the last fifteen days she had been worn out with fatigue and anxiety. She had been obliged to put Pepe to school, and had been running about for Jean, who was so stricken with the pastry-cook's knees that he had implored his sister to go and ask her hand in marriage. Then her aunt's death, these repeated catastrophes had quite overwhelmed the young girl. Moret again offered his services, giving her leave to do what she liked for her uncle and the others. One morning she had an interview with him, at the news that Bourras was turned into the street, and that Baudu was going to shut up shop. Then she went out after breakfast in the hope of comforting these two, at least. In the Rue de la Michaudière, Bourras was standing on the pavement opposite his house, from which he had been expelled the previous day by a fine trick, a discovery of the lawyers. As Moret held some bills, he had easily obtained an order in bankruptcy against the umbrella-maker. Then he had given five hundred francs for the expiring lease at the sale ordered by the court, so that the obstinate old man had allowed himself to be deprived of, for five hundred francs, what he had refused to give up for a hundred thousand. The architect, who came with his gang of workmen, had been obliged to employ the police to get him out. The goods had been taken and sold, but he still kept himself obstinately in the corner where he slept, and from which they did not like to drive him, out of pity. The workmen even attacked the roofing over his head. They had taken off the rotten slates, the ceilings fell in, the walls cracked, and yet he stuck there, under the naked old beams, amidst the ruins of the shop. At last the police came, and he went away, but the following morning he again appeared on the opposite side of the street, after having spent the night in a lodging-house in the neighbourhood. "'Monsieur Bourras," said Denise kindly. He did not hear her. His flaming eyes were devouring the workmen who were attacking the front of the hovel with their picks. Through the empty window frames could be seen the inside of the house, the miserable rooms, and the black staircase where the sun had not penetrated for the last two hundred years. "'Ha! Ah, it's you,' replied he at last, when he recognised her. "'A nice bit of work they're doing, eh? The robbers!' She did not now dare to speak, stirred up by the lamentable sadness of the old place, herself unable to take her eyes off the mouldy stones that were falling. Above, in a corner of the ceiling of her old room, she still perceived the name in black and shaky letters. Ernestine, written with the flame of a candle, and the remembrance of those days of misery came back to her, inspiring her with a tender sympathy for all suffering. But the workman, in order to knock one of the walls down at a blow, had attacked it at its base. 
It was tottering. "'Should like to see it crush all of them,' growled Bourras in a savage voice. There was a terrible cracking noise. The frightened workmen ran out into the street. In falling down, the wall tottered and carried all the house with it. No doubt the hovel was ripe for the fall. It could no longer stand, with its flaws and cracks. A push had sufficed to cleave it from top to bottom. It was a pitiful crumbling away, the raising of a mud-house soddened by the rains. Not a board remained standing. There was nothing on the ground but a heap of rubbish, the dung of the past thrown at the street corner. "'Oh, heavens!' exclaimed the old man, as if the blow had resounded in his very entrails. He stood there gaping, never supposing it would have been over so quick. And he looked at the gap, the hollow space at last left free on the flanks of the lady's paradise. It was like the crushing of a gnat, the final triumph over the annoying obstinacy of the infinitely small, the whole isle invaded and conquered. The passers-by lingered to talk to the workmen, who were crying out against these old buildings, only good for killing people. "'Monsieur Bourras, repeated Denise, trying to get him on one side, "'you know that you will not be abandoned. All your wants will be provided for.' He held up his head. "'I have no wants. You've been sent by them, haven't you? Well, tell them that the old Bourras still knows how to work, and that he can find work wherever he likes.' Really, it would be a fine thing to offer charity to those they are assassinating. Then she implored him. Pray accept, Monsieur Bourras. Don't give me this grief. But he shook his bushy head. No, no, it's all over. Goodbye. Go and live happily, you who are young, and don't prevent old people sticking to their ideas. He cast a last glance at the heap of rubbish, and then went away. She watched him disappear, elbowed by the crowd on the pavement. He turned a corner of the Place Gaillot, and all was over. For a moment Denise remained motionless, lost in thought. At last she went over to her uncle's. The draper was alone in the dark shop of the old El Boeuf. The charwoman only came morning and evening to do a little cooking, and to take down and put up the shutters. He spent hours in this solitude, often without being disturbed once during the whole day bewildered and unable to find the goods when a stray customer happened to venture in and there in the half-light he marched about unceasingly with that heavy step he had at the two funerals yielding to sickly desire regular fits of forced marching as if he were trying to rock his grief to sleep are you feeling better uncle asked denise he only stopped for a second to glance at her then he started off again going from the pay-desk to an obscure corner. "'Yes, yes. Very well. Thanks.' She tried to find some consoling subject, some cheerful remark, but could think of nothing. "'Did you hear the noise? The house is down.' "'Ah, it's true,' murmured he with an astonished look. "'That must have been the house. I felt the ground tremble. Seeing them on the roof this morning, I closed my door.' and he made a vague movement to imitate that such things no longer interested him. Every time he arrived before the pay-desk, he looked at the empty seat, that well-known velvet-covered seat, where his wife and daughter had grown up. Then, when his perpetual walking brought him to the other end, he gazed at the shelves drowned in shadow, in which a few pieces of cloth were gradually growing mouldy. It was a widowed house, those he loved had disappeared, his business had come to a shameful end, and he was left alone to commune with his dead heart, and his pride brought low amidst all these catastrophes. He raised his eyes towards the black ceiling, overcome by the sepulchral silence which reigned in the little dining-room, the family nook, of which he had formerly loved every part, even down to the stuffy odour. Not a breath was now heard in the old house, his regular heavy step made the ancient walls resound, as if he were walking over the tombs of his affections. At last Denise approached the subject which had brought her. "'Uncle, you can't stay like this. You must come to a decision.' He replied, without stopping his walk. "'No doubt. But what would you have me do? I've tried to sell, but no one has come. One of these mornings I shall shut up shop and go off. She was aware that a failure was no longer to be feared. 
the creditors had preferred to come to an understanding before such a long series of misfortunes. Everything paid, the old man would find himself in the street, penniless. "'But what will you do then?' murmured she, seeking some transition in order to arrive at the offer she dared not make. "'I don't know,' replied he. "'They'll pick me up all right.' He had changed his route, going from the dining-room to the windows with their lamentable displays, looking at the latter, every time he came to them, with a gloomy expression. His gaze did not even turn towards the triumphal façade of the ladies' paradise, whose architectural lines ran as far as the eye could see, to the right and to the left, at both ends of the street. He was thoroughly annihilated, and had not even the strength to get angry. "'Listen, uncle,' said Denise, greatly embarrassed. "'Perhaps there might be a situation for you.' She stopped and stammered. "'Yes, I am charged to offer you a situation as inspector.' "'Where?' asked Baudu. "'Opposite,' replied she. "'In our shop. Six thousand francs a year. A very easy place.' Suddenly he stopped in front of her. But instead of getting angry as she feared he would, he turned very pale, succumbing to a grievous emotion, a feeling of bitter resignation. "'Opposite.' opposite stammered he several times you want me to go opposite denise herself was affected by his emotion she recalled the long struggle of the two shops assisted at the funerals of genevieve and madame baudu saw before her the old elbeuf overthrown utterly ruined by the ladies paradise and the idea of her uncle taking a situation opposite and walking about in a white necktie made her heart leap with pity and revolt. "'Come, Denise, is it possible?' said he, simply wringing his poor trembling hands. "'No, no, uncle,' exclaimed she in a sudden burst of her just and excellent being. "'It would be wrong. Forgive me, I beg of you.' He resumed his walk, his step once more broke the funeral silence of the house. And when she left him, he was still going on in that obstinate locomotion of great griefs, which turn round themselves without ever being able to get beyond. Denise passed another sleepless night. She had just touched the bottom of her powerlessness. Even in favour of her own people she was unable to find any consolation. She had been obliged to assist to the bitter end at this invincible work of life, which requires death as its continual seed. She no longer struggled, she accepted this law of combat, but her womanly soul was filled with a weeping pity, with a fraternal tenderness at the idea of suffering humanity. For years she herself had been caught in the wheelwork of the machine. Had she not bled there? Had they not bruised her, dismissed her, overwhelmed her with insults? Even now she was frightened when she felt herself chosen by the logic of fact. Why her, a girl so puny, why should her small hand suddenly become so powerful amidst the monster's work? And the force which was sweeping everything away carried her away in her turn, she whose coming was to be a revenge. Moret had invented this mechanism for crushing the world, and its brutal working shocked her. He had sown ruin all over the neighbourhood, they spoiled some, killed others, and yet she loved him for the grandeur of his work. She loved him still more at every excess of his power, notwithstanding the flood of tears which overcame her before the sacred misery of the vanquished. End of chapter 13, part 2